Maar zo ben ik iets aan hem. Ja, nee, 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 nee. Ik kijk eerst of dat beacon werkt, want dan kunnen we er ook in beginnen. Oké, okay, zeker. Okay. Ja, nee, dat is het belangrijkste. Ik zal dat van GitLab straks met u bespreken. Komt gewoon naar de, de mailroom nu. Dan kunnen we de opening al doen. Beacon.
This yeah. is just the small stuff. You should have come to my talk. We bring out the big fireworks. <laughs> Where'd Chris go? Are we, we go? Well, Chris. We'll be back in a minute. So I'm the hype man. Did everyone have a good time yesterday? Yeah. <laughs> Who went to the zone? Who uh, didn't go to the zone? <laughs> Who doesn't remember if they went to the zone? <laughs> So I uh, just want to really quickly thank Bert over there doing some organizing stuff on the side. Wave at Bert, everyone. Thank you, Bert. <laughs> and uh, some of our heroes, Chris over here and Toshan, are going to take it off this morning. So uh, give them a loud round of applause. So yeah, welcome to YAML Camp. <laughs> This is the second day, or for some of us, the fifth day, or the seventh day, or whatever day, we're still alive. Um, yeah, so we have a hashtag. Um, if you don't know the password to the Wi-Fi, it should be working now. Um, yeah, Same that's yours. <laughs> oh yeah, we have free coffee, free croissants, um, lunches. Finish them all. Yes, please finish them all. Uh, we prefer to run out. Um, if it is finished, it's finished. Um, we have lunch, um, same place like yesterday. Hopefully it will be a better queuing system than yesterday um, and the cash will actually work. Uh, but lunch is on your own. We have a discount from them, so it's 9 euro 20 uh, for, for a meal. Um, if you're a speaker or organizer, um, find me or Chris and you'll get vouchers once we have them. Ah, once we have them. Yeah, they, they're being cut now, so we will have them quicker than yesterday. Um, the restaurant is open from 12-ish, so you can go whenever you want, and it's open a little bit later. Um, but you don't want to miss the Ignite, so... Yeah. Um, wristbands, well, wristbands give you discounts. If you show your uh, voucher or your ticket, they'll also give you the discount. They're not too difficult about that, apparently. Uh, yeah, fringes and uh, workshops, tutorials. If you haven't registered, please register. We do not check, like you know. Um, so it's not about actual registration and verification, but it's more about room sizes. So please register. So if we see that a room needs to be changed, we can do it beforehand and not on the day itself. Um, we have this morning Marcel with Q, uh, Alf with IDP, and Frederic. It's not an identity management platform. No. Yeah, but he'll tell you. <laughs> he will explain that. Yeah, uh, we had an identity management platform yesterday a talk in the Ansible room, so you missed it. But there will be a recording of that. Um, and Frederico will talk about cloud myths, and then we have a whole bunch of Ignite. Well, I haven't seen Frederico yet. Oh, okay, we'll ping him. But I hope he shows up. Frederico? Yeah. <laughs> Not yet. I haven't seen okay. him all week. <laughs> And then we have a whole bunch of Ignites in this room. Today, I think the Ignites do not conflict with the other room, so. Uh, no. no. So worst, worst case, if Frederica doesn't show, the talk that's scheduled in the Beacon is going to move here. But we hope to not have to do that. OK. Then for the Ignites, if you haven't mailed Chris the Ignites yet. Um, I had one mail. Somebody came up to me yesterday and asked if they could still send one in. I think you can because, well, Felix moved his talk to yesterday because he really wanted to see James speak. And Floor kind of went sick home, um, didn't hear from her today, so she's probably not going to show. So he might have one slot left. If you want to do an Ignite, please find Chris or mail him a slide deck. 20 and slides, PDF. You can still do an Ignite. But not everybody because then we're going to run too long into lunch. <laughs> Yeah, sponsors. sponsors. So yes, sponsors have a boot for the higher levels. Uh, please go and visit them. They make this possible. They give you the free drinks, the free coffee, um, and the discounted lunches. So Ansible, um, or Red Hat, or IBM. Um, you have GitLab. They have their contributor summit uh, on the fourth floor today. You have AT Computing, uh, Axis. Uh, Beta Dots, Isinga, Puppet, and Freelance all have a stall uh, in the foyer, so where the uh, coffee is. And then you have Inuits, Firefly, Kangaroot, 
SIGUP, ATIX, Pulumi, Red Hat, which is uh, the Foreman project and Pulp. Um, they also have all stands, again, in the foyer. Um, Sinato, HashiCore, CF Engine, Skyscrapers, and Synchromind. Uh, these ones don't have stalls, but they are still very good sponsors. And then we have uh, the Hogan, so Bert, who gives us the venue. <coughs> Um, Inuits, which is Chris's company, Avantage, which is my company. We have City TV, so Han doing our live stream, and Mark from SIGIO, who does, does the other room uh, streams. Uh, we have Compass, which is the company that does the lunches, um, so they gave us the discount this year. Um, and then we have uh, Vox Pupilli, Radar, um, Famipau, and Sys11. Uh, as smaller sponsors, but again, they are as valuable as all other sponsors. Um, we do have a social event today, so that's uh, by the Hackerspace in Ghent. Um, it's from 7 o'clock. Um, where in is the, it? It's in the Blekerestraat. It's basically on the side of Ghent. Okay. Uh, they are opening the, the doors for their event today, but they're going to kick you out one minute before 12. So, so they only do it today? Once it becomes tomorrow, it's too late. Um, yeah. So yeah, enjoy conflict management camp. Um, we today do have the beacon, so the traditional overflow room, which is just behind the foyer. Um, so you will do a little bit less steps than yesterday. Marcel. You have HDMI? Yep. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Can I hold this? This is work. Yeah. Can you all hear me well? I think so. Yeah. So um, yeah, great uh, to be back here. So YAML camp, huh? I guess is, is how it's called now. So last time uh, or recently, I gave a talk uh, about uh, the future of YAML in, in uh, configuration and infrastructure. So uh, so it's a good uh, talk to continue that here. Hence the future in the title, I guess. Um, it's. Um, yeah, so James has been uh, pointing out to me, he's sitting here somewhere in the audience, I don't see him now. Ah, ah there, yeah, I don't have my good glasses on for uh, far seeing. Um, and he said, like, yeah, you really should focus more on the, on the management part, or your talks are always more about configuration, and, and you know, like, you've you got to uh, also dive more into the management. So, that, you know, that's absolutely true that I, that I do that, so to be very clear. Um, so Q, the system that I've been working on, is quite agnostic about the management part. You can retrofit it on the management part and, uh, you know, so I'm focused on what I'm good at here. So, so just to, to set the scope here for these, for these things, and I should work together with James Moore to, to sort of unite that stuff, but, uh, you know. Um, so YAML, so uh, my journey in 4Q started about, uh, about the same year that YAML uh, got invented, which is 2001 which was a very exciting year in total. Uh, you know, Mac OS X uh, came out as well, like this, a cool smartphone looked like that back then. Uh, who would have known, right? Like, um, so it was also during the dot-com crisis. So I started working for this startup in natural language processing. Um, like really cool technology, doesn't really uh, exist anymore. Everything is deep learning nowadays. Um, and that startup also failed uh, very quickly, right? Because of the dot-com uh, crash, but um, 
What was very nice is that this, um, this technology I worked on, right, and that everybody that worked on it got very excited about it. So what I didn't realize back then, it took me about uh, 10, 15 years to really realize this, is that uh, the grammars that we were creating uh, there, or like mostly not me, but linguists and stuff like that, um, so the properties they have uh, was basically very, very similar to very large-scale cloud configurations, right? It's uh, basically lots of regularity and lots of, lots of irregular exceptions uh, within these uh, regularities, right? Um, and, and this is very, very hard to manage, right? And um, within this field, they really spend decades trying to find out a good representation that could uh, be understood by both engineers and non-engineers, right? But it took me a while to realize that. But um, then when I lost my job, I ended up working at Google, right? And there, um, the, my first uh, project was, okay, let's take this uh, NLP stuff that you know so much about and let's put it in a search engine, not with the aim to you know, do anything with, this, anything with the search engine, but more to get familiar with the search engine. I was working on the search engine. And um, so NLP back then was quite expensive, so all the test setups that they had didn't really work for me. Um, so I thought like, okay, uh, all the servers they had were very optimized, was, was, was a very heterogeneous machine pool. And basically, um, if I wanted to have servers to do more testing, I had to wait because I had to configure them and basically build all these machines. Uh, on the other hand, MapReduce wasn't invented yet, so there was this cluster for batch processing sitting there with a thousand machines that nobody knew how to use, a uh, homogeneous pool, and it's like, huh, so maybe if I run these tests there, right, then I have my machines right away, I just have to rewrite, uh, you know, like restructure all the search engine services, uh, servers so that they uh, can run on hom a homogeneous pool of machines, um, but let's do that, right, and also the configuration was a big problem there, because um, uh, I had to redo everything and I want to be able to, you know, do it incrementally. So I thought, okay, I need to really have this flexible configuration. Let's use what I did in NLP, right, because that seems awesome. So this was sort of the first, um, you could say, Kubernetes-like system um, um, so that it was made, but it was really made for testing and making testing uh, quick and, you know, look, doing speedy development. So this system got on within Google very quickly. And before I knew it, people were actually launching uh, beta stuff, but you know, sort of in test production, but still in production. Public stuff is like, oh no, 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 right? Do not do that. This is not a production system at all. And um, even Sergey came to me and was like, okay, well, what's the worst thing that co can go wrong? It's like, well, you might go down for a week. It's like, is that all? It's like, I guess if that's all, yeah, it's a beta, right? But anyway, so we realized, okay, we need to build something like this um, for uh, production. It's actually production ready. Uh, also, the infrastructure was moving to servers that could deal with homogeneous machines, so hence Borg, right? So I started on the Borg team um, and focused on the tooling and, and the configuration um, of it all and stuff like that. Um, and I wanted to do that same thing we did with NLP, right? It's like, yeah, it's a little bit weird, right? Like, it's all like logic programming and nobody understands that. So let's do more overrides and inheritance. That's what people know. Right, so that's what we did, and that turned out to be this, this very big mistake, right? Because all the complexity essentially comes from that. But, you know, um, Google engineers, uh, they, they, they don't mind the complexity, generally speaking, right? And, and it sort of worked, right? Like, it, it, it worked for, for um, to some extent, but it's, uh, it's a bit messy. Uh, but at, then, uh, at that time, I moved to Switzerland, I forgot about it a little bit, started working on the Go team, but at some point I started seeing Okay, uh, all these problems, right, with, uh, with this configuration system. It's like, okay, what if I had done um, um, the, you know, my original idea? Um, and basically, I thought, like, yeah, we could have prevented all these problems, right? Like, the configurations were at that time in the same order of magnitude as the, as the grammars from, from 20 years ago, right? So, so that seemed, you know, like uh, very similar properties, right? So that seemed like a good approach. Anyway, that's where I got, um, um, you know, a little bit of background to understand where Q is coming from and, and, and what it does. So also this gave me a lot of insights, right, like on, on what actually is configuration, how should you think about configuration. And so at the last part of my, my tenure at Google before I started working on Q full time, was just like, okay, like now you have all these ideas about configuration that are kind of, you know, weird and alien. So can you use that to analyze our postmortems and see if you can see a pattern there? Like, is there something we can learn from about, um, uh, from configuration? And uh, so I did that. 
And um, so you can see this in public, like a lot of people have done research in this and generally speaking as a, as a guideline you see that about 50% of the especially bigger outages uh, tend to be configuration related. Um, and this was also my experience that this is the case. And um, yeah, you know, this, these are very costly outages, right? Like the, you lo the companies lose a lot of money, uh, like people cannot use, uh, use you know, critical services sometimes, so you, you really want to, to avoid this. Uh, people lose trust in the company. Um, so on the left you see one quote, so this is a, a, a published post-mortem, it's public, uh, Google published it, like what caused this outage, and it was basically related to a quota management uh, system. So this is one of the largest outages they had, uh, it was very widespread. And um, so, so, you know, it doesn't really feel like configuration, but, uh, but it is, right? But, but not the typical configuration failures that people think of, right? A lot of people think like, okay, you specify a Boolean where you should specify a string, or you have like a number that's outside of a certain range. Like, these problems don't really occur anymore, right? Like, uh, like uh, it happened earlier on, right? But that's the, all these problems have sort of been ironed out. But the funny thing is that over time, the percentage of outages related to configuration sort of stays the same. Right? So it's just that over time, as, as the company grew more complex, as the configurations grow more complex, also the bugs get more and more complex. Right? And um, I'll get back to what it is, you know, what, what exactly is configuration, but in a nutshell, um, you know, it, it, it most, mostly boils down to being able actually statically to know that something will, will fail, but then uh, you don't have this information available or you don't use the information before a launch, right? So you, you could have prevented it, but, but then you don't. So this is this whole you know, shift left um, thing. So don't just take my word for it. So these are some observations of former colleagues. Um, and you know, basically, just standard stuff. I don't like bullet points, but you know, just to throw some things out here. So you know, validating, testing, typing. I put this on one line because in Q, this is all the same thing, basically. Uh, you want to do policy enforcement is also in, uh, configuration. You want to shift <coughs> left also, um, and you want to go to a single source of truth, whatever that might mean, right? So uh, I'll, I'll get back to that. So really, the question now here is, uh, and this came back in the research also, like, well, what actually is configuration, right? Like, if you see an outage, is this a configuration-related outage? Is it not, right? Um, so this was a, actually a remarkably hard question to answer, um, and I'll get back to that. Uh, but as I said, right, like the understanding of what is configuration came very much from the sort of the insights we got from Pew. So in order to, to um, um, you know, explain it, I'll give a little crash course on Q first. Um, so this is focusing on Q, the language. So Q is really like a logic engine. Uh, it has uh, tooling, you know, CLIs, API, and you can um, get to a lot of this programmatically, right? You don't have to use the language per se, um, but it's the, you know, the easiest to visualize and to, to reason about. So. Uh, Right? So you can drop the quotes, you can drop that's actually quite tricky to do that in a, in a language. Um, pretty much sums it up for the, for the simple representation of data. But you can also represent types. So on the left you see Go, on the right you see Q. Um, and you Right, except that you still have the colons uh, after the fields uh, in Q and, and like lists are represented slightly differently, but it looks very similar. Um, then you can also do uh, validation or putting constraints on or you know, like a schema, whatever you want to call it, uh, APIs. So on the left hand you see some JSON schema, I'll zoom in in a moment, on the right hand you see the Q. So here we have um, you know, something that's a little bit more specific than, than, an, um, uh, than a struct, so maybe describing a specific machine type. Um, so for example, if you want to say that a field is of type string, in JSON schema you would do this like this, and in Q you do it like you see on the right-hand side. Um, same thing if a value is an, uh, is an enumeration, 
um, left hand side JSON schema, right hand side Q. It's just a or symbol, right? Like you can write multiple values. Um, same thing for uh, relations or constraints. Like if you want to limit a, val a number range, right? Like you can do that like this in, in Q. Um, and you can also do that with, um, with um, I missed a slide here, I think. But you can do that with, uh, with arrays as well. So now, um, Q can also do templating. You won't see much difference because in Q, templating and validation is really the same thing. Um, but just, just for good measure, I'll show you some HCL as well. So Q also has expressions. So this, this expression you see here in HCL, you could do exactly the same thing in Q, but typically you would write it like this. Um, so Q doesn't assign, it's, it's, as I said, it's management layer agnostic. So it doesn't assign any special value to any field Right? So there is no variable section like in HCL. Um, um, but you can, you, know, you can interpret any variable, uh, anything, however you want. Uh, but uh, a mechanism that Q has in this case then is that you can tag it. So there's this tag attribute. Uh, you have attributes uh, are used for many different things. And they, uh, but with the tag attribute, you can say, OK, I have these uh, you know, names that I'm using as variables in which I can uh, you know, inject things on the command line, for example, or programmatically. Um, um, so, so Q is very much focused on being hermetic, right? Like all the good uh, properties you want to have for a configuration language. So, just like HCL, you can also reference then these variables, right? So, so same same thing. So, validation. Um, so, as I said, Q doesn't have any specific, you know, inter interpreted section. So, there's no validation section, but you can write validation directly in Q. So, that's how that would translate. And then one thing you haven't seen yet, uh, Q has something like defaults. So I said um, uh, before maybe like uh, that Q doesn't have overrides or that overrides inheritance is a very bad thing to do. I lied. Uh, so default values are actually inheritance. Um, so, but in practice, when I say you shouldn't do inheritance, if you do one layer of inheritance, it's generally fine. The problem is that's very limited. Actually, that's how GCL started out. It was one of the requirements. Uh, if you do it at the structure level, that doesn't really work. It's too limiting. But we found that if you just have defaults, um, you cover 90% uh, plus of what you want to do with inheritance, and you don't have uh, all the complexity you get from it right later. But you know, different story. Not really uh, important to understand for this talk. Um, so comments are first class citizens in queue. Uh, you can access it from the API quite easily and all that stuff. So this is uh, how you would typically do a description. Um, so one thing to note, if you look at all of these, is that no matter whether you have validation, templating, um, uh, schema, data, it's all the same structure, right? Like, the, so, so for Q, the structure remains the same for all of these. And you can also mix and match that, right? So you can have a, um, uh, like a structure or object, however you want to call it, that is partly data and partly validation, partly schema, um, and partly templating. And um, this is a very important property of Q. Um, and I'll explain later why this is so important. So another, uh, another um, um, way to view Q is that really um, it's, um, it's, it's like a spreadsheet, like a type spreadsheet for JSON. Um, so really what we are thinking is like Q should be very, very simple, right? And you should have only simple expressions at wherever, wherever you have expressions, right? Like wherever it's not data. Um, and uh, if you want to do any kind of complex computation, it's much better to use a programming language, right? Um, so right now, we have a, a lot of built-ins uh, in Q that you can use for all kinds of stuff. Some of them are, are quite uh, generic, so you can do a lot of computation outside. But we're also working on like a WASM integration so that you can really hook in uh, any, any language. But we, we think that configuration should, uh, in essence, be simple. Um, so why is that? And this is also one of the, the things where, where I also in the past have gone wrong. So if you think about scripting and, and uh, programming languages, right? So a scripting language, the goal is you want to get something out quickly. Uh, you want to experiment, right? You want th something to be very expressive, right? So, um, but this expresses, expressiveness goes at the expense of readability, um, which if you're working in a team, that's not great, right? In a team, if you write something, you want your other teammates to be able to read it quite easily. Um, and um, you know, other people could also be you in a, a week later, because very often if I write something down and, and I do it quick and I read it you know, a week or a month later, I might not even know myself what I've written. Right? So readability is key in programming languages. 
So, and it depends a bit how you're using configuration and what setting you use it, but in a large company, it's, it's very often that the team that has to read configuration, very often in an emergency setting also, is not the team that actually wrote um, the configuration, right? So if one team says, I want to write in Go, or the other says, I want to write in Scala, you cannot assume that the people looking at the configuration actually know these languages, right? So you want something that is much more um, um, straightforward, right? Like something like JSON, uh, as close as possible, that people can actually understand what you're doing. Um, so inheritance flies in the face on that, of that, right? It makes things way more complex. It's incredibly hard to track where values are coming from once you start doing that. And so, so Q has been designed with, with that in mind also. So can you now finally tell me what you have learned about configuration, right? Because I've had all these uh, detours. So let's look at a very simple um, setup. Um, so here we have a Pong server, so a user can send a ping request, um, and all the server does is reply with Pong. Um, you know, we, have, we make it a little bit more complicated, so we're using Terraform to set up a com Google Compute instance. Uh, we're setting up a database uh, in which uh, audit logs are stored. Um, maybe a bit excessive to use a database for that, but why not? It's a, an example. And then we have also an open policy agent that um, does some checks on the incoming messages. So where is the configuration here? Well, uh, one very obvious one is, of course, the Terraform configuration, right? Like, that shouldn't surprise anybody. I'm not going into details there, not very interesting. So another one is, for example, the server itself could have a configuration file, could be a JSON thing, uh, but also command line arguments are configuration, environment variables are configuration, uh, feature flags are configuration, although that's more part of the code, but... Um, so this is all configuration, but again, nothing surprising here, uh, probably. Um, now it gets a little bit more interesting. What about the database, right? Is, is, is that configuration? Is, uh, well, arguably the data could be configuration. In this case, I would argue it's not. Um, but what about the schema, right? Well, um, so, so let's hold that thought for now. Is this configuration or not? Um, but on the right-hand side, you see how would I represent this uh, SQL, Google SQL uh, schema in uh, Q on the right-hand side, right? So you see, again, it looks very much like a, like a structured schema, but it has some limitations on string lengths. Uh, and at the bottom of the SQL, you see that the, the, the method right, for the incoming message uh, has to be either get or post. Um, so we represent it in Q as well, right? So this is basically a Q representation of that schema. So at least you can represent it in Q, which is um, uh, generally, um, you know, sort of starts hinting at maybe maybe it is configuration. Um, but why would be, that be relevant, right? Now let's look at the server. So if you're looking at the server, you'll find some uh, feature flags potentially and things. But uh, one thing we see there is that we have this Go struct uh, that the server uses to, to stage uh, an audit log that it can then write to the database, right? But this maps one and one to, to uh, the database schema. So now you're already seeing one problem here, right? So the Go struct uh, in idiomatic Go, I mean, I guess you could uh, uh, do something, but it, typically in idiomatic Go, you would write string. You're not creating an array of 100 to, to, to limit the strings that you could uh, put in there. But you're already seeing here that you have a discrepancy between what the database table says and what, um, what Go says, right? So you can actually create an audit struct that once you write it to the database, uh, you get a runtime failure, right? So um, whereas clearly all the information is available statically to determine uh, that this could be a problem, right? Um, so where else is configuration? So let's look at the uh, open policy agents, right? So is policy configuration or not? So. This is again, it's a very simple rule. It only says that uh, the input method in this case should be get. So even though the server supports post and get, uh, we're saying no, we're only gonna allow get, right, for incoming messages as a matter of policy. So Rego does some things implicitly. So there is an uh, implicit input field which has the incoming message. Um, and then basically you have to drill down in it the way Rego works. It's also logic programming, but you retrieve, um, you retrieve the information and then you compare it against the value. You could do that in Q, not very idiomatic the way uh, you do it in Q. It's more you, you push the constraints into the structure, which is, uh, in this case, it makes it longer, but 
generally you would see that, that a typical queue would be a half to a quarter of a typical Rego application in size. Uh, but this is a way to do it. Um, now, if we continue, so um, if, if the Pong server you know, is set up nicely, it would also advertise what is my API, right? And you can do that with Open API, for example. So on the left-hand side, again, you see some Open API. On the right-hand side, you see a possible representation in Q. And um, one thing to note here also is that, um, so in this API definition, you only have get also, right? So this sort of... Uh, implies that post is not allowed. But here also you see you have multiple sources of truth, right? You have your policy engine that say you can only have gets, but also the API that you're publishing is saying the same thing, right? Um, so I guess you could argue, well, uh, post could be defined here somewhere else, but then in Q you could say, well, you know, like no, um, so the square bracket things is like a pattern matching thing in Q, so here you can say if you see any path uh, where, where it's not get within, within the, the ping server or the ping request, then it is an error. Um, so this would be an alternative way potentially of, of representing that constraint uh, you saw earlier. So in general you can see now that, um, so this is a very simple service, but even here you have uh, not a single truth for a lot of things that we would consider uh, configuration, right? So whether it's policy, schema, uh, constraints on schema, validation, right? Like in this very simple server, it's all over the place. I, I can go on, you can find other things. Um, but all over the place, you have these things where there's no single source of truth, where you can see there is a potential for, for a failure that in many cases you could determine statically, but you don't, right? So how do we envision now that, that you could deal with this, right? So. Um, so one way to do is to determine what is the, the overall contracts or what are the contracts that are in play in the system here, right? So you can imagine it's like, okay, in some cases we extract some of this information from code or we extract it from various places. Uh, we put it into a, uh, we write it, conver uh, convert it to queue, right? In other cases, it could be that you write it in queue and you convert it to, um, to uh, some other representation. So for example, Istio is a project that uses uh, Q from converting protocol buffers to open API generation. So it's not using it for configuration checking, but pure for morphing between these different representations. Um, and the whole point there is to fail early, right? To, to get as much information as possible um, left. So now um, the picture I've represented a little bit here is that Q basically um, uh, treats all uh, configuration at all these different levels, right? So you have types, you have API, policy, validation, templates. Um, so these are all different levels of abstractions, if you will. Um, the reality isn't quite that simple. So in the reality, there's actually a lot of overlap between these. We've seen this a little bit already, where like with the database schema, you have validation bleeding into schema, and you know, um, in practice, you see this quite a lot, right? And um, if you have things like, uh, like templates, as we can see later, templates are often also validation, depends on how you use it. Um, so the way we see it, it's, uh, so Q, it's very convenient that you can do all these different representations in a single language, uh, and it has the same structure, you don't have to learn uh, all these different things. Uh, but it's not just a nice to have, it's actually a necessity that you can represent this all in, the, in a single uh, framework. So if you don't have that, there's no way to cross-validate this stuff. Um, so this is actually a quote from the uh, uh, cloud.google.com. Uh, so um, what they observed there is that if you have infrastructure as code, um, so if you're representing your configuration as code, you, you actually, what you're giving off is on explicit contracts, right? So another thing that's really important in Q is that you're very explicit about your contracts, that you know exactly what are the interfaces between systems, uh, how is your data represented, uh, right, and, and, and if, you, if you do not do declarative uh, configuration, you're, you're, you're basically at a loss quite quickly, right. Um, this is a quote from Kelsey, tweet from Kelsey, um, basically is, uh, saying the same thing. Um, so how do we reconcile all these different parts in Q? So one other uh, very important aspect of Q that I haven't mentioned yet is that um, um, so if you, if you start using inheritance and, and overrides, 
So one of the problems of that is that it makes things uh, much more complex and hard to understand. Um, another problem with that is that now, once you, once you have these overrides, um, the order in which you apply these overrides matter, right? Like whatever you apply last wins. Um, but that means that you have to um, uh, assign a certain order uh, to, to how you're applying these things. And this kind of works in software engineering, right? Which is a little bit more like regular engineering where you take these components and you start layering them and there's always sort of a, an obvious last, not always, right? Like if you, if you, you know, did your study in, in, in OO and this is one of the reasons uh, that Go went to polymorphism and not subtype um, uh, inheritance, right? But, uh, but generally speaking, there's more natural uh, uh, order to things. Whereas with uh, configuration, usually things come in, we saw this in the, this little example service, things are coming in from all these different sides, right? Like what uh, inherits from what? Does, uh, is the Rego more important than the, than the open API or not? Like, like, I don't know, right? It just comes in from all these different angles. So if you're now gonna be forced to apply an order to this, like it, it makes things incredibly complex, right? Like you have this large string potentially of things um, um, you know, creating this combinatorial explosion. So what Q does, it represents everything in a way um, that the order in which you combine things doesn't matter. So you don't have to think about these things at all. Um, but more importantly, it, it allows you to combine things in a, in a very simple way of uh, thinking about it, uh, once you get it. Um, so here we see, uh, so the basic concept is that you put all your configuration aspects, no matter whether it's schema or data or policy, you all put it into a single namespace. And one way I like to think about it is like a RESTful path, right? So you have a RESTful path, um, and if you have like data configuration, right, it basically means it's one concrete path all the way um, to the end, for example. Um, but let's consider this tree, so this is, uh, so we have some Kubernetes deployments and services, we have two environments, production and development, um, and, and let's see what this means for Q in this, in this case, right? So, so if we have a deployment Pong service that we want to put somewhere in this tree, it's quite simple. Um, it's a production service, it's a deployment, it's called Pong. So we, uh, we put that at this place in the tree, right? And this, is, uh, this top line is how you would roughly write that in Q, and the, the you know, the, uh, curly braces dot 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 is just the JSON configuration of that uh, Pong service. But um, so we also have a Pong service in development, and a lot of these um, these um, you know fields would be the same, right? For for um, for both Pong services. So what if we want to specify something that's common to both? Well, in in Q you can uh, you can basically put a, a wildcard uh, in a path, and it's the square brackets uh, because you can really do any kind of pattern matching to select, uh, you know, like like which uh, which subtree you want to apply it to. But in this case, let's let's just do a star equivalent, right? So we're saying, okay, we're matching in any environment, production or development, we want to set these fields for the Pong service, right? So this could be yeah, anything that's in common. Um, but it could also be validation, right? Like any validation that we want to have in common. At this level, you, you start thinking validation uh, of them. Um, but then we can also say like, well, wait a minute. We also have uh, fields that are common to all deployments in any kind of uh, environment. And then we just introduce another wildcard. And it looks like this. And you, you push uh, all this information to all these uh, services. Um, so one thing that's, that you start thinking here is like if you have a deployment schema, so the generic uh, schema for deployments, this is where you would uh, jam that in basically. So let's make that a little bit more concrete. Um, so, if, um, um, so in Q you have this directory structure where basically at the top level, this is an option where at the top level you, you, you can have a Q that applies to all the subdirectories, so that's the setup we have here. So anything that's specific to production or development, we put into the, um, into the Q files in this uh, directory. And anything that applies to all of it, we put in the parent directory. Um, so there's also a QMod directory, which is sort of like a .git directory that marks sort of the boundary of your whole hermetic uh, um, system. So if we then want to set, um, you know, like anything specific to the deployment Pong service, so let's say we want to set replicas to, uh, to six. Uh, this is actually the only thing we, we vary in this case. Um, we can you know, specify the path for that and set spec replicas, which is a Kubernetes things to six. 
Um, we could have put in this all in one line, right? So as I said, Q has no uh, awareness of any kind of meaning of any fields. It's just data. There's no special interpretation anywhere. Uh, so this could have been on one field, but sort of idiomatically, it's nice to split the path from the, from the data, I find. Um, so now we can also say, okay, let's put, put uh, all the fields that are common to, to the Pong service in production or dev. We can write it like this. Uh, we can also use the wildcard, as we said before. Um, now, one thing that you note, um, because we don't typically use inheritance, so replicas does not have a number, it just says it's an integer. Uh, and that basically signals, okay, in any of the you know, production and, de and development, you have to set this integer to a certain value. So generally speaking, this is, the, this is a better approach. It's, it's, uh, having default values is, is not that great. Uh, in many cases, sometimes it is, but in many cases it's not. In this case, I would argue it's also not a good idea to do. But if you really wanted to, you could do it like this, right? You can say, okay, by default I have one, uh, but it could also be really any integer. Um, so you can write it like this if you had to not recommend it. Um, so now let's say we want to uh, mix on some, some requirements or constraints or some enforcements, right? So um, because Q, because you have this, uh, this order independence, I can just put it in a different file, right? So let's say I'm, in, I'm putting anything monitoring related in monitoring.q. Gets automatically mixed in in these same, same paths, right? So what I'm basically saying here is we want to have for any Pong service, we want to um, set Prometheus scrape, uh, scraping to true always. Right? And, uh, well, somebody else might say, well, that's a great idea. We really want to enforce this as a matter of policy throughout uh, the entire, uh, for all deployments. So you can just uh, change that into a wildcard if you have to. Um, so in this case, um, it's a validation rule, if you will. Um, but it can also be templating, right? Uh, this, this same rule both verifies that if somebody specifies it, it's there, but on the other hand, it's also mixed in. So it's also templating at the same time, right? However you want to interpret it. You could also say, well, we recommend you do it, so we make it a default, right? So, so here you see a rule that's both um, uh, convenience templating as well as validation, right? It it's, uh, enforces that you don't use a Boolean, but rather use the string true, which is a requirement in this case. Um, um, you know, so, so you could do that, and then you can even say, well, okay, we recommend it for any service, but at least in production you have to turn it on, right? So here you can see that even in multiple places, you, you can have different departments have different policies or whatever, that all gets mixed in. Um, and you could have, uh, not conflicting, but basically the same paths. And basically what it does, it takes the, uh, you know, the, the lowest common denominator, if you will, the, or the greatest lower bound, however you want to uh, view this. But in this case, uh, for production services, it's true because the, the above one also matches, right? But the only thing that both have in common is that it's true, right? If it's the one is true, the other one cannot be uh, true anymore. So true is the only thing that works in this case. Is it just the combination that you were talking about? Yeah, the combination, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and because it's not inheritance, one doesn't override the other, right? It doesn't matter in which order I apply it. I mean, maybe I should have said false here, right? Because the default is true already, but uh, with false it would work too. Um, so, so far I've said Q is not aware of anything specific, it, it's not Kubernetes aware. Um, and so we only seen fields for deployments that we have specified, but how do I really know now uh, that, that it's enforcing a, a, a correct uh, Kubernetes deployment? Uh, well, you can do that too, right? So typically how you would do that is with imports, you import the Kubernetes schema and, um, and you, you, know, you put in these wildcards and so that it gets pushed out to every, every deployment. Um, then you could ask, well, you know, what if I don't have any Kubernetes schema? So um, as I also alluded to, Q has these adapters, right? So you can basically say Q get go points to the go path for, for the, you know, of the go code. Kubernetes uses go as the source of truth, by the way, so not, not protocol buffers. The protocol buffers are derived from the source code. Um, so you can do that, like point to the Go uh, uh, code, and it recursively will get all the all the libraries and create the Q schemas that you can then import into your Q. So of course, nicer if you would, pro would provide that uh, um, as a sort of you know pre-generated stuff to users. We're working on that, but uh, right now you can generate it yourself. Works for Prometheus. Works for whatever. Um, 
So uh, another nice thing, so because um, validation is also templating, right? Like you, um, um, you can do all kinds of nice tooling around this. So one example is suppose that um, you start out with, with concrete configurations, like you, you just converted your YAML or whatever, or maybe it still is YAML. Um, so you, you, you have your concrete configuration, which you see on the right-hand side here, for your punk servers. And only later you started adding the templates or the validation, right? So in this situation, the template you have on the left-hand side is really validating that the values that you also have on the right-hand side are correct, right? But now we're saying, okay, so I've made these templates now. Now I want to, you know, I kind of want to restructure my configuration so I don't have all this redundancy. Um, well, because you don't have inheritance, right, it's, it's quite easy to derive like what, what you know, you know, what you can derive from your templates, right? So you can very easily see uh, what becomes unnecessary. So this is what QTrim does. So by running this, it will convert the right hand, um, uh, the right hand configuration essentially to this because everything else can be derived from your templates, so it just removes it and, and you know, creates a, a, a removes it so that you have a single source of truth within your configuration. Um, so Trim was written quite early on because uh, when I created GCL, I had this in my mind with my previous company where we had this fantastic tooling and like really wild things that we would, uh, would discover and automatically generate and all that stuff like, like you know, you could, most people can only dream of, right? So I had this in mind, and I promised that with GCL. Like, the nice thing about declarative uh, configuration is you can do all this wild tooling. Well, guess what? As soon as you use overrides, you're done. You cannot do that anymore. Uh, but this mantra got all repeated, like, yeah, we do all this automation. Like, where is the automation? Show me the automation. There is no automation, right? So, um, and this stuff is a little bit hard to, to build, but I wanted to have at least one thing where I show, like, look, this is what you can do if you have like, uh, you know, a good model behind your declarative configuration. So this is, uh, QTrim is the first uh, start of it, but other things you can imagine, uh, this is all possible. It's like given all my configurations, concrete configurations like YAML, JSON, uh, give me the min minimal set of templates um, that can produce these configurations, right? So like automatically refactoring, you know, this is all possible. We'll, we'll work on it in the, in the future, but we're not quite there yet. So, doesn't quite stop here yet. Um, so Q is used for all kinds of things. So actually, the, maybe the biggest application for Q is not so much configuration, but composable workflows. Um, we see that most companies using Q, or at least half of them, are, are, are going into that direction. Uh, we have a lot of policy um, uh, startups and companies, uh, uh, you know, doing things with Q, like in supply chain, uh, chain security, for example. <coughs> API generation already mentioned that. Network automation. One of my favorites is uh, somebody encoded the entire U.S. tax code. I don't know if they did the alternative minimum tax also, but uh, the entire U.S. tax code in Q. And the uh, the reasoning was there is, uh, you know, so so if you encode all the rules in the tax code, you don't necessarily want to know how you want to use it, right? Like, do you want to fill in this part? Do you want to fill in this part, and then derive the rest? So with Q, because it goes in all these directions and it's logic programming, right? Like. Uh, they found that it's, it's, um, it's, it's the easiest way to basically um, be able to reuse all these rules no matter what you want your API to be, right? So that's a pretty wild application of Q. So the Q project, um, so as I said, Q is really more than just a language, right? It has all these tooling, refactoring, uh, you have some, some libraries in Go that you can use to, to create these dynamic workflows and stuff like that. People use that a lot. Um, so then for the encodings, so we have um, a bunch of supported encodings. Some of them are only in one direction. Um, you know, we want to step that up so that we uh, make that a little bit more com uh, complete, but also allow users to write their own uh, encodings if they have to through the WASM interface. Uh, so Postgres is a, is a nice one, right? Like you, you can have uh, incomplete references in queue. Uh, if you think about it, right, it, it is logic programming, so really this is one-to-one -one, um, equal to SQL, right? So we should easily uh, be able to create a SQL generator from, from Q. Um, uh, you know, this is all sort of um, TB, TBD, right? So these are some of the users, uh, really wildly different uh, use cases uh, for Q. Some of them are using it for test generation, uh, API generation, as I said, a lot of... Uh, uh, telecom and, and clouds, uh, where it's mostly for C CICD-like stuff. Um, we're currently seven strong at the moment. Um, uh, you know, it's a, it's a, 
uh, might be hiring more in the future. We'll, we'll see. Um, yeah, so as a conclusion, um, so we really think that, that a unified uh, approach to configuration is really uh, key to increasing reliability, right? It's not just cute, it's not just convenient, but um, there's a lot of information that you have in code um, and, and configuration and spread out through the system that if you, if you intersect that, you'll be actually able to find a lot of problems with your system that are really uh, undiscovered in a lot of cases uh, right now. And uh, with that, um, I want to say, like, first of all, you know, if you have any questions, you can contact me here. Uh, you know, also happy to take contributions in, in any direction. And with that, I'll uh, leave it for Q&A. Any questions? Uh, yeah. Is there a language protocol uh, support for this? Pardon? Language protocol support for it? Are you editing? Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. So, so we have um, a very minimal LSP uh, setup, which is only syntax. Uh, but we have uh, our top priorities for development uh, are um, some more like community modules, right? So modules you don't have to, so with, without vendoring. Um, that's one, so the WASM support, and then the next big thing to, to really do is uh, LSP. So we already have people uh, started working on that. Uh, so Dagger, one of the companies using Q, has made their own uh, LSP for, for Q also. Uh, but it's more a little bit more Dagger specific, but uh, yeah, using the, either the Go one or the Dagger one as a start for Q is uh, high on our uh, agenda, yeah. So, so we, we realize that that's a critical uh, piece of uh, infrastructure for Q. Yeah. Any other question? Ah, there. Yeah. Um, so, let's say I'm super convinced that it would be safer for the configuration. Yeah. Um, is there a fear or a worry that understanding the complex mechanisms that are, are available to the program writers yeah. could cause a new source of error because they think they're doing one thing but they misunderstand and make those sorts of programming bugs? Is that a worry? Yeah, we haven't really. All so uh, oh, right. Okay. So I'll repeat the question. So, so uh, the question is, if I understand it correctly, is is there a fear that by using this, and if you start using Q and, and putting it all uh, in this in the system, that this gives rise to sort of new types of failures? Is that what I'm? Types of programming complexity. Bugs. New types of pr programming complexity bugs. Yeah. So. Um, so aside from, from potential bugs in Q itself, right? So let's let's uh, rule this uh, this out for now. Uh, they're there, right? But but uh, that's a different kind of uh, problem. So um, we have now some users that are big enough um, to sort of be able to see that at least uh, our theory that it should be working, that it's really working, right? So. Um, so we, we've seen configurations where you have, you know, about 40,000 lines, which is not that big, right? But it's, it's spread across 40 teams already. It's coming in from all these different angles. So in my experience with uh, GCL, uh, GCL is basically, uh, JSONnet is sort of like the, the open source port of, of GCL, right? It's, it's very similar. So it, it would have been fallen flat on its face like long before that, right? So, so we know that the, that with this approach, we have been able to avoid these uh, scaling issues. And with scaling, I mean software engineering issues, right? where, where people cannot understand it anymore. So, um, so in talking to these uh, companies, we've had basically, um, so the problems they're running into is really like, okay, when are you supporting modules? Or, or you know, this part is a bit slow or whatever. But uh, the software engineering part is, is not a problem at all, right? So it's, uh, and as I said, in, the, in, in these old days, right, this is a slightly different formalism, but still it was, uh, you know, hundreds of thousands of lines uh, without much of a management issue, right? So, yeah? Yeah. Like you have, you know, because people can make direct <coughs> shows with four levels, they can have four levels in the account. Yeah. Um, and you can have an override of all these like, locations, and you have the final answer where it's going from. Yeah. So the question is uh, do you have any kind of tooling to show um, where overrides are coming from, and, and like uh, if, if that's if that's correct. So first of all, uh, Q doesn't have overrides, well, right? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, so but um, but yeah. So what the evaluator does, it basically. Um, 
keeps track of every single value in the input, so it's, it's a little bit expensive, right? But at the end of your evaluation, you have the, um, the, uh, the full history of where things are coming from. Um, and um, we don't visualize that yet. Our idea was so like once we have the LSP, we visualize it in the LSP, right? Like that, that would be the, the obvious things to do. Uh, but it would be, uh, yeah, it would be trivial to, to implement that because the information is right there, right? We just, yeah. Uh, and, and users can do that in the API, so you can easily in the API you can see you you can get all the all the locations. Yeah. And, and one last question in mind: um, do, you, do you support fetching templates validations, terminology of a remote location, like pick it up, like this typical JSON schema that the thing is on the URL? Yeah, so the question is if uh, somebody publishes some, some schema or templates, uh, can it be referenced uh, in, as a URL? So right now this is uh, not the case, but this is one of these features that is uh, very high up in the list where we have like a, basically a package management uh, system, right, where you maybe, basically people can publish uh, these packages, whether it's templates or schema, and then uh, yeah, download them and, and insert them. So you would just have to reference it in your in your code, very much like Go would work, basically. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So as far as I can tell, uh, Q as a language is open source. Mm -hmm. is Yeah, so, so the question is how does it um, uh, survive as a, as a company and, and with funding? So um, there are some pretty good uh, models, I would say, on, on funding open source. So, um, um, you know, you could, you could say that, that Q is uh, similar to um, Elasticsearch in some way, like how you could possibly uh, fund it, right, which is a quite successful model. So there's it's very similar, a lot of similarities there. but. Um, yeah. So, so th th yeah, I can I can take it offline. There's there tons of uh, tons of possibilities. Yeah. Ah, one more question. Where can we find you? Uh, because there's no dedicated Q room for discussions. Uh, Marcel uh, is here the rest of the day. I'm here the rest so of the day. I'm here to. You can to, find him yeah. somewhere around. Yeah. To, today, yeah. tomorrow. Yeah. 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 O otherwise, uh, DM me on uh, on Twitter or something, and then we'll. Uh, next next yeah. year, you'll he'll organize a complete room for a whole day. I'll I'll do that. Yes. I'll do okay. That. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Thank you. Thank you, Marcel. Thank you. So up next is Ulf. Uh, please compress so people can actually sit on a seat. There are more than enough open seats. Trying not to get the cable in. Hello.
Hello. Please compress and let people sit down. You want to hold the mic, or are you going to put it here? No, I will hold it. Okay. So Ulf is up next with the talk. He'll do his introduction. Yes. Uh, my name is Ulf Monson. I'm working for a company called Ad Phoenix. We are selling services to real estate agencies. Uh, this will be more uh, like a little bit softer presentation. Uh, it will not be that deep into technologies, but it will be how you use technologies. So I will talk about uh, 10 plus years, I would say, experience of internal development platforms that I've been part of creating. And, uh, and I will talk about why it can act as a turbo for business growth. Maybe some of you recognize this car. It was like a hot car in the late 70s. Maybe a lot of you was not even born at that time. But this was Saab, a Swedish car, that they introduced the turbo engine. I think they were the first car maker to do that, actually. And by that, the car accelerated much better and much quicker than most of the other cars. And I would say it's the same with IDP. IDP can help your company to grow much quicker. Uh, so this is just my job title, as I would say, for the last 15 years. Maybe you all recognize this, like sysadmin, infrastructure engineer, infrastructure architect I've been, infrastructure developer for a while, SRO engineer, manager, DevOps engineer, plumber, Plum, plumbing infrastructure, uh, DevOps architect, pipeline expert, DevOps specialist, infrastructure ninja, I prefer, prefer that one, and maybe now it's a platform engineer that I should name myself. I didn't know that when I started with this 12, year, 12 years ago, but it seems like a platform engineer is the new hot thing. And I would say my job title has never been a YAML engineer. The main reason, because I never become a YAML engineer, is that that was quite lazy. I really like to automate stuff and not, not, not manage YAML code. Uh, when I was going to do this presentation, uh, I thought that I should do, get some help. Uh, I did like a, pre a presentation like 10 years ago that was uh, become quite popular. And at that time, my daughter was like five and eight years old, and I had them to help my, me with the presentation. So I just gave them the title of the, pre, of the slide, and they, they just draw something on it. You can see that on the top. Uh, now they are like 15 and 18 years old. So I asked them, actually, because they're quite do, good to do painting and things like that, I asked them, and I said, that you will get some money as well. But they said that they have more busy, important stuff. And actually, this morning, my daughter sent me an uh, SMS and she, or a message. And she sa says she had a problem with the gym card because it will expire tomorrow. Then I say, OK, we fix it later on today. No, we need to fix it now. No, but I'm preparing a presentation for 600 people, I say. And then she said, no, but it's more important with my gym card. Can you fix it now, Dad? So this is about that ops, but it doesn't work very much these days to ask the kids to do something. But then I got into Dali, and then there is a Swedish pen painter called Oslund that is quite famous in Sweden. He's doing a lot of landscape draw, draw painting and things like that, or did. Uh, and I, I tried to use Dali on that one to get drawings that looks like his drawing, but it's failed quite badly. But he was inspired by Paul Gagin, and he was uh, actually one, uh, for again, was a teacher for Austin. I, I like his drawing as well, and that works a little bit better. So you see some drawings here. But then after a while, my credits run out on Dali, because you need to. So it's just a few slides with some painting. So here is one painting. So I think I own the, own the painting, actually, because I created it. So about uh, IDP. I would say this is a good definition I find about IDP. It's a platform built by a platform team. Maybe, maybe, maybe that's not needed, but it's to build golden paths uh, and also enable developer services. And I think those things are really, really important. It's to do, be able to do the thing in the right way, to have golden paths that work seamless for the developers to get things into production and configure infrastructure. 
And it was uh, important with this self-service that they can do it by themselves, that they don't need to ask someone or don't need help or something like that. Also that they don't need, need to learn a lot of new technologies or languages or anything like that. <coughs> also about IDPs, like, I don't think it's a product you can buy. There are some companies trying to create those IDPs, but I, it's not a product that you buy. It consists of many different technologies and tools, and those are specific for your company, I would say. You, you take the tools that you have and you try to glue it together, and you add with some other technologies as well to make it easy for a developer to get things out in production. As I said before, I'm, why, why, we, why I like IDPs is because I'm lazy. This is from my summer house in south of Sweden. This is my tractor. And actually I prefer to run with my tractor instead of doing other stuff or, or work and things like that and also queries or things like that. And also I, I always take tools that exist. It's not like I create a new config management tool because I don't like the config management tools or something like that. <laughs> so, but I'm happy that all of you are doing this thing because then I can be lazy and I can do, do things. But it's not only for me personally that it's good with IDP or internal developer platform. It's for the business as well. And I think the super most important thing is the speed of feature development get the feature deployed, and as it was in the discussion or talk yesterday, deploy, get the feature deployed into production, that's the most important. If you put a lot of feature branches uh, and it's not, never deployed, then there's no use of it. So, and uh, I think it was just humble that say deploy, uh, done, deploy is a done, done. So, and, but by uh, IDP, you can impro uh, improve the speed of uh, feature development. Also from a cost perspective, because with the IDP you have control, much better control of the, of the cost and things like that, and you can optimize your operation, for example, and that's super important those days when you have those huge bills from AWS. Also about quality, it's easier, you need to fix it only in one place and not in like many different repos or many different teams need to fix it. You can fix a lot of stuff centrally with the IDP. And also, it's also easy to adopt infrastructure to new requirements. Uh, like we had, like we had, uh, got some U.S. customer the last six months. Big, big companies, much bigger than the companies in Europe, and they put a lot of requirements on security. Like you need to do OWASP scan and things like that. And then we can implement that in the IDP. So we can implement that without having a developer involved in, in, in that implementation. The only thing they need to fix was if the scanning f finds some bugs and things like that. But we need, didn't, need, didn't need to disturb the team to do like adding scanning and things like that. So, but it's not only me that, that, that looks into this. I think this was a quite good study done, I think it was last year, by Amanitech, DevOps setups. I think maybe I read it. <coughs> and it was to try to find, in the same way as State of DevOps, try to find the top performance of what they are doing. And one thing, they're using loosely a couple architectures, top performance, and that's, that's why, where you need IDP when you have like Microsoft, things like that. If you have a big like monolith, then maybe it's not the same need of uh, IDP. And then you use public clouds, uh, and then configuration as code, and also infrastructure as code solutions. Uh, and then we continue that one. Uh, and uh, most of them are using container technology. I don't think you need to use container to technology to be top for my run business where we do, did a lot of auto scaling EC2, and that works perfectly as well. Uh, and uh, this. And you need to deploy every day, or at least 80% did that. And also that it doesn't take like weeks to get it in production. But the last thing there in the report, that they say that almost 100% of, of the teams use developer, or developer can self-service themselves. So I think that looks like a super important thing that the developer can do. There is also a quite good book. This is like 25 years old or something like that. But and it's not. A, it's about management. It's a, how you get the company from good to great. 
But they are they're talking about that you need to, 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 to have think about getting to the core mission. I think it's the same for, for development or for, for a SaaS company or something like that. The core thing is to get the features out. That's the, like the core business. Uh, also. And the fun thing in this book was that one of the CEOs, he, he, uh, it was Dave Packard behind HP, uh, and he also liked to drive a tractor as well. So he was like, you don't need to work all the time, you should have a business that works by itself. It's the same with the IDP, if you're a platform engineer, it should work by itself and then you can drive your tractor or whatever you like to do. And I think with the IDP you never edit YAML files. If you start to add a lot of YAML files, then I think you get, have a problem. It's not about that. It's about automation, uh, automation. and also that you shouldn't like manage pets, like ma manage different repos or things like that, or different infrastructure configuration, things like that. Or uh, you shouldn't manage like Kubernetes cluster as pets, you should manage it as cattle. Uh, so, like I said, everything should be more or less dynamic. I, and I would say this is a pretty good definition if you have an IDP. You never edit JSON or YAML. You're never disturbed by a developer. Your management are really happy on you, what you're doing. And you also never get like titles, internal titles like employee of the month or something like that. Because normally when you work in operation, everything works, or with infrastructure, then no one will notice that you're doing anything. The only time they notice when you're doing something, that is when it fails. So you go under the radar and are happy by that. And then you never get disturbed by a lot. I'm not sure that that will ever happen for me, but <laughs> maybe when I retire. But. So this is very much about standardization and make it simple to do the right thing. And it should be like hard to manually change things and it should be hard to do the wrong thing. I think this is uh, like super important and like the golden path that I was talking about. So I will talk about three different stories. three different IDPs that I've been part of creating. I, I can say that two have been quite successful, one was a failure. Uh, so the first company is a company called Record the Future, working within threat intelligence. I was like one of the co-founders of that company 12, 13 years ago. Uh, it's today a unicorn, it means the valuation is more like more than one billion U US dollar. Uh, when we started, we were like 10 employees. Today, there are 800 employees. I'm, I'm not working there anymore. I quit like uh, four years ago, five years ago. Uh, but today, there are like 800 employees. They have like 1,500 customers, clients. Uh, at the time I left, I know we had like more than 70 plus microservices. And we had thousands of AWS instances, of petabyte, petabyte of data. I would say the reason behind the success of, of Recorded Future, one of the main reasons was actually the speed of delivery of features. Because when we started we have an idea what we should do, we should like harvest a lot of data in the internet and like to, to structure it into a database and make it searchable. But we didn't have like in which field and so on. After a while, and then also what we had also, we had that idea, but also when it started up it was like a great team there uh, working together. Uh, after a while, we saw that threat intelligence was really great, so we started to focus on that area, and we were able to deliver a lot of new features on an insane speed. So that means that the company could grow, and also when we adding new customers, we didn't do customer-specific solutions, instead we did it like a feature in the product for a different type of customer requirements. So by that, we were able to adopt the product to, to the customer as well. So I think that was a, like a main, main reason for the growth of Recorded Future and the success. That was the IDP. And, uh, and, and the, what, what happened was that the developer developers were able to focus on writing code that make it, made a difference. 
that they could focus on. They didn't, they didn't care about the infrastructure, they didn't care about management of services and so on. They just can focus on the features. And at that time we were like, it took just a couple of hours to get a new microservice up in production, or, or create a new microservice and get it up in production. Uh, also what they have, they had like support with boiler code around the A error handling and things like that as well. So that was a part of the IDP as well. And at the time they put something in production, it was not only that they put the microservice in production, by having those standardization around like logging metrics and things like that, they get logging, they get like metrics dashboard immediately, they get a large automatic create and everything around the service as well. So by just using this boiler code and using the processor, they get all, all that for free. So they didn't have to think about, okay, what type of alert do I need? Uh, if there was some really specific alert, I had to think about that. Or how should I do the logging or everything like that? They didn't have to think about it. It was just out of the box for them. And how that started in Record the Future, I would say it started like 2010, I think it was. I was on a DevOps conference in Hamburg. And then John Willis was there, and he, he, he phrased this CAMS. I think you've seen it, most of you have seen it. But it was about culture automation, monitoring, and sharing. And, and we tried to create that culture and record the future where developer and operation worked close together, uh, really close together. Also, <clears throat> we focused a lot on automation. So we spent a lot of time to automate all the stuff with creation of microservices, with deployment of microservices, uh, and so on. Uh, and then we focus quite much on monitoring, and then also sharing. Sharing the knowledge within the company, like internal meetings and everything, and internal discussions, but also sharing outside, and also take learning from outside as well into the company. So we, we automate uh, like configuration management, all infrastructure, we automate the continuous integration processes, the continuous delivery, and so on. But we also put a lot of requirements on the developer. It's not that you can, it was not like you can do whatever you would like to do. So like no singleton processes, your process has to be able to run in parallel, many processes, so it has to be stateless and everything like around that. Uh, the only way to get the code into production was to deploy via deploy pipelines. That was the only way. They, they didn't have, uh, it was re really hard for them to, to, to do deploy or, or fix things in production. Uh, also, the need to build for a chaos monkey. Actually, th this is, uh, yeah, so, so we, we actually start to use spot instances. And I told the developers that the reason why we need to do spot, uh, use spot instances is because we need to save money. But actually, the reason behind that one was to create a resilient architecture. Because with spot instances, we get the chaos monkey without running a chaos monkey. And by that, we get a really resilient uh, product and, and, uh, and set up. And also, we introduced to start to use a lot of messaging between the, between the services as well. That was like a part of getting it resilient as well. Uh, also, we had those wrappers around like messaging clients, database clients, and things like that. We also had trunk-based development. Actually, we are quite happy because we use Subversion. It's a great product uh, because it's a nice feature because you can't do feature branching in Subversion. It fails all the time. So, and that was really good for us, I would say, because that forced us to do trunk-based development. And that makes it much easier to have this internal development platform as well, with the pipelines and everything. And also it forced us to, to start to use feature talk as well. At that time, there were no services like, like launch or something like that, so we created by ourselves. But we had like a feature toggle me mechanism there. Uh, so feature toggle was super important, and then we have, had the monorep as well. I think monorep is quite nice because you, you own the code together, and, and it's easy to maintain when you're building it in the same way. So this is a little bit how, how it looked at Record Future at that time, uh, with a code repository, and then we initiate build and did that in, in Jenkins and so on. Uh, where the, every artifact we put in S3 and then we put it in auto-scaling groups, I would say more or less the same as Kubernetes. And then we use those tools like Grafana, 
uh, Kibana, Sensor and so on. It was not much about user interface. Actually, we didn't have more. I think the user interface we had at that time was actually Jenkins, more or less, I would say, uh, that the developer used. But it's not like creating fancy user interface and things like that. And the, then they can see the result in Grafana and Kibana and so on. So as we call the future, we had like one team to create and maintain this IDP. I think we were called sysadmin team to start with and then later on infrastructure team uh, or DevOps team or, or, or whatever. No, today you call it platform team, but uh, doing the same stuff all the time. Uh, and then we had what we call the backend team. It, it doesn't mean that they developed the backend, but they were like responsible for those common code like those wrappers that I was talking about, or, or like uh, common how, how to standardize naming around metrics, for example, and also standardize, standardize logging and things like that. And the nice thing with this backend team was that we, we put the very best developers in that team, because this type of code will run a lot of time, but also it's quite complicated. So we put a lot of error handling for messaging, for example, in that common code. And also in this common code, we put a lot of logging, metrics, and everything. So when you put a microservice in production and use this common code, you will get like metrics for every, every query for a database, for example, and the length of the query and everything. So it was like super easy. Later on, if you had a problem, you can say, okay, now this query is starting to grow, or we're doing much more of this. But the developer didn't need to think about that because we put that in the wrapper wrapper code. Uh, but I think it's, well, there, there it's super important. You should have your best developer doing this code because this is super important code to make it stable. And also, it's, it's, as I said, it's quite hard code to write, I would say. But also, what was super important, that was that we had very strong management support. <coughs> and they, they supported the way you work. I think maybe it was because a lot of features was, uh, was released. Maybe that, that was the reason, maybe. But also they were working like in the background. It was not like they were pinpointing, you should do like this and this and this. But you know that you have the support all the time. And also support to, to us other in the company as well. So I would say management team, like, like you see on the picture there, that stands in the background and are ready to, to interact if they need, then they will do it. But that's super important. And that was uh, really great at Recorded Future. And also, the IDP is a platform, it's not a user interface, I would say. Like uh, on Recorded Future, it was not very much, we, we didn't have any user interface for, for the IDP, actually. And, but it, like, and it consists of many tools, and you have like, different UIs when it comes to like, metrics logging and things like that. So it's not to create some fancy application internally, it's more glowing. So I would say you can, you can work like when a team manages everything by themselves. And this is uh, actually a Swedish car as well, it's Koningsegg. And this car is like three, four, five hundred thousand euros or something like that. Uh, and and they are, uh, the team are doing most of the car, they are manufacturing a lot of, of things on the car on, on the same place and on the, the same team. You have to uh, you do a lot of manual work. You have to have a lot of knowledge within the team, and I would say it's quite expensive. Instead, with the IDP, you should focus on standardization. So this is T4, and this is, uh, this is uh, I would say, where, where IDP belongs to. It's, uh, it's about standardization, that you need to do the stuff in the same way. So, so, Depends on what you would like to do, but most of the business, they would like to have feature out in production. That is the only thing that measure for a business normally. Uh, so there, there I think is a quite big difference between the different models. So what did we standardize at Recorded Future? We standardized a lot of things actually. Uh, <coughs> I think the one, one of the most important thing was actually the naming of the processes. We used the same name all over the place, and that drove the, the automation all over the places. So you're quite sure that the, you can put that name wherever, and you will get like the right dashboard, you will get the right logging and everything. So we didn't mess it up uh, there. 
with, with the na names and things like that, on conversion or anything like that. So we follow that. Also, we standardize on the development language, or we had support for GVMs with Groove and Scala, and, and we had like one track for Python, but we didn't introduce a lot of new languages, and the team was not allowed to introduce new languages either. Also, we standardized on database engines. At, uh, uh, in the end, we used MongoDB and, and uh, Elasticsearch, and then uh, SVR as well. It's pretty good as a database engine, I would say, for some use cases. Uh, and before we started to use MySeq, where we used DynamoDB, but all the time when we changed database, we changed it for everything. So it was not that we need to maintain all the legacy databases as well. So we like took a step, so we standardized on the databases. We standardized the build process, standardized the deployment process. And as I said, we had like feature token that we standardized. We standardized our own tool. And then DNS, that was also quite important to standardize. So we didn't have much of service discovery. We used DNS as service discovery more or less for, for everything. And that makes it easy because everyone knows what the DNS is and the DNS record and, and so on. So that makes it much easier. And you don't need a lot of tools or UI and things like that. So, so I think one, one super important thing was like this kiss, keep it simple, stupid. Try to make it as simple as possible things and not over complicate it. Uh, and uh, as I said, we standard uh, run monitoring, alerting, escalation, and so on. And those wrappers were standardized as well that, that I talked about before. Uh, now we talk about another company. It was a large company still making cars in Sweden. Cars in Sweden. Uh, so a huge company with like 30, 40,000 employees or something like that. Uh, in the IT organization, it was like two, three thousand employees or something like that. Uh, then a part of that IT organization, they would like to create an agile organization and they try to implement a startup culture to be able to compete with Tesla. Uh, I, I can say now it failed. Uh, I started to work there after Record Future because I thought it was, would be a fun, fun thing to, to do and see if I can change a, a large organization. I think it was, I talked with Chris before that, when I joined that, and he has done a lot of consulting, he says, and he said that you will fail. <laughs> and, and he was right, so, but, but I tried it anyway. And why it failed, I, I would say very much was about management. It was a really weak leadership. It was not a str strong buy-in to this one. And it was not a str strong buy-in to build like a platform or a standardize or anything like that. And also, so, so to start with, it was like a decision we should use multi-cloud platforms, for example. Uh, every team could make their own decisions. So there were like no, no, no buy-in from support. The infrastructure platform team that I belong to was like more seen as a support team to help them when they have trouble and, and things like that. Could you put up some Kubernetes cluster, please, because we need that. And no strong mandates to anyone, I would say. And, and from technology perspective, it was like we were using different technologies uh, in the team. As I said, no standardization. The team could choose the technologies they liked. Uh, no team for common code. Uh, we tried to do that, but it was not like important because it was better that they worked to fix the problem they already created. And uh, different repos. I don't think that that was not a major issue there. But like people started to use like Azure DevOps to, to do build pipelines and then some started to some did GitHub actions to do pipelines and everything. It was so spread out. Uh, so that was uh, quite a big failure. I stayed there for one and a half year and then I gave up. Uh, and some more gave up at that time as well. Uh, but now we talk at the company that it works for now at Phoenix. They, they started like eight, nine years ago or something like that. But then for like three years ago or something like that, they, they decided to re-architect the application because it was like a monolith. It was running in data center on hardware. It was like an installation per customer. Uh, and also it started to expand by, by buying new companies as well that needed to be integrated. So actually before I joined, they, they started to create this microservice architecture. Uh, and they start to rewrote this monolith into services. 
and and they have and they also went into a message based architecture and they moved to cloud and AWS. And we create the internal development platform, so we have like five minutes to create a new microservice and deploy it into production. Uh, we're the, almost there now. Uh, and this was based on the experience from, like my experience from Recorded Future and the failing on the, on the big car manufacturer. Uh, but it's also based on other developers' experience of, of different environments and so on. And, and this means that they could focus on like uh, features and they didn't focus on like Kubernetes and other shitty tools. I still don't understand how it can be like 10,000 people on KubeCon. Is it that many, many working with infrastructure? I, I imagine it's a lot of developers that think it's fun to, to, to play around with Kubernetes instead of doing features. So we went from like uh, why we went from like one feature deploy per week to like three four deploys per week, and the, like uh, also the Kubernetes clusters were is treated like uh, cats and not pets, so we're able to restore like the full full operation in an hour or something like that. Uh, we haven't tried it out fully yet. Uh, lucky. Uh, but also it's, it's, it's very much about management. Here it has also been very strong management. So for one example, we had this monolith and we were taking out part of part to, to those microservices, but it was like we still did new features in this monolith. But then my manager of the C2, he said, uh, okay, now we'll not do anything for four months. We will only focus on getting out of this monolith and we'll not add any features. And he got the CEO to accept that maybe we'll lose some customer even because it will be tricky to do this and we will not, uh, not deliver maybe what all the customers would like to see. So, but we did that. So in four months we didn't do anything with exception for getting out from this monolith into the microservice and we were successful on that one. But that is like strong management and you need that type of strong management if you should be successful. I think I was actually inspired by this. I think this was 2012 or something like that. Uh, I think I've seen it before maybe, but uh, on Etsy, they have like one rule that a new engineer on the first day should deploy to production. And how many can do that? Here, can you raise your hand? You that, that can, are able to do that in your... Oh. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> this was 2012. So we have this. If you would like to create a new microservice at, at uh, our company, we have uh, implemented this. It's a Jenkins user interface, so it's maybe not, not, not that nice. But you, I would like to have a new microservice. I just put the name here, and then I need to keep that name all over the place. I select which environment. CDEV is like our test environment. We skip the staging, and now we're doing testing production instead, because it was so hard to maintain the staging environment. Uh, and then also you would tell if the service should be private or public, uh, and also if you would like to have a database uh, set up for it or not. Uh, and, and what you get if you set up, a, if you select yes on that one, you will get like a database in Postgres because we are standardized on Postgres. And then all the configuration of tables and things like that, that is done within the application. So we try to split who is responsible for which part of the configuration, so the infrastructure part is only uh, it's only like manage users and manage the database, but not like the tables or, or things like that within the database. So, and, and this is a little bit what you get. And if you look at in the top right corner there, you see a JSON file, and this is, JSON file is created from the user interface before, and that drives all the infrastructure. It says more or less that was what's in the what in that one. Here you can add like policies if you need some extra AWS policy or something like that. But this is more or less everything you need. Then you have a small JSON for setting up how many replicas or something like that, if there is specified for that for Kubernetes. But, but that, that, that is more or less. More or less. Uh, so, and and uh, there are lots of stuff created. We create like uh, container repositories, we create the, like the database, IAM rules, we create uh, for, for metrics and for logging, uh, and so on. And, and we try to drive everything from like simple 
simple user interfaces. So, uh, with the exception for creating the, the microservice, the, the developer shouldn't need to know anything about Jenkins, or they should not need to be into Jenkins. We are actually using Jenkins, and most of the developers hate Jenkins, and, and so I try to hide it from them, or we try to hide it from them, and quite successful. So, like in GitHub, we have that as a main use interface. So there they can start with pull requests that we initiate builds and then we get the build result there. We have some infrastructure co config in the repo as well. Uh, we have common roads for the repos that we set up for, for pull requests and things like that. And also we're doing the deploys via release management in, in GitHub that take off a Jenkins job that actually, no, yeah, uh, and, and uh, that takes off the deploy. And then like we, we have those standardized dashboard here as well. So you just select your service and then you get a lot of graphs here and nice things. Uh, and then, then we use Argo Seed as a user interface into Kubernetes, but the developer, the only thing they look at, I would say, is the pods and, and maybe for how long they run and maybe for the log when, when, when it doesn't start properly. But they don't care that much to the left actually. Uh, we was also out the generate documentation for the microservice. So, like this is a confluence page with all the links and all the service names and in different environments and so on, and links to like logging and things like that. So, if you have a microservice, you go to confluence and then you can get the link to, to different user interfaces there. And also, we put the Swagger documentation in confluence as, as well to make it searchable. So. Those are tools used used in the IDP at uh, at Phoenix. So we use Pulumi for a lot of config management. Uh, we use JSONnet for configuration of of, uh, of in Kubernetes or deployments and so on. Uh, JSONnet together with Tanka, uh, actually, uh, and then we drive everything from Argo CD when it comes to deploys in Kubernetes, uh, and we use GitHub as you saw, Confluence, and then we're using some Ruby and, and a little bit of Chef as well for some instances. And also in Pulumi we selected to use TypeScript because most of the user, it's e quite easy for them to read TypeScript. And also a nice thing with TypeScript was that I, we had like front-end developer, and when I start to use that one, I can go to front-end developer and get help with the code and things like that. So that was really nice with, uh, with starting to work with TypeScript. So the develop developers, the, the interface they are using is like GitHub, Argo Seed, and Confluence. Uh, so we don't have like an IDP portal or something like that. We just have those tools. Um, and what the developer says, uh, so, so like one of the players said, oh, it's so easy, it makes my life much easier because I can focus on, on the feature and focus on the code and don't need to struggle with infrastructure and things like that. Uh, and another one was talking about this focus on the code. And also, like we bought a company like six months ago or something like that that was running like in a, in a data center more or less. And now the team that gets responsible for that one is, uh, is chasing me to move that into into our process and actually like we are running we we're, we're using like uh, .net sharp or c sharp but we're running it in kubernetes and on linux and everything and then we're using like open source things but this product was we need to run it in, in on a windows machine because it's some old windows stuff as well but we can use this the same process for that one so we're using the internal development platform for that it's just that we run it on windows a Windows machine and Kubernetes cluster, but we adopt the same processes. And then also we have done it for the front-end developers now, so we have added the same process for their code as well. And then we have another company that we bought a while ago, and then we implemented the same processes for them as well. So we try to implement the same processes, but if we, it doesn't matter if it's different languages or even if we deploy like to, to S3 for front-end or to Kubernetes, but still try to use the same process as, as much as possible. And also it makes it much easier when you discuss internally at the company, because everyone knows what you're talking about more or less. So it's not like, okay, we're using uh, MongoDB and we're using Postgres and uh, things like that, or we're deploying to Azure and we're deploying to AWS. It's, you get a common language and it's easy to work and share knowledge as well. 
So, and, and to get this to work, I say it's, it's super important to work close with the developers. Uh, and the team managed IDP has to know that they are like suppliers to the developers. So they have to be, have a really good dialogue and doing this together and not like doing it separately uh, and have a good understanding and empathy is really important. So, yeah. So, this is a nice Dilbert, I think, and it's valid for a lot of stuff. So, Kubernetes, 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 Kubernetes. Uh, yeah, it doesn't solve anything, or that technology doesn't solve anything. So, so what I learned is like, take the technology that you know about, if you know about it by yourself or within your team, take that type of technology, even if it's not the hottest technology or, or the most perfect. And then if you, if you would like to introduce new technologies, do some research around the technologies, find out what other has done, and don't be the first one on that technology if you don't want to create a lot of job for yourself. So, yeah, that's why an IDP can act as a turbo for business growth. So that's my presentation. Uh, I will be around there today if you have any questions or would like to discuss. Or are there any questions now? Yes? Uh, you went uh, from a uh, small startup to, to quite a bigger uh, company when, when you existed. Uh, when did you start uh, building the IDP in, in the small company? Uh, I would say for, from the almost, uh, not from the beginning, but also we did have the tool set there, but quite the early on, yes. So, and it was the same now with this company. They have been around for eight years, but they were restructuring the infrastructure and everything, so then we took the chance to build it from scratch there as well. So I think it's easy to start, when you start with something, it's, it's easy to do it. Absolutely. Yes? So a lot of the content is focused on the developer's uh, experience. What about the interactions with uh, your operations teams, you know, networking, security? How does, how does that kind of, it seems like it's obfuscated on purpose, obviously, but there still has to, that, that transactions, engagements need to happen. Yeah. Uh, how, how, can you describe a little bit about it? Yeah, so the question was how about, uh, it was a lot, a lot about discussion about interacting with developer, but how do you interact with net network security team as well? I think on, the, on those smaller companies, it was like the same team. So there is well, yeah. no major issue. But on the large company, it was like we tried to be like the senior point that discussed with the security network team and things like that. And that, I think, was quite successful because no one dared to talk with those teams and didn't, the developer didn't know what they were talking about and things like that. So, so focus on getting that as a focal point for, for this team was quite important, I would say, if we had had like, the developers with us as well. So you had a diverse uh, group of people centralizing the interaction. Yeah, yeah, it was like c centralized and then... And then you need, that means human capital, right? Yeah. Perfect, thank you. Question? Uh, <coughs> you uh, said that uh, your two points of opinion in the approach in terms of uh, this is one of the things that didn't work and the second uh, time around when the, each team wanted to do uh, things slightly different in terms of tool set and, and the way that they work. I found that uh, uh, opinionated approach may be problematic in large organizations because different teams have different ways of doing things. So how did you manage to uh, come up with this standardization in a, in a pragmatic manner? If you can uh, give us your take on that. Yeah, how, how you change like when you have a opinionated view on things and how you get into a large organization to change that. I think that was, was failed on that, on that, in that example. And I think it failed because we, we didn't have support like from, from the management and things like that to do what they said that they would like to do, but they didn't support it to happen. So I think that was really hard. Then, then you can try to, what we tried to do it was to do it like services that were excellent, that was much better than the thing they were doing. A little bit like, I understand, like Google has that approach that you would like to have them to operate the operations team, 
for you, but we never ended up there, I would say. But I think you have to do something that excellent that you that the developer strives for actually would like to have. So But it's the same like the way that for different things excellent or fit is different. So how did you manage to do one to pick all? Yeah, uh, at the large corporation we need, didn't manage that uh, actually, uh, but the, the idea was to do some excellent service that what the, the team would like to to do use uh, and help them up. But in the other in the other organization we were quite successful. At the, at the record future it was like 100 developers something like that, but they they saw the benefit of it uh, to do that. So, so it's, it's I think it's showing the benefit, and now and then you get a good strike strong buy-in into it. But it's hard to change an existing organization. And, and Chris to, to, told me that before. He has failed a couple of times as well. OK. Thank you. Short break now. Uh, after the break, we have two talks, which basically we have one here about Kubernetes myths and the other one is about the original B building. So we're back in the B building, we're not going to yeah.
Hey. Oh, hey. All right. Can you hear me? Is he working? All good? All right. Perfect. OK. So thank you, everyone, for coming to uh, this talk. I hope you'll find it interesting. Before I kick off the session, I wanted to ask you something. So this is meant to be an interactive session. So there are five questions in five slides throughout the talk. I hope that you'll be able to, some very easy questions for you in the crowd. Uh, please shout the answer uh, just to help me out because if you don't, it's gonna be really awkward. So please just shout out the answer, okay? Uh, the other thing, this will be an intermediate advanced level talk, not in uh, depth, but definitely in breadth. We're going to cover a lot of different topics, a lot of different ground. If there's any questions or anything, you can reach out at the end of the session. Um, is the mic good? The audio, sound, quality, all good? Perfect, thank you. So, who am I? My name is Federico. I work at Continuo in London in the UK. Continuo is a global DevOps and cloud uh, transformation company. We help large regulated enterprises moving uh, from on-premises to cloud, building architectures in cloud, and helping them change in the way in which they deliver uh, digital products. This is my background, this technology architecture, uh, engineering management as well. So um, we're talking about Kubernetes today. We have to talk about Kubernetes today, because when I talk to a lot of our customers, a lot of our clients in the UK, in Europe, there is a common friend, there's a theme there. Everybody says uh, we're adopting Kubernetes because it gives us something. And we're adopting Kubernetes in a variety of ways. Sometimes on premises, sometimes in cloud. <coughs> Kubernetes has a very relatively recent history. Uh, containers have been around for a while, but Cube is from 2015 pretty much 2014 as well. And the managed service providers the, um, that are offering Kubernetes services, AWS, Azure, GCP, IBM, all of them, have started offering uh, Kubernetes as a managed service in 2016, 2017. So we have this technology that has been there for six years now, has been there for a while. And the, um, we have a more mature ecosystem as well. The number one reason, though, for which uh, 
companies are adopting Kubernetes, when I speak with them, are like, we're using Kube because it gives us a number of things. Number one thing, because it's portable, because it makes our application portable across different cloud providers. We're using Kube because it makes things standardized for us. And this is there in literature, it is there in blog posts as well, everybody talks about this. So today, we're going to see whether it's true or not. We're going to follow the journey of a demo application. Who are we in this crowd? We are a migration team. We have been engaged by a B2C startup company offering a mobile application to their customers. We're running a backend on AWS and they told us you have to move us to GCP. In fact, you have to move us from EKS, um, the managed Kubernetes service on AWS, into GKE. Okay? This is the job. The job we're going to do today is to migrate uh, this application from one uh, to the other side. And there are some good news. There are some good news. So, number one, the landing zone on GCP has already been built. The landing zone is there. We, our presence in GCP has been built. We have GKE. So uh, the managed Kubernetes on, on GCP, up and running, it is running. We can stop the world, which is a great thing, so we don't need to do any clever trafty, uh, traffic shifting policies. We don't have to do anything special about this application. Uh, the application runs on a modern tech stack, and we are going to turn off AWS, virtually turn it off, and we're going to turn it on on GKE. We're going to tell our users, move, new endpoint, go to GKE, have fun there. What I wanted to take away is that this is an easy migration. This is a very easy migration that we're going to do, easy technical migration. We have a number of stakeholders, though. Don't get fooled. As in any migration, some of our stakeholders are our users that clearly want to use the app and continue using the app in GKE. But we also have backend developers that need to be able to continue their deployments both in AWS and GCP. We have a security team that needs to make sure that if we were secure on AWS, we need to be secure on GCP as well. Uh, and we have an SRE DevOps infra team, us, pretty much, that need to be able to continue deploying things from one place to the other. So what is the AWS architecture? Now, I assume familiarity with AWS in the crowd here. Uh, super easy, as I said, super simple. We have a mobile application. The mobile application calls one microservice deployed inside a Kubernetes cluster. is a HTTP REST microservice, super simple. Microservice gets an image from our hypothetical mobile application, uploads the image on S3. The second microservice is notified by an SNS queue that an, Im an image has been posted, uh, has been uh, uploaded there on S3. There is some processing of the image, and then a third microservice uh, reads some secrets in Vault and sends a message, uh, an email to notification to our users. So simple, simple architecture, three microservices in Golang, three containers, super easy two managed services, S3 on one side, SNS, and also, I forget, an RDS database that we're using to store our metadata. Pretty straightforward, nothing magical here. A few monitoring tools as well, before I forget those as well. So we have Prometheus and Grafana that are monitoring tools there. How does it look like in GCP? Very similar. In GCP, we're running on GKE, Google Kubernetes Engine. We're running uh, Cloud SQL. We don't have SNS, so we have to use PubSub on GCP. And then we have Cloud Storage. The external tool we're using there to send uh, email notifications to our users, that SaaS provider is still there. So super simple migration. Okay. What is, we have a migration journey we have to follow because we have been using Kubernetes for a while and we have been told something. We have been told this is portable. So this, my premise here is that I want this to be a turnkey migration. What I want to happen is that uh, I'm going to change my CI CD pipelines, GitHub actions, Jenkins, whatever it is, 
and I'm going to migrate everything to Kubernetes engine. Super simple, we've been told this, okay. So first question, first question here, please shout the answer. What happens if I go on my CI CD pipelines, I just change the CI CD pipeline and I say don't deploy on EKS, on AWS, go and deploy on GKE, Google Kubernetes Engine. Will it work? Will it not work? No, why? The image, exactly. So super point number one, straightforward, the image doesn't work there because the image is on ECR. Okay, so you have three options. Option number one, option number one, I can keep the <coughs> container registry in ECR and pull from GKE images, from GKE, from the nodes in Kubernetes Engine. Can I do that? Yes, I technically can. There is a GitHub project online that helps you doing this, but that means that I have to use managed nodes on GKE, so I cannot rely on autopilot and having GKE managing the nodes for me. I don't want to do that. Option two, I can move to Google Container Registry, not a problem. Option three, I can embed a container registry within Kubernetes, and I can use the CNCF tool. Yes, I can do that. I have three options. Option three means I have to manage things. That is a bit painful. So straightforward, I'm going to change the container registry. I'm going to uh, pull from, uh, I have to do it with CNCF tool. So the first thing that we notice here is the fact that if we want to stay in compliance, then I have to add something to my deployment, which can make it way more complex because now I have to sign the container images that I'm using on the cluster. We're lucky, our security team is like, no problem, no problem. We don't want you to do this, it's too complex, we're good. Okay, perfect, so our migration journey, step one, change container registry. So I go back to my CI CD pipeline, will it work now? Will it work now? Can I deploy my application? Will my application work? No, why not? Database, exactly, so I have to change database host. What do I do? I move from cloud, from RDS on S3 to from uh, RDS on AWS to Cloud SQL. Good news here: I'm running Postgres on RDS. They are very much similar. The two services are absolutely similar. This wasn't through in 2019. Cloud SQL did not offer the same set of services or features that AWS offers. So they're very similar. Doesn't change security posture, very easy. In an ideal world, I wouldn't want to do this though. In an ideal world, I don't want to rely on an external service. So what, do I, what, I, what could I do? I could deploy Postgres within the cluster using something like a Postgres operator uh, and have Postgres inside my cluster, such as when I deploy then on GK, I have Postgres already in the cluster. If I do this, if I deploy GK inside the cluster, rather than using database as a service, I can totally do it. I can do it at scale as well, as Zalando shows in the uh, Postgres operator on uh, Kubernetes uh, with something like called Zalando Patroni, which is manage HA for Postgres in Cube. I can do it, but I have to maintain it. I have to do maintenance of it. And this is the same thing across the stack. This maintenance, this, this is the crux of the issue, the core of the presentation, which is uh, what should we do when we design the services? There's a complex trade-off here. On one hand, if I want to be more portable, I have to import things inside the cluster. If I do it, I have to pay a price. I have to pay maintenance price for all of this. Okay, there's a significant cost attached to it. If I instead hand over things to cloud provider managed services, I get some benefits. My service cost goes down because I don't have to maintain that. And my total cost of ownership changes. Cloud providers would manage it for us. This is the trend across the presentation. I can imp Kubernetes itself is not feature complete. I need to use managed services to complete the deployment of an application, and so I have to rely on this. Uh, the trick here is that I don't want you to get fooled. The decision of importing a service in the cluster or 
Relying on a managed service is a business issue, is not a technical decision. I don't choose Postgres operator or I choose RDS based on their technical features. No. I choose based on how much it is going to cost the company to operate one or the other. This is a business decision. This is a decision that IT, if you have IT separate from the business, doesn't make. You have to make it with the business because there's a clear implication in cost and velocity. It's a trade-off you have to make there. Okay, so far easy, so far so good. We change a container registry. We change database engine. So now we're good. Our applications are up and running. They're up. All three applications are up and running. So we go to our users and we say, hey user, why don't you try calling an API endpoint? Why don't you try to upload an image? The user tries and gets, ouch, 500. Why the user gets a 500 from the architecture there? Not there yet, not a pub sub yet, but another managed service right on top. Exactly, so our magical storage service. So we were relying on S3, we're not relying on S3 anymore. What can we do? Well, number one, I can keep the object storage in S3, but I need to give authentication credentials to my application in GCP to go to S3. I can do that, but not super easy. I can move my object storage to GCS, to Google Container Storage. If I, I can do that, and GCS is very clever, because GCS offers something called S3 compatibility mode for GCS. So Google Container Storage can offer an S3, a S3 compatible API layer for which you can call GCS as if it was S3. That is an option. Or option three, if I want extreme portability and solving this, I can use some of the more advanced, uh, some of the CNCF tools that can help me. So I have Rook, an operator that allows to uh, spin up a Ceph cluster, but I still have to maintain it. Or I think more interesting, sir, this is a CNCF project called CubeFS or Cube File System. This is a distributed file system designed to natively support large-scale container platforms. With KubeFS in my cluster, I can have an S3-like service inside the cluster. So this is possible, but KubeFS is not a game. So KubeFS is made of multiple systems, metadata subsystem, data subsystem, resource manager. So I can have KubeFS inside the cluster but I have to maintain it and I have to pay a price. There's a four option. It is called Container Storage Interface. This is a, uh, or CSI, is a standard for exposing blocks and storage systems within Kubernetes. This is part of, G of Kubernetes GA. So for all of you, when you're mounting volume within Kubernetes, you're mounting a uh, persistent volume on AWS, you're mounting an EBS volume, on Kubernetes, you are already making use uh, of uh, the container storage interface there. The feature has been GA for a while, so what we do, we can attach a volume to our pods, so this is a uh, EBS volume. When we're, calling our HT, when we're calling S3, though we're not doing this from our pods, our microservices connected to S3 with an HTTP call. So if I use container storage interface, Kubernetes tells me, listen, uh, you can mount your storage as if it was a directory inside the application. At that point, if I do this, if I mount S3 as, in a, as a directory inside the application with a fuse file system, a fuse mount, I can then swap S3 for Google Container Storage the application will still see a directory, continue seeing a directory, and that will make it portable because it's just a, it's just a folder. This is an option uh, that I've explored a bit, but I have to say I don't think it works, or it, I don't think it works as we want it to work. This is described as well in those drivers. Uh, the game is always the same when you're mounting when you're mounting a file system 
that is not POSIX compliant uh, and you have to make it POSIX compliant, then trade-offs need to be made. For example, the standard, um, the standard Google Kubernetes uh, uh, bucket storage storage on, few, on CSIs is not, uh, by definition, by description as well on GitHub, is not uh, compatible with uh, uh, symlink, hard links, doesn't support renames, uh, uh, doesn't support F-sync, the system call either, so it flashes on close. There's a number of trade-offs you're making there. Kubernetes will tell you. Kubernetes storage interfaces can help you with portability. I don't think that they are um, ready yet there. Maybe they will in the future. There's a number of um, CNCF projects as well that try to do this. So, assuming that the standard way of doing it is actually not there yet, we have to just make our things. So what do we do? We move to GCS. We move to GCS, Google Container Storage, it's very simple. Google Container Storage, uh, I have to do a change though. What is the change that I have to do? I have to change SDK. If, I, if my application in Golang doesn't talk to S3 anymore, but talks to Google Container Storage, I have to change the SDK, I have to change the libraries. In cha changing the SDK, changing the library you know, in an application, is a less trivial activity. Uh, most applications will have a layered approach, so you're changing the storage layer of the application. We can do this. But what if we have more than one microservice? What if we have three microservices? What if we have 50 microservices there? That's a problem, because they have to change 50 libraries. So how do I do this? What we could do is that we could create uh, an anti-corruption layer. This is a standard um, pattern in distributed systems, a facade or an adapter that helps us, a microservice that helps us separating different subsystems that talk on different semantics, that use different semantics when they speak. The application domain and the storage domain are using different semantics. If I implement something in between, I can then have multiple microservices talking to that something in between before reaching the other storage domain and then I can change it behind the scenes. So what I could do when I create my applications or when I'm changing my applications, I could use this anti-corruption layer. This is the actual term, anti-corruption layer. This layer can really help migrating my applications. Okay, so. We change container registry, we change database system, we change storage system. Finally, will it work now? Will it work or it still doesn't work? Exactly, it doesn't work. PubSub. PubSub is the problem because I was using SNS and really just swapping the QM point doesn't work. Even if, in our case, I wonder why doesn't it work? Because we make a cursory usage of a queuing system. Our microservices are sending a message from one place to the other. This is 2023. We have a, we've had this for a number of years, a queuing system. So we'll see what we can do. As we said, three options in this case as well. I could use a CNCF project inside the cluster to manage my queuing, my uh, queue inside the cluster, Kafka, NATS, I could keep messaging in AWS or I could move to GCP. Here I want to bring your attention to one thing. The two core reasons why we want to keep messaging in AWS, um, the, the way we want to move messaging to GCP and not keep it in AWS is because one, I have an application on GKE. I have queuing system on AWS, I have data egress cost across cloud providers. They will charge me for moving messages one place to the other. That's one cost, that is true. Second reason is latency. If I have application on GKE and SNS on AWS, the normal wisdom will tell you, well, there's a latency cost because you're crossing cloud provider boundaries. Turns out, turns out, here is a secret, uh, or a secret, it's available online as well. If you, when you're transiting from, when you're moving data or packets from AWS to GCP from one cloud provider to the other, you're not crossing the internet. 
you're thinking you are, because, you, because this is what the expectation is for most of us in networking, but it's not the case because cloud providers have very strong link, and this is proven by a report um, from a company called Thousand Eyes, and the link to the report is there. Traffic flow in between major cloud providers uh, is handed off directly inside the, cloud, inside the cloud providers, and you don't have to cross the internet when you do it. So there's no latency cost, or there's a negligible latency cost in using service across cloud providers, which is an interesting discovery that I've made when studying this. Cost, it is a true problem though. In our case, what we want to do is to change messaging queue system. We want to move to Google PubSub. Now, this is another problem. I have to change the SDK of the application once again. This is a bigger problem though, because in my experience, and I'm sure that all of you that have built microservices, that have built applications, will tell me, the if I, when I changed storage before, when I changed S3 before, that was not a big problem, because S3 was just a foundation and it's just usually outside. Now I have to change SNS. A queuing messaging percolates through different layers of the application. The application logic is way more tied with a queuing system, with a messaging system, because there are too many concerns. Changing this SDK is a problem. What could we do? We rely on a more interesting new CNC, well, relatively new CNCF project. It is called Dapper, the APR. Dapper is a portable event runtime that makes easy for developers to build resilient, stateless applications on the cloud. It's a service that was is a project that was started in 2019 and is backed by Microsoft. Dapper is really clever and can really help. How does it help? So, before Dapper, our application would connect over HTTP to SNS, PubSub, and just send a message to PubSub. With Dapper, you're running a sidecar container, sidecar container pattern within the pod, and then the application calls on an HTTP endpoint Dapper, and Dapper goes then to PubSub or goes to SNS. So you're talking to Dapper, you're not talking to the app anymore exactly how it works, visualized here. We have S mi microservice number one, talking to SNS, talking to uh, microservice number two, listening to SNS. With Dapper, both the applications are now talking to their sidecar containers Dapper, and Dapper talks to SNS, or I change Dapper and I tell Dapper, don't talk to SNS, talk to PubSub, and then when I migrate, I don't need to change the application code anymore. I just need to change the configuration of Dapper, making it, making it more concrete. The application is now running, calling HTTP endpoint and saying, send a message there. The HTTP endpoint is provided by Dapper on a sidecar container, and Dapper itself uses YAML configuration and Dapper, I tell Dapper, go to AWS. So now, to change and move the application across, I don't touch the source code, I touch the configuration of Dapper, and I tell Dapper, hey, by the way, go to PubSub. This is really good because I shift a building block from the application to the configuration. It's a positive, positive thing. It simplifies and increases much more my portability. Most developers here will tell me, I don't really want to make an HTTP call to each one, a custom HTTP call. What I want to do is to use an SDK. Dapper itself provides an SDK with methods. The SDK, I, I have a different slide here to highlight the fact that the SDK is Dapper SDK. It's not a cloud-dependent SDK. So Dapper, what does Dapper do? Dapper, is very interesting, provides a set of building blocks for swappable things. Because what I was telling you before, we've had queuing systems for a million years now. We're making a cursor usage of a queuing system here. We're not doing anything very clever. There's no, there's no DLQ management. There's no like fan out. There's nothing special. This is one microservice talking to the other. A super simple config. So Dapper steps in and says, happy times, 
I can give you that capability. I can give you that building block. Dapper itself supports a variety of building blocks from um, publish and subscribe to state management to service to service configuration powered by MTLS, very similar to Istio and other service meshes, to a number of other concerns like secrets as such. In other words, Dapper really can help on portability of an application, but it's not perfect yet. Okay, it's not perfect because number one, the obvious then, if I introduce a proxy between you and, some, uh, and, the, and uh, the cloud, what do I do? I introduce another layer, another layer that can cause problems. Dapper has a number of design principles in place that try to prevent um, issues, um, but they're still there. Dapper wants to be as transparent as possible. This is not always the case. And Dapper says developers should not worry about this, but it's not perfect. And the other issue is that if you offload a set of concerns onto configuration, you lose flexibility. For example, if your application wants to do something clever, so it wants to subscribe to a queue or a different queue during the life cycle of the application, you want to send a message to a different queue, you cannot do that with Dapper because now the configuration of the queue is in the config that is static, so you lose flexibility there. But it's a valid, it's a valuable uh, feature nonetheless. Now, uh, there's another service, by the way, uh, similar to Dapper called Layotto out there. It's another CNCF project, but Dapper, I think, is way more mature. Let's now go into Dapper and think about another concern about all of this game. I put a proxy in front of a building block. Second issue or second point of uh, discussion is a secrets management. So we said in our app, we were using Vault, we want to move to uh, Google Container, Google Secrets Manager. Um, library change, once again, not a, major, not a major deal because usually Secrets Manager is not messaging. So the application reads a secret at the beginning of the, when the application spins up and then doesn't do anything else. Typically, what we, would, what we would do with Dapper, once again, Dapper introduces as a proxy layer, talks to Vault for us, and then when I swap Secrets Manager, I don't have to change the application. I just tell Dapper, go to Secrets Manager. There is a tricky thing, though in doing this, which is, I think, is the most significant limitation with Dapper and similar services, which is uh, that Secret Manager and Vault are not exactly the same service, okay? They don't offer exactly the same feature set. In particular, Vault uh, offers an interesting feature. Vault allows you to store secrets with multiple key value pairs per secret. So you have a secret that is effectively a JSON with multiple um, key value pairs. Google Secret Manager doesn't do this. Google Secret Manager is one key, one value, that's it. What does Dapper do at that point? Because the feature set is not compatible. So what do you do? Well, Dapper ends up going to the lowest common denominator because if you have a set, and this is a common problem across the, across the service, so Dapper unfortunately has to be compatible with a number of building blocks. If uh, Google PubSub offers more features than SNS, Dapper cannot offer you those features because it doesn't know where you are. So to be fair to Dapper, they implemented multiple uh, key values for secret in November 2022, so that specific problem is not a problem anymore, but there are a similar set of concerns. So Dapper by nature ends up taking you to the lowest common denominator problem. Okay, let's continue our migration journey. We've looked at a number of things. It's time for us to see how things are going. Okay, so number one, our microservices are up. Our systems are up. Now we can read messages, we can send messages. We can read uh, from secrets. We can do a number of things. So why is our infrastructure SRE team shouting? Why are they screaming at us? Ideas? Time to get 
There's a problem with monitoring, yes, we'll look at that in a moment. Other ideas? Mm. Yes, very close, uh, access to the platform, somebody said, very close. Now, little hint here, we have Terraform in a garbage can. <laughs> that says something. So, we are a migration team, we are Kubernetes experts, we're YAML folks. We don't really know Kubernetes, uh, so we don't really know Terraform. We don't really know anything infrastructure management. We, don't, we haven't really used anything, we, we did some click ops, we went to the management console and we deployed Cloud SQL manually. That's a disaster, our infra team says, you're a bunch of fools, you don't know what you're doing. But we want to stay within Kubernetes, so what can we do? We could be using a new service called Crossplane. Now, Crossplane is a CNCF service, once again, that defines itself as a service, and I read here, is a cloud native control plane framework that helps you building control planes without needing to write code. Now, what does it mean? I'm not sure. But it actually is very easy. So, Crossplane helps you unify the deployment of a cube application and external cloud resources. It means if you have to deploy a cloud SQL, if you have to deploy a Postgres database outside of your cluster, RDS database or a cloud SQL database, you could be declaring in YAML to your Kubernetes cluster, I need the database, give me a cloud SQL database. So this helps you keeping everything together because now in your configuration of the application, in your deployment YAMLs of the application, you also have infrastructure code. How does it work? Very simple notion of a managed resource. Managed resource in Crossplane, we are seeing here a super simple bucket. I can tell, I can tell, um, I can create this YAML, deploy the YAML, a cube control apply the YAML on the Kubernetes cluster. Crossplane deployed inside the cluster, reads the custom resource and says, fine, I'm gonna give you a bucket. Not only I'm gonna give you a bucket, I'm gonna keep you state consistency. So, if, so that if I change the bucket name in the YAML definition, Crossplane will go and change the name of the bucket if possible on the cloud provider. So this is very powerful and helps us uh, deploying and keeping configuration together, both the configuration of the app as well as the configuration of uh, um, the resources external to the app. But that doesn't really change much with Terraform, so we need to look at something else. We need to look at a notion of composite resources in Crossplane. So now, composite resources is an extra layer of, of abstraction. I don't declare I want a Cloud SQL database. What I do, I declare I want a Postgres interf instance. I call it X Postgres SQL instance or whatever I want. And I just say I need a Postgres instance. Then with the notion of this composite resources, um, I can implement what I want behind the scenes. So I can implement the X Postgres instance as a Cloud SQL, as an RDS database. How does it work? Super simple. Our development teams goes there and creates a claim for a Postgres instance. The infrastructure teams configures Crossplane and tells Crossplane, you're in a Kubernetes cluster in GKE. When they require a database instance, deploy that as a Cloud SQL database and give them the variables back. So the application team doesn't need to know about any cloud provider. The application team can say, give me a, post, give me a Postgres database, happy times. And then the uh, infrastructure team says, okay, good stuff. I just need to, I can deploy that as a, um, I can deploy that as a bucket. I can deploy that as a, um, as a uh, S3 bucket or a Google Cloud Storage bucket. The good thing about Crossplane is that Crossplane uh, has a number of features as well, so namespace security, 
There are a few nuances there as well. Uh, we kind of like overlooked that in this super simple migration journey. Uh, but it's a very powerful thing. And once again, enables portability because an application team just creates one in one, just creates a demand for a database. OK. We're continuing our migration journey. We looked at infra deployment. We looked at, um, we swapped messaging systems. We swapped secrets manager tools, management tool. Now, will it work now? Will it work? All our applications are up and running. Will it work? Yes, this time, <laughs> this time it does work. Okay. It works because when we did monitoring, we were much more clever than other things. This is 2022, 2023. Okay, this is not 2010, 2015. Monitoring in a cloud provider can be done in a variety of ways. When we configure monitoring on our AWS cluster, we selected the standard Prometheus and Grafana. AWS manages the services for us. But migrating now is much easier. I can export my Grafana dashboards, import them in Grafana on, G on GCP, manage Grafana on GCP. And that is trivial. I can change some labels maybe, but it's very trivial. The dashboards are still up. It won't be the same thing. It would not have been the same thing exporting CloudWatch dashboards and importing them on Google Cloud Monitor. You see, depending on the service that we deploy on the cloud, on cloud providers, we can be more or less flexible about this. So monitoring was less of a concern, was easy enough. Overall, overall, we've seen that our migration journey was helped by a number of CNCF tools. We have to be clever about this, but we can see here that with Dapper, with um, Secret Manager as well, with a number of these services, with the right monitoring tools, our portability was much more increased with Crossplane as well. So what are the takeaways for this, uh, for this session, for this talk? So as I said at the beginning, I often see the adoption of Kubernetes platforms in companies as a way to avoid vendor lock-in, to increase the freedom of choice of CSPs. They do this because they assume that in the context of Kubernetes, a uh, pod deployment definition is bound to run on any clusters. We've realized that is not true because we, Kubernetes is not enough. We have to go to external services. We realize that the devil's in the details. We never just run one container. We run multiple containers. And the interaction between those containers are the real problems. In other words, Kubernetes as a platform is not feature complete. We have to go to cloud providers or pay a significant cost. There's a significant cost to make it portable. We can stem that cost by using some CNCF tools. But if we really want to get portable, then we have to pay significant maintenance cost. All of this, all of this fragmentation of the ecosystem, all of this Kubernetes wide ecosystem doesn't really help because we're not there yet. We need to be clever with all of this, all this dependency on cloud providers. So, Cloud portability is hard work, and we've seen it. We've seen that an easy technical migration of super simple three microservices to cloud dependencies explodes in complexity. Cloud portability is hard work. The ecosystem plays a major role. The trend to make things more portable through with Dapper, but not only, through with even the S3-like managed services, is to move from the code, in, to move cloud infra components from, the, from code into configuration, from the SDK of the code into a piece of configuration that I can swap behind the scenes. And I hope you remember that. Open source can help, CNCF projects can help, but True portability comes at a significant cost. So, thank you.
I think we have a few minutes for some questions. If there's any questions from the crowd. I'm sorry, I can hear you. Yeah. Yeah, so the question is if, if it's uh, difficult to have a particular strategy or there are situations where you advise one strategy or the other. <laughs> and so, um, yeah, definitely I would advise choosing uh, to be more portable at the beginning of a project if you know that you're likely to migrate across cloud providers, but telling, telling your company that comes a significant cost with it, for sure. The other situation you have, which is very common across large enterprises, is that you're heavily regulated. So if you know that the regulator will tell you, you cannot use AWS for this project, and we've seen that happening in a number of European countries, then, in, especially in the banking sector, that in that case, if you have strong regulations that will force one way or the other, then definitely think about portability first. Okay, any other questions? Go ahead. Did you consider moving your container registry to your infrastructure, so for example, using GitHub as a container registry and not using something upstream to avoid that problem? Yeah, so the question is if I consider uh, using something like GitHub uh, as a container registry or an external container registry. You can definitely do that. That is definitely an option. But in this sense, uh, you lose something. What you lose is that in most cloud providers, pulling and pushing images from the container registry deployed within the cloud provider uh, is, yes, more simple, but also, and the subtlety, is that if you have organizational policies that tell you you have to follow a certain set of rules, by staying within the cloud provider, I can adopt those organizational policies. The example is GCP, binary authorization that we saw that says if you have to implement supply chain constraints, if you want to be salsa, I'm not sure if you know about salsa framework for supply chain, you want to be compatible with that. Then you, use to, you have to use binary authorization. If I leave Google Container Registry and I use GitHub, I'm more portable, yes, but I lose the stack control on, um, on supply chain security, in that sense. Okay, yeah. <coughs> Oh, uh, yep, yeah, yeah, good point. So the question is, can this migration be done without a service outage? The answer is that in our, we simplify the migration. We wanted to make it simple by definition. So I said, whatever, we don't need to worry about uptime. We would have a maintenance window. It is way more interesting, I think it'd be also another, the evolution of this talk in the future is what if we're actually multi-cloud? What if we actually are running an application across different cloud providers, we want to move workloads from one to the other without downtime? How do I manage the network flows? That is definitely more of a tricky, tricky thing. In our case, we didn't worry about it, but could be an interesting follow-up to this session. Any more questions? Any more for any more? All good. Perfect. Talk. Uh, folks, thank you very much for coming. If you have any other questions, reach out. I'm available. <laughs>
Ignite. So we, once the raffle is done, can switch to the Ignite directly. First name is? Dimitri Sonis. Dimitri Sonis. Nope, next. <coughs> Dimitris. Frederick the Backer. Okay. Go and choose your prize. <laughs> Huh? He's the first one, no? You had multiple. Uh, okay, print. Give it to him. <laughs> yes. Uh, do your colleagues have them? Yes. Okay. Philippe Walters. Ah, Philippe Walters. Okay. Okay. Ivan Sala. And there's one more? Two more. So pick them already, then we can move on. Hey, ah. Meanwhile, compress, please, already, so we can get things moving. Jose Vincento. Jose Vincento. I know, there. Okay. All Ignite speakers on this side, please compress and get seated so we can get the Ignite started. Chris, Chris. Mathieu already in the room? Mathieu. You, Mathieu? Perfect. Okay. okay. He's the first one, no? No. Okay. I'm just trying to figure out if I need to raise the mic or if this is the good <laughs> level. Should this should be fine, yeah. So, um, we have one, two, three, four, five ignites. Um, sadly, we lost one, but. Let's do this. Can I show you ready? Yep. <sighs> so slides will rotate after every 15 seconds. They will rotate every 15 seconds. Good luck. Hello. Uh, am I audible? Yeah. Okay. So my name is Ganesh, and uh, I work uh, as senior principal software engineer for Red Hat. Uh, so today I will talk about uh, adding language support in editors using language server protocol. Uh, so what are the features uh, traditionally you look for in editors? Uh, they are code auto-completion, 
so basically when you would start typing uh, in your editor it should uh, auto complete with all the possible inline suggestions then go to definition if you uh, do a right click and uh, want to see where this particular function is defined or where uh, what is the documentation for this particular api uh, that's the go to definition then uh, if you hover on particular keyword uh, if you want to see the short description of uh, what is being defined uh, you can use the documentation on hover functionality then uh, there is this uh, diagnostic uh, uh, functionality where, wherein uh, when you are editing the document at the same time you would want to see what are all the problems that are uh, faced uh, by the uh, what are all the problems that are uh, in your code so traditionally uh, to implement these features is uh, a significant amount of effort and uh, in case uh, if you want to support it for each of your editors uh, it has the editors are implemented in different languages and all those editors have different apis so to provide a programming language support for a single api a single editor you would have to implement uh, different uh, different programming uh, uh, specific languages. So in this case, let's say uh, I'm picking a Python here. So I have to have one implementation for VS Code, another for uh, Sublime, another for Vim. And that is not the most optimized way uh, how uh, you would like to do uh, things. Uh, so in comes the language server protocol. Uh, this protocol was developed by uh, Microsoft Visual Studio and it was standardized, uh, it was published in 2016 and it was standardized over time in collaboration with Red Hat and Code Envy. Uh, the protocol is an open uh, JSON RPC based protocol and that is used to communicate between the editors and the uh, uh, server. So uh, the server provides the programming language specific features. And the goal of the protocol is to distribute, to implement the uh, programming language support uh, and distribute it independently of any particular IDE. Uh, so in this uh, diagram, you can see that there is only one implementation uh, that provides all the features that I mentioned in the first slide, that is completion, diagnostic, hover, formatting. And uh, all the uh, on the uh, left side the, all are the language server implementations, one for JavaScript, one for Python, one for Java, and so on. And the editors that understand the language server protocol can use this single implementation uh, to communicate with the language server. And the implementation of the language server can be in any specific language. It is not dependent on what is provided by the IDE. So this slide goes a bit into detail about uh, how the communication happens. So uh, the, uh, when a development tool is basically your code editor, uh, when the user opens a document, it sends a JSON RPC request. Uh, in this case, it will first send did open with parameters, uh, information about what document is open in the IDE. Uh, language server will be stored that information at its end. Then when a user makes edit to the document, uh, it will send did change uh, uh, params and uh, it will send the doc URL. So basically the source of truth will not be in file system mode. It will be in the uh, uh, memory of the IDE. And that doc URL is being sent to the language server along with what is the changes that are done. Language server on its side uh, runs some of the diagnostic uh, information, some of the static analyzers tool, and try to figure out any problem with the source code. And it sends the diagnosti uh, diagnostic information back to the uh, IDE. And it, uh, IDE basically then does the job of rendering that problems uh, to the user uh, in the editor. Uh, then uh, for go to definition, uh, similarly, the flow happens. If you're working with uh, different languages, so uh, uh, IDE will basically create an instance of language server locally uh, in the background, and it will start sending uh, requests to the right uh, language server. So in this case, uh, if uh, you open uh, a document for SAS or Java, it will uh, send requests to that particular language server. Uh, this slide uh, shows the language server protocol that we had developed for Ansible. Uh, the the uh, APIs that uh, were developed were do hover, do complete, completion, do validate, and do semantics. So uh, uh, this single implementation can be used by multiple editors, uh, irrespective of which language they are written in. And right now, we have uh, clients for VS Code, Vim, and Emacs. Uh, so in this case, uh, at the server side, we run Ansible-specific utilities like Ansible config, Ansible uh, doc, to uh, introspect the user env environment and fetch uh, all the documents, plugin documentations that are there installed on the uh, user system. And that's how we come to know whenever a user sends a uh, autocomplete request, uh, we get the completion uh, inline suggestion. So yeah, thank you. Next up, yeah. Mathieu. Mathieu yeah. Are you ready? 
Or maybe you can... Oh yeah, maybe we can. I'm a big taller. <laughs> or just take it. Take it out. Well, it should be alright. Uh, this way, I believe. Yeah, so well? Well, I'm going to take it. Okay. Okay, good luck. So yeah, hi everyone. Uh, thanks for being there to this uh, Ignite talk and thanks uh, Config Management to organize such an event. This is uh, super cool, thanks again. Uh, before starting, let me quickly introduce myself. So my name is Mathieu, I work as a Linux OS software engineer at Microsoft, mainly involved on flat car development. Flat car is a, a Linux distribution, mainly oriented to run container workloads. Maybe you heard about it from CoreOS folks, so it's the legacy. Um, so today we're going to talk about Ignition. So I think it is the best place to talk about Ignition in Ignite Talk. So yeah, let's, let's do it. Uh, one time provisioning software. So why such a talk uh, to start? Basically, uh, the idea is not to say that Ignition is better than uh, Ansible or Cloud Init. The idea is just to give you an overview of another uh, tool and for you to choose what's the best tool in your workload and what's the best tool to, 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 uh, that fits your, your needs. So Ignition configuration is a JSON configuration. It's mainly declarative. It means that you can't have dynamic properties defined into your configuration. It's simply a state that you want to reach into your uh, system once it boots. So with Ignition, it boots or nothing. So you can't have an instant halfly uh, the provisioning, basically, if there is an error, an error during the provisioning, the instance won't boot at all. So this is pretty cool because it ensures that everything has been correctly provisioned. And with Ignition, it runs only once. So once the instance has been provisioning and correctly provisioning, it won't run uh, anymore. So it's not like cloud init that runs at each boot of the instance. Then uh, Ignition runs really early in the boot in, from the init run file system. So you can do uh, really low level operation like Lux encryption, decryption, but also injecting or removing a, a parameter from the kernel command line. Then finally, it's a JSON configuration, but we recommend to use external tools like Butane to generate that JSON configuration because no one loves to write a JSON configuration by hand. So you can use Butane, which uh, this is an example of Butane configuration to generate a, a ignition configuration for Flatcar. So you can see that I just want to define a file in slash opt slash file with the hello world content. Once I have this file, this configuration file, I can easily transpile it to an actual ignition configuration. So this is the butane command line, and then I have my JSON configuration file with ignition version 3.3.0. And you can see that my hello world has been correctly uh, changed to a data source. Then I can simply run the flat car instance using QMU uh, and the configuration, JSON configuration will be loaded at, at the boot and you can see that my file has been created. So nice, it runs locally with QMU but how do I deal with uh, cloud providers? So Ignition supports a bunch of cloud providers, uh, GCP, Azure, AWS, OpenStack, as long as you can have uh, IMDS uh, instance metadata service from the cloud provider, you can easily load configuration, JSON configuration uh, uh, at boot. So this is an example from the code base with Azure. So with Azure, you can define your Ignition configuration as a user data, like a cloud init one. And when the instance is going to boot, it's going to fetch that configuration from the user data from the IMDS. This is an example of Flatcar because with Flatcar we got that issue with backward compatibility. As you've seen, we can have Ignition version. So this is currently the Ignition 3.3.0 that's supported, but we wanted to ensure Ignition 2 also supported, so we tried to implement some translation mechanism. So we have to carry a couple of patches that we try to upstream to the Ignition uh, repository. But yeah, this is just a, a short overview of how does it work with Flatcar and how do we try to keep backward compatibility. So it's up to the distro maintainer or to the user to uh, install Ignition into the init RAM file system. So you need to be sure that you pull all the system dependencies into the init RAM file system. For example, here we can see that crypt setup is needed for Lux encryption and decryption. And here's a few of uh, distribution that does support uh, Ignition. So Flatcar, Fedora OS, but also uh, Micro OS. 
And I seen uh, on Ubuntu that there is the package for uh, ignition, so you can try it. And since we have uh, the config management uh, camp, I wanted to mention that you can also use Terraform to inject uh, uh, um, ignition configuration. So everything in the same code base, you can have your Terraform deployment and also your Terraform provisioning with ignition. Here, a couple of resources if you want to dig further uh, the documentation and the flat card documentation if you want to try out with uh, getting started. And finally, my uh, foster don handler if you want to uh, ping me on uh, ask questions or stuff like that. Thanks again. Felix? We're still on time. Uh, yeah. Hi. Uh, so great to be uh, back in person in Ghent Config Management Camp. Or, as a friend dubbed it when I explained the, the structure of the conference, are ah, you basically in Nerdistan? And I like that. So, welcome back, everyone in Nerdistan, fellow Nerdistanians. Some of you may wonder wait, this is main stage, and someone's talking about Ansible and Puppet. What year is this? To which, look. Those are bread and butter tools, so they're bad talking about. And this is Config Management Camp, it's, it's YAML Camp. So screw you, I'm Felix, I will talk about Ansible, hell yeah. And not only that, I will talk about a script that I wrote in Python to connect Ansible to my Puppet uh, installations. So again, some fellow Nerdistanians may say, wait, why would I bother writing Python when there's GitHub and I can get a dozen open source implementations of that shit from there? So yes, thank you. I have heard of GitHub. I have reasons. And I will start at the beginning. So a lot of the time, Ansible can look like this when you try to use it, right? You fire off your playbook, but then boom, you're on a new system or you're prov provisioning new systems and nobody knows anybody else's SSH keys and then your screen is full of annoying warnings and questions because, uh, yeah, SSH keys. It's, if you look at the UX of that, it's pretty clunky, right? If you don't have proper public key infrastructure, then, yeah, how do you, how do you provision it? Well, when nobody's looking, I, I just run SSH key scan through my entire inventory and, and build a known host file and then it just works. But this is, this is basically the same thing as just disabling the checks. So security, eh. So what if I tell you, if you run Puppet the whole time for whatever reason, then you probably have PuppetDB. And along with Factor that is in Puppet, uh, you basically got a free PKI because Factor keeps collecting all these as H keys and putting them in a database. And since I'm writing this Python script for my Ansible in the first place, I might as well get the keys from right there. And it's, it's fairly easy. So PuppetDB gives us this HTTP API and with a very simple curl, in this case, I got all the keys from one certain type. I get one JSON document. It has all the keys with the names of the machines attached. In this case, I got about 500 of them in this PuppetDB. It took two seconds, which is a long time. Um, I have a lot of overhead in the way that I conducted this experiment. Um, usually, you can build the full known hosts stuff in under a second for, uh, I think, a, a, a pretty much larger infrastructure. And it's, it's fun, it's cool. Another thing that I want my Python script to do is not just give me one huge list of machines that Puppet knows about and give me one big Ansible group. I mean, this is already useful, it's powerful, I can do a lot of damage with just having all my hosts in one Ansible group. But the thing is, in PuppetDB, there's a lot of additional information about all your machines, so you can uh, derive some structure from that. For example, you may have custom facts already that tell you ah, all these machines are production and all those are testing and then that is UA. And another fact might tell you, yeah, this is in project X and those are in the project that is totally not going to be a death star at some point. Uh, problem is when you, when you get all your facts from PuppetDB, even if you just have 500 machines, it's a lot of data, it takes time. Uh, something else you can do is just query resources. So 
Uh, with this query, it's a little more involved, but I got all the classes that machines declare that start with profile colon colon. The puppet enjoys and the audience know what I'm talking about. And it's a little more flexible, it, it, it's, uh, give, it, it's more elegant, it doesn't require so much data, but uh, it's, it's uh, still not as quite, as quite as flexible as the fact thing, right? So I took a middle way. I invented this resource type with a, with a very simple code. It's, it's guaranteed bug-free, by the way, zero unit tests required. And I can just create a bunch of resources that give me the same information as those custom facts. You know, now I have a resource that tells, yeah, you are a staging machine, no, you are a production machine, or you are in that project. And I can have as many of these aspect resources on any node as I need. And this gives me all uh, the control to get an Ansible inventory out of my Puppet data that has the exact, exact shape that I want and I control it all through <laughs> Puppet code. So yeah, those are the two ideas I just wanted to put out there. Maybe it's interesting for someone. Mandatory message from my employer, we are hiring, so yeah, find me in the hallway. If you know someone who loves looking for a job, talk to me about jobs, talk to me about anything, get a free hug. <coughs> it's nice to be here, thanks for listening. <laughs> Docker. Docker one. That one. Yes. Good luck. Is it cool? Yeah. Hello, everyone. I know you heard about some nicks uh, yesterday, and now I will share a non popular opinion about why you would prefer it over Docker file or a lot of different configuration format. Uh, to recall you, what's Nix again? It's a it's package manager configuration language in OS, but most importantly, it helps you to describe developer environment or package as a complete list of its dependency. Like, I mean, all your dependency. By complete, it will fetch and locks everything you need. That means you sure your package, you, you, everything you need to, to have your package is in control, so you, that's a way to, to, to assure you reproducibility, and that's helps to you to have, for example, two conflicting JLibc version on your ma machine. It could work. That's not an issue uh, when you use Nix or two Python version or anything. And that's work with something called patch elf that will force binary to use the specific dynamic library you want it to use. That's how Nix assure you to control the complete uh, set of dependencies. So. The guarantee is one Nix file, when it's hermetic, guaranteed by the flex feature for the details, means your reproducible developer, uh, a perfectly reproducible developer environment. It's it guarantee. So it's, it's a really cool guarantee. And if we want to have some code example, here I set a hash where I say this version of Nix package. So I'm sure I will always have exactly the same version of Python 3 uh, in every, I know. It's, it's guaranteed. And if I talk a bit about Docker, you will say, yeah, I, I, I know I will have the same guarantee, but, but I want you to ask yourself, are you sure? Is it true if you use, for example, Ubuntu? Is it true if there is some other command hide it? I don't know. And the thing is, with a Docker file, you can generate two different images. So the same Docker file run two different times may produce two different images. You don't know about that. You, you have to trust the Docker file, and some, maybe someone else frightened it, so, so you don't know. And the thing is, you have to keep track of Docker file and under Docker file, and this is really hard and bad practice. It's a bit like you put binary in your Git source repository. You, you, you want to under source nodes Docker, so you can use Nix inside Docker. And if you use Nix inside Docker, there is a Nix Docker image. You can have a Nix environment, and you have everything reproducible. So an example will appear in a few seconds here. Yeah. And it looks like that. And if I do that, I know I will have the same, the right Python version. But I get the same issue I just said before. I don't know if someone do weird things in my Docker file. I have no real guarantee. I have to trust the Docker file. And the image is really big. And Docker image could be changed, mutated. So sometimes 
nobody really know what's all the step to produce an image because we care about image, not source. It's a bit like nobody know how to build a, a package. And there is a cool thing about Nix is we can generate Docker image declaratively, like we write it as a Nix uh, package. And the, the really cool thing is it will not include Nix or any package manager, just the package you, you defined to be inside of it. So you can have something like that. I just say, I want Python tree, <coughs> and I hope it will work well. I, I miss the version things, but you get the idea. And if I do that, I know I could then do something non-reproducible, and I have a nice side effect, which is I have really small images because I only bring in my images what images does, what images use to build themselves. So it's pretty cool, and Nix have a lot of feature like uh, stream the layer red image and anything. And the thing is, it's really hard actually to, if you have an existing Bing Docker file written by something else, to turn it into a Nix expression because it's two different model of thinking, like a step de by step declarative one to an imperative one. But I try to work around this on my free time. So if you're interested in to look, have an idea how to test a client that help to do that, feel free to to ping me. Uh, that's not the last slide, it's a trick. Um, the thing is, I, I, I just want to convince you that it's really more easy to contribute to Nix package than, I don't know, any other Linux distribution, Arc, Debian, or, and the tool used by this slide isn't uh, supported by Nix package because no one wants to support Python too. So, Feel free to contribute. Yes, there is really a really bunch of contributors around Nix package. It's a really cool project to to send a package to. So thank you a lot for your attention. Too bad for Brian, then. Now I really have an argument. Um, who's seen the previous version of this talk? So hi, I'm Bram, and this is my website. And we're going to talk today about how deep down the rabbit hole you can go uh, in uh, setting this up. Uh, the kids, new kids nowadays, we call it the challenge. And this is basically uh, yeah, a question posed at, uh, in a bar. and so. We're going to build a one-page website, right? It's going to be marked down just what you saw. It's an image. It's a link to my GitHub and my, uh, my Twitter. So nobody writes HTML anymore. Uh, you know, I can't. So I used Hugo to build it into um, an HTML page. You know, browsers nowadays, they refuse to load anything that isn't HTTPS anymore. So I need to get a free certificate from somewhere. Because um, that's what I call this version. I've done the uh, hold my beer edition, and this is the free stuff edition. So uh, HTML, we need to serve with something. So we're going to add a, a, a something called Nginx, which is a very nice uh, web serving uh, tool currently part of F5 even, um, right? It needs to run somewhere on my Mac. It's, a, it's, a, it's ARM based, so that will run now nowhere. So I need to, you know, docker, 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 because the people that still know uh, Java, when they, that came out, they sold it, build it once, run it everywhere, right? So I need to run it. It's in my Docker container. I can't ship my laptop to the data center, so I need to have a data center. And this is the one where you go like, hey, hold on, Bram, this is not the free version. That's right. But I, I'm Dutch, I'm cheap, so I prepaid for an uh, AWS instance for three years. So at this, at this point, it was free, so it could land on there anywhere. Um, so of course, I was my original plan was to do a blog, and it's going to be very insightful, and it's going to have lots of uh, um, visitors. So we're going to add a load balancer so that eventually, we're, you know, it, it can scale to AWS, right? That started to become very complicated, so I had my Docker that needed to run, um, I had my load balancer, so I started puppetizing things. Just like uh, Felix did, you know, Puppet is my uh, tool of choice to build the OS, you know, that started to be complicated because I needed to preload this, this Puppet thing onto my uh, um, EC2 because 
who can be asked to write a shell script to cloud in it. Um, so, right, I pre built it in Packer. It also loads it very quickly. Um, well, that added another layer of complexity. So, we're going to terraform the whole the, the AWS, right? We've automated our OS, but we need to automate our cloud. So, Terraform came into the mix. Uh, um, I can run this for free because I can basically uh, Terraform Cloud has a free offering. Um, right, when we're going to scale, it's going to be am amazing. Then I can't be asked to hard code uh, IP numbers again because, you know, in the cloud things go away, come back. So I added a layer of service discovery. And then we end up, you know, on a service scheduler because friends don't let friends run Kubernetes. So I chose Nomad. Um, so I can just dump it on any of the lo on the nodes and traffic can ask a uh, console where my Nomad nodes live. So it's all cool. Um, the auto scaling again, right? It's still Nomad because they luckily came out with a tool, right? I can now add multiple instances so all the visitors can get like a nice, crisp, uh, quickly responding answer. Even if it explodes, um, it has uh, an AWS auto scaling support. Right? At that point, it became very complex. It had multiple tools, multiple files, so you know get some CI CD into the mix because I can't be asked to run this myself anymore, you know, just commit and then have my tools do it. Um, I got very interested in supply chain attacks at that point, you know, because, you know, my, my blog is going to be so insightful that I'm now an attack vector. So um, I, I, I started looking into my uh, repositories, you know, Docker, um, AWS Docker doesn't do secure images. At the same point, you know, my SSH tunnel is going to be um, an attack vector, so I'm going to stick something in like Boundary or a, a Teleport. Um, that still requires me to create an SSH key that might leak somewhere, so I'm going to add that in Vault, and Vault has um, engines that can generate these things for me, so it's just a throwaway image or something. You know, it's going to be complex. You know, all these visitors, I've, I've built it out scaling, but it could still go down, so we're going to have uh, some observability, you know, we you want metrics, you want logs, you want to see how many people actually come to see my insightful stuff. At this point, the block's still not there, you know, single page. <laughs> um, but I do have metrics, so metrics are fine, but if nobody looks at it, you know, we need some alerting, so it's, I'm ha actually have Pager do the and Slack support, so when my website goes down and does nothing, you know, I get a pager. Um, and this is the end, this is the last slide. Basically say, I had loads of fun building all this out, but don't be me, just stick it on GitHub pages and be done with it. <laughs> Thank you. So that's all the Ignite for today. Um, we have lunch coming up. Um, like always, you go outside and go to, towards the restaurant. Um, there will be a short queue. It should be better than yesterday. Um, so, and we start again at two o'clock.
Hello. 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 <laughs> sorry, sorry. Hey. It was a good fall, right? So, so remember this applause that you just did. First of all, uh, did everyone have a great lunch? Yes. Are you sleepy from having ate a big lunch? Yes. All right, so we're gonna do a little warm-up exercise because you are gonna give a super energetic round of applause for Mr. Dotan, who's from Logs.io, and he's been involved with a bit of a legal talk in some sense. So I hope you enjoy it. Uh, Dotan, everyone. Hey everyone, uh, great being here. The one that are up there, lots of room here. If you want to uh, come closer, be great, and uh, you'll have much more fun being close to me and for me being able to see you because it's very difficult to see everyone from, uh, from up here. Uh, I'm very excited to be here at uh, Config Management Camp, finally, after uh, all these years of hearing the good stories about that. And let's start with this. Imagine waking up one morning to find out that your beloved open source uh, database or any other library or tool at the heart of your system uh, is being relicensed. And uh, that's not just a horror story, actually uh, it happened to me and to my company twice in the past two years alone. Uh, it was a painful and uh, an insightful experience and uh, I'd like to use the coming minutes to share with you some of these insights. My name is Dotan Horvitz. I'm uh, the principal developer advocate at uh, Logs.io. Uh, Logs.io provides a cloud-native observability platform that's based on popular open source tools such as Elasticsearch, uh, Prometheus, uh, uh, Grafana, OpenTelemetry and others. So and you'll see uh, how, it, how it's relevant very soon. Uh, I'm an advocate of open source and uh, communities. Uh, in general, and the uh, CNCF, the Cloud Native Computing Foundation in particular, I uh, uh, co-organized the local CNCF chapter in uh, Israel. So if you're around, do uh, come and join us on one of our meetups, or we're going to actually have next month the first Kubernetes Community Days in Israel. Woo! So uh, uh, that's exciting. Uh, I hope to see more of these. I'm also an organizer of the DevOps Days Tel Aviv. I actually saw some familiar faces that uh, were uh, speakers at uh, DevOps Days Tel Aviv. And in general, you can find me everywhere at Horovitz, Mastodon, Twitter, Medium, whatever. So uh, hope to keep in touch. And let's start with the story uh, of what happened to us about two years ago. It was the beginning of 2021, uh, the second week of January. Uh, everyone coming back from the holiday vacations, happy like you see in the picture, kick-starting the new year. and. Then one morning, a bomb dropped on us. Uh, in January 2021, uh, we saw this announcement, uh, like many others, uh, announcing that Elasticsearch and uh, uh, Kibana were being relicensed from uh, Apache 2.0 to a dual license, uh, SSPL, uh, and Elastic license. And to make things even more interesting, this was due to take place effective uh, the upcoming version, version 7.11, back then it was 7.10, so in just a matter of few weeks, less than a month, that is going to be a done deal. Um, and uh, is, is everyone familiar, by the way, with the Elk stack? Who, who knows the Elk stack, just with the show of hands? Okay, so everyone's familiar. Uh, so you know uh, what it means uh, for us specifically, Elasticsearch uh, database is at the core of our system, as you understood uh, from, from what we do, it's a critical system. Uh, and we've been investing in tweaking and uh, optimizing it for our use cases for uh, years. So you could not imagine the, the level of confusion that seeing this uh, note caused. And actually the confusion was even greater because the, this announcement that I told you about was titled Doubling Down on Open. And the, um, the announcement said, uh, if you can see uh, the highlighted section, um, th this license change ensures our community and customers have free and open access 
uh, to use, modify, redistribute, and collaborate on the code. Yes? Free and open. Like free and open source software, uh, doubling down on open. Perhaps it's, it's not so bad as it seems. Perhaps SSPL is actually uh, open source and everything's okay. And uh, we weren't the only one being confused, actually. Uh, uh, a few days afterwards, the OSI, the Open Source uh, Initiative, uh, uh, issued a very uh, unique, uh, uncommon statement uh, clarifying, declaring that SSPL is not open source, uh, that it does not comply with the open source definition, uh, because it discriminates against fields of endeavor, uh, and essentially clarifying this is a FoxPen source license. And this is very important, people get it confused. Source available is not open source, okay? It's a FoxPen source license. Um, so, as you could imagine, uh, there was a, a lot of shock and rage in the community, not just by us, of course. You uh, immediately saw raging, uh, uh, raging posts, uh, articles, uh, doubling down on open, uh, not open at all. Um, Elasticsearch and Kabana are now business risks. Uh, Elastic promises open but delivers proprietary. And my favorite one, a meme of an angry bunny, bunny rabbit. So that's the level of angry that people got. Um, and shortly after that, uh, people start calling to fork uh, Elasticsearch and Kabana projects to keep them open. Uh, this is my, uh, the, the CTO of my uh, company, uh, immediately stating our mission statement being, as I mentioned, open source first for all of our customers. So uh, teaming up with whoever is from the community is willing to do that and, and making the, this fork happen. Uh, a far greater uh, player in the industry, Amazon, came up uh, with the announcement that they're going to uh, step up and uh, make this fork happen. We have some distinguished gentlemen here from uh, AWS. Uh, they can probably share more about this journey. Um, no. <laughs> who said I was talking about you? <laughs> uh, on the social media, it was very clear. People very clearly voted uh, saying that uh, uh, they would prefer open source uh, fork of that sort over uh, uh, an SSP licensed uh, Elastic version. Uh, and that as soon as a uh, fork uh, is made available, they will switch over from Elasticsearch to that fork. So this was the sentiment back then. Um, and what happened? Uh, what happened to us? What happened to the others? I'll get that, back to that very soon. But first, let's, uh, let's take a step, a step back and understand what is open source anyway. And unlike what was presented, I'm not going to have a legal talk. Uh, every one of you, I assume, knows uh, all the uh, open source licensing, uh, all the uh, OSI certified, whether Apache or MIT or BSD and all these, and there are lots of talks and lots of material about that. But the question is, is having open source uh, enough to qualify an open source project? Um, and who guarantees that the open source license won't change? And actually, who can change the license? These are the questions that I want to discuss and to make sure that everyone is clear about. And in the OSI's old website, I think they changed it since then, there was this slogan that I really, really like. It says, guaranteeing the R in source. And following the same vein, I would s suggest you to ask yourselves in each and every one of these junction points, who is the hour in source? Who governs your open source? And essentially, there are three main categories for that. Uh, first, there's the open source de developed by individuals, free maintainers. Uh, that's actually the vast majority of projects on, on GitHub. Um, I gave here a few uh, examples, popular examples like uh, 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 curl. You know, uh, you have millions of uh, devices from your car to your washing machine running on this, and there's a, a single maintainer behind this project. Or um, uh, log4j. We all remember the uh, log4shell vulnerability, and through the vulnerability, we saw how many 
use. I think so something like 8% of all of Maven repository was somehow dependent on this, uh, on this library, two maintainers. So that's, that's the case for many, many projects, the vast majority. Uh, the other type is projects uh, run by vendors. We saw the example of Elasticsearch and Kabana. They, they're run by uh, Elastic NV. Uh, there's the uh, example of Grafana, uh, by Grafana Labs, uh, uh, Mongo, uh, and many others that you probably know. And the last category is foundational open source. Linux with the Linux Foundation, Kubernetes with the CNCF, the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, Kafka, Apache Foundation, Clips Foundation, and so on. And this category is slightly different than the previous ones because here you get uh, a governance to ensure uh, vendor neutrality or entity neutrality to make sure that there's no one entity, and it doesn't matter if it's a vendor or uh, an individual, that controls the, uh, the project, which gives obviously a, a bit more of a, of a uh, confidence level, not guaranteeing, but, but uh, it is an aspect to consider. So that, that's about who governs the open source. And why, is, why does that matter? I won't, I'm going to show you that uh, very soon. Now I'd like to look at some case studies of open source turning to the dark side. As you could guess, I'm a bit of a Star Wars geek. So uh, may the open source be with you. <laughs> Live long and prosper. And whoever comes, that's a different one. And we'll talk about your, uh, your uh, understanding of the uh, material. But anyway, come afterwards, and I'll give you a sticker of may the open source be with you, for those who survived my talk. Um, so let's start with the uh, first uh, case study about uh, open source going non-open source. And for that, I want to go back to the uh, case study of Elasticsearch. Uh, so we saw this announcement before, and Elastic, uh, Elastic. this is what's known, by the way, as the rights ratchet. So you get in, you'll be pulled in by, by an open source, and then starts being tightened uh, in. Um, and Elastic explained that he did that to fight off uh, uh, competitors, such as G this gentleman from AWS uh, that is making use and profit over the, using the, uh, the open source, but not contributing back. That's the, the claim that they had. Um, and by the way, Elastic NV is not a small startup in its own right. It's a public company. It's a eight point something billion uh, US dollars worth. Uh, uh, but as a side note, but the main thing is that it didn't end up here. So the Elk stack has more than just Elasticsearch and Kibana, uh And uh, the other pieces remained Apache 2.0. However, they started introducing breaking changes uh, to these pieces. Uh, to start mainly the, the shippers, the ones that send uh, the, the, the telemetry, the logs and so on to uh, the backend uh, service to make a check, like let's uh, take an example Filebit, that's a very popular agent that collects and uh, reads the log lines from your local file system and sends it off to, your, to your, uh, an Elasticsearch cluster and they introduced a check uh, to make sure that the backend remote cluster is certified. Uh, and if not, people who upgraded this uh, just broke, stopped working. So it happened with uh, uh, Filebit and many other bits, uh, Logstash, uh, client libraries. Uh, you started seeing these sorts of uh, tweets and, and uh, social media with angry developers finding out these checks inside the source code of, um, of many of these libraries. Um, and I think this is the best description uh, of that. For those who don't know Elastic, uh, Elasticsearch, it's like imagine the reaction of Oracle's MySQL team if they uh, decided to fix MySQL client libraries so that they could only connect to an official MySQL ver version. That's the equivalent for those who come from the relational databases. So uh, as I mentioned, the community reacted with a fork that was ultimately named OpenSearch, uh, currently uh, led by AWS together with uh, Red Hat, SAP, uh, my company logs.io and others. Um, and OK, you'd say just hit the button, fork, and that's it, right? That's what open source is built for. Uh, but apparently it wasn't that easy at all. Uh, there were many uh, code smells. And you, as you can see here, this is a, a snippet from the open source community updates uh, on the forking work. 
And the thing is that developers that jumped into the source code quickly realized that Elasticsearch and Kibana code base was entangled between the open source piece, the Apache 2.0, and the proprietary XPAC uh, 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 source code to the level that sometimes they need to go line by line in order to, uh, to uh, uh, distinguish and to uh, take them apart. Uh, and in addition to that, there were all sorts of other things you can see here, like um, uh, embedded uh, marketing, branding elements, RSS feeds, pop-up messages, dial home features, telemetry, telemetry fetched, uh, and so on. So um, uh, it was, if you want to, by the way, hear more about that, I have a, a, a podcast called uh, Open Observability Talks, as I mentioned. So there was a very fascinating talk with uh, Kyle uh, about that. Uh, he shared a lot of insights about this process. So uh, a very cool episode. <clears throat> and uh, uh, at the end, uh, back in uh, July 21, uh, which was less than half a year, very impressive to the level of the code, the work that needed to be done, uh, the, it was GA'd, um, and many moved uh, subsequently from Elasticsearch, sorry, to, uh, uh, to OpenSearch. Um, some big names that, uh, that I wrote down, Dow Jones, Goldman Sachs, Pinterest, SAP, Zoom, Rackspace, Obviously, Amazon moved there, Logs.io, my company, uh, migrated, uh, and now it's a, it's a project on its own right, open search and open search dashboards. So that's one case study of open source going non-open source. But remember that what I said at the beginning, open source isn't just about OSI licensing. And things can happen all, even within the OSI realm, for example, uh, going copyleft. And for that I want to uh, uh, introduce the case study of Grafana. Grafana, very popular open source, everyone knows that for uh, dashboarding, metrics, right? Uh, anyone doesn't know Grafana? Okay. <laughs> Just checking if people are awake. Okay, so um, uh, in April 2021, same year, Grafana Labs announced relicensing Grafana. Paul, you said you didn't hear about that. This is the interesting part. No, just kidding. <laughs> Grafana, Loki, and Tempo from Apache 2.0 to AGPL version 3. And they explained it by the need to balance the open source with uh, their monetization strategy. Again, boiling down to the same thing of competitors leveraging uh, the open source. Now, AGPL version 3 is an open source license. It's approved by the OSI, so you may ask, so what's, what's the problem, right? And the problem is that people, like my company that used to use it, uh, discovered that the open source tool uh, that they use is suddenly uh, an infectious open source. So, uh, and, and an example by Google, for instance. Google, this is the official public uh, uh, policy, open source policy. Uh, they're all in favor of using open source internally, but for AGPL, the policy clearly states uh, that they forbid it, they ban AGPL, uh, saying simply that the risks uh, heavily overweigh the benefits. And this is the case to many other vendors. So wh why is copyleft licensing uh, so, so problematic? What, I what is it? And uh, remember, I'm not a lawyer, so do consult with your lawyers, but to, pay, to put in, in plain words, using AGPL, um, <coughs> sorry, uh, using AGPL software uh, means that uh, anything that, uh, if you modify it, anything that you touch, that it touches, uh, needs to also be availab made available uh, under the same license. So in a way, it sort of spreads virally. This is why I, I call it uh, contagious or infectious. Uh, this effect, and, and actually specifically AGPL, uh, this version uh, has uh, also uh, another clause, section 13, that says that also interacting with over the internet, over a network uh, connection, I don't remember the exact uh, terminology in the legal terms, um, uh, will make effect. So uh, you don't even need to somehow package and, and send it to a customer to say, hey, now it's being delivered. Uh, and if you take Google or any other SaaS company that uh, all the interaction is over the internet, obviously all the usage, uh, that, that plainly becomes a, a business risk, okay? Um, 
And uh, I would say that even if use it internally, by the way, it could be problematic if you have, for example, uh, vendors, contractors, third parties that, that work for you, temps. Uh, it doesn't really matter in terms of the licensing. If it's an internal user, external user, you may also be exposed. So uh, it's, it's a, a bit tricky. Um, and the thing is that um, with, 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 this, uh, with this sort of a license, uh, it's not only problematic for vendors, so I gave the example of Google and other SaaS, but also for open source uh, projects. You decide that your project should be Apache 2.0, you use some sort of a library or an SDK or something, and suddenly you're, you're forced to change the license. Uh, to the extent that the CNCF released very clear announcements following that, saying that uh, AGPL is problematic um, uh, for them, and instructing their uh, project, all the CNCF's project, to either switch to an alternative uh, solution or to freeze and not upgrade to the relicensed version. Stay with the version that is Apache 2.0. So it's problematic also for, for open source. So that's uh, uh, the examples of uh, uh, open source going uh, uh, non-open source and open source uh, going copyleft uh, with vendors. But things can happen not just with vendors. And for that, I brought a case study of uh, two popular uh, open source frameworks, uh, Colors and Faker. Uh, both of them are MI were MIT licensed, yeah. and very, I, I'm sure very, all of you will agree, very permissive license. And uh, both maintained by a single uh, person, a single individual, uh, Marak Squares, uh, a single open source maintainer, free on his own time. And then, earlier last year, Mark deleted the open source, deleted the open source code of source code, sorry, of, of Faker, and published the empty package to uh, npm, the uh, packaging, uh, under version uh, uh, 666. Symbolically enough, I like the fact that, by the way, the the icon, uh, the logo is uh, the magician's hat, and poof, it disappeared. The source code disappeared, and imagine what happened to those who automatically upgraded to the latest release from NPM. Uh, Faker uh, receives like 2 million weekly downloads uh, back then. Uh, also quite popular as a dependency on JavaScript and Node.js project. So just imagine what that meant. Uh, and to his defense, by the way, uh, he gave heads up a couple of months earlier. He gave this uh, uh, in, in the GitHub issue saying, no more free work from Iraq. Um, so, uh, I'm no longer going to support Fortune 500s, pay me or fork it. So, uh, that was the, the heads up call, no one listened to it, of course. And he didn't end up with Faker. A few days later, three days later, at uh, January 8th, Marak published a new version of the Colors library with uh, an offending commit, you can see the, the code here, uh, essentially an infinite loop, which effectively creates a denial of service to any, uh, any Node.js server using it. And the color of NPM is even more popular than Faker, 20 million downloads uh, a week, used by more than 4 million other projects on GitHub, and obviously the release immediately started the ripple effect of breaking numerous uh, uh, popular projects, including, by the way, the AWS CDK, a very popular uh, uh, library, I'm sure that you'll agree. So uh, until NPM rolled it back and stopped this ripple effect. And then he wrote a blog post uh, titled Monetizing Open Source is Problematic. I think the title says it all about why, why he did that. It's important to check your dependencies before you import them. That, that's a very good point. I'm going to... Uh, Make note of that now in the, in the talk. So uh, thank you. So let's talk about learnings. We had already one learning here, so it's definitely a good, good uh, thing. So the case study, so what can we learn? And I want to share the learnings for building open source, for using open source, uh, and for vetting new open source for your, uh, for your company. And the first one, let's start with the, actually from building open source. So if you do decide that you want to release an open source, please remember, Open source is not a business model, okay? Uh, 
The problem isn't with the commercial vendors, it's with the commercial incentive. Okay? So if you're a vendor, and if you choose the open source path, you should build a sustainable business model. Uh, those who don't end up in conflict between the open source community side and their uh, business needs and end up relicensing defend defending, uh, defensively and pulling off these uh, rights ratchets and all these uh, uh, things on their users. Uh, not to mention the ripping off of the community members uh, that contributed the code and time and, uh, and uh, uh, to further the project. And that's uh, a separate topic about uh, the contributor licenses and how to achieve that. Uh, I'm not going to be covering that now. Uh, so that's if you're a vendor. And if you're an individual, remember we can be a vendor owned or, a, or an individual maintainer. If you're an individual maintainer, and if you decide to open source a project, my advice for you is don't expect, don't expect material compensation. Yes, even if all the Fortune 500s use your library, do not expect a material compensation. If you want to make money out of coding, lots of uh, jobs out there for coding, if you go down the open source path, understand that this is, this is not the way. Uh, or, of course, you can establish a vendor entity around the open source, uh, like uh, Confluent did with Kafka, or uh, and a Chronosphere did with M3DB, or, or things like that. And then, of course, remember my advice before for the vendors. So that's about building open source. If you're using open source, here's how to keep safe. First of all, manage your third party licensing exposure, just like you do for your security exposure. Uh, so prefer the least restrictive licenses that meet your needs uh, and look for license contamination, like Apache 2 containing AGPL, things such as that. Uh, so that's the advice that we heard before about being aware of the licensing. By the way, all this trend of S-bombs and mapping your dependencies with S-bombs can also very well benefit this need as well, not just security. Also take care with automation. Uh, license compliance checks uh, need to be made before uh, updating third-party versions. Uh, we all love automation here in this uh, conference, but beware with automation without safeguards in that respect, okay? Um, just think about those who updated automatically from uh, version 7.10 to 7.11, a minor release of Elasticsearch, what happened. So uh, beware. Also, uh, be, be cognizant of code smells. Code smells can actually, in the open source, can signal uh, uh, that something uh, is, might be uh, fishy. It can buy you some time to act proactively rather than reactively. Uh, remember in the example of Elasticsearch and Cabana, code smells such as mixed code licenses, uh, uh, dial home features, things such as that. Uh, of course it requires some familiarity with the source code, but many of you are power users that do go in to understand how the code works, if not to, to modify. So when you go in, remember to, to pay attention to these things. And uh, if you find yourself needing to tweak the open source after, after all, uh, prefer extending the open source using plugins rather than modifying the source code. That's much more difficult for uh, someone to, to block you from uh, writing extensions than modifying the, the source code as well. So that's for using open source. And if you are vetting new open source, here are a few uh, things to consider. First of all, obviously, the, uh, which open source license is being used. Not all open source licenses is uh, equal. Uh, so it's important to understand the, di the differences uh, and remember that uh, source available is not open source, okay? Uh, that's uh, first. Secondly, understand who's behind the open source. We saw it could be a uh, uh, one-man show, so it's a single point of failure. Maybe you want to be aware of that. It could be a vendor. Maybe it can uh, pull the rug. Uh, maybe you can find yourself in a rights ratchet uh, situation. So uh, obviously foundational open source provides a bit more of a, a safe ground in that respect. Also understand what's the governance policy of that project. How they ensure that there's no single uh, uh, entity who grabs control. Uh, what's the promotion path to contributor, to maintainer, uh, who can review, who can approve PRs. Ultimately who can do such move as a relicensing. And uh, if you are a 
concerned about these, this exposure, of course, you can go down the path of uh, vendor distros uh, that can provide you shielding from uh, this, uh, this exposure. Uh, distro is essentially a packaging of the upstream projects, just as, a, as, a, as a something that is made available by a vendor with including some support. So uh, uh, in, indemnification is the most important thing, so you're not exposed directly to the legal parts. And of course, you get some uh, certification on hardware and, and other things such as that. Uh, some of that also provided as a managed version and uh, of course on the way you'll help fi fund the open source because most of these uh, folks are the ones also then contributing and funding the, uh, the projects themselves. So just to summarize, open source is more than a license, okay? And open source can turn to the dark side in uh, several ways that we've seen. It can be relicensed, it can go rogue, uh, it can uh, otherwise pull the rug underneath you. It can happen to veteran projects such as uh, Elasticsearch, a decade old project. It doesn't have to be just young projects. It could be, happen anytime. Uh, so be aware of that. And also uh, be aware of this bait and switch stunt. Uh, it's, uh, Concerning to me to see uh, the right ratchet model spreading. I wrote a blog about uh, is vendor-owned open source uh, an oxymoron. You have the, the link there in the QR code. Uh, so it's, it's a risk. And for yourself, select uh, open source wisely. We talked about managing the license exposure. Don't auto uh, update without safeguards. We talked about code smells. Uh, build open source wisely. We talked about open source uh, not being a business model. Remember that open source is not a business model. If there's one thing to take out of this talk, <laughs> take this one. And uh, I, I, it's important because I don't want to see people losing trust in the open source. Uh, so uh, it's important uh, that this vendor's bait and switch stunt is, is something that does not make people lose faith. And always ask yourselves, um, who is the hour in source? Who is actually be behind the open source that you use. So uh, these are my tips and my experiences. And uh, happy to uh, answer <coughs> questions if we have time. I don't know if we have time. Please. Yes. So um, if they change license, aren't they breaking the old license? They're, they're changing from a certain version onward. So. If you were in Elasticsearch 7.10, for example, it was still Apache 2.0. They released this announcement. The, the following version that came out like three weeks afterwards or so was already in the new license, SSPL. So, they, but they're not building something new. If they build something new, they can use a new license. But they're using all the old code, which okay. is under the old license, in the new version. So, so they're basically breaking their So the, the license, license is for the version of the released software. And the fact that it's based on an older code is what I mentioned very briefly about the contributors that contributed the, the original code. But essentially, each, each package, if you'd like, or each release comes with its own uh, code. So uh, the new release comes with a new code. You can say, but what about the contributions that were made in the past that brought you to that point in time? And that goes to the, the rights, who owns the, if, if they own the, in the, put it plainly, if they own the, the code, they can decide that they want to change the license. So they don't hurt uh, you as an end user. The, 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 the delicate but very, but very important point is about hurting the contributors from the community that contributed that code originally. Uh, I hope that I answered your question. The users get a package, get a version, yeah. So that, that's what I mentioned before when I said contribute to licensing. Uh, there's a, yeah. Um, but projects without a contribute to license agreement are not allowed to change the code unless all the contributors change it or agree with the license change. So, uh, so, the CLA are dangerous. so you're right, and I mentioned that very briefly, but I didn't want to open because it's a whole different talk about uh, about the contribute to licensing. But what he said, just to repeat, because people might not have heard. There is an aspect that I mentioned before about the contributors that contributed the source code from the community. They, are, they were signed, they signed the CLA 
uh, a contributor license agreement, and essentially what they, they gave up their right on the code, they granted it to the entity that controlled the, the project, which ultimately was behind the scenes was the vendor, and the vendor changed the license, and it, it could do that. Other types of uh, agreements with the contributors have different terms, there are DCOs and others, and actually well, there's a distinguished gentleman here that probably uh, will have more uh, to say on that, if that's the why you're raising your hand. No. Okay, so I, I hope that I, so just before I take your question, so that was in a nutshell, and I agree with you, it's a whole different thing, there are others that were not even, the ones that released an open source without even understanding that they need to put some sort of agreement with their contributors, that's even more complex, uh, so yes, the, the, the delicate point is not with the end users, you asked what about the end user, but they were counting on a, on a code, that's not the concern, the concern is actually with the contributors, and the contributors might say, but I, I gave my time and my uh, energy and effort for free because I thought that I'm giving it to the community. Now you're taking it and making it your own. So that's the delicate point, but the very important point. Um, I hope I answered the question. Yes, please. So uh, I really enjoyed your talk, so thank you so much. Thank you. Um, I want to push back on one point, and maybe you could uh, reply. Um, I thought that your fear of AGPL that you were expressing a little bit was mostly FUD, and I think that usually in practice it only affects companies who have either bad license hygiene or who care about benefiting from the free code without giving back. And I wondered if you agree with that statement. So just to repeat the question, uh, so he said that uh, my statement uh, about AGPL, AGPL, this, this is the copyleft license that I gave an example with Grafana Labs. Um, uh, that it's a bit of a FUD, fear, uh, uncertainty and doubt, uh, because it's a fair enough a license, it's an open source license and it may fit, and it may not fit, just these companies that don't, don't want to give back to the community, uh, just want to consume. Um, so, before going into my point of view, I will just say, the CNCF itself, with the open source foundation, found AGPL to be inappropriate for their projects. So I don't think it's my personal opinion. I tried actually to, uh, to give a very uh, objective opinion. I showed other companies that just feel that it's a business risk for them. So, and I, I, I think that Google, by the way, is not a good example. Google said that it does not, it bans AGPL license from their company. And they're the biggest, actually I saw this morning, uh, uh, Chris, uh, the CTO of uh, the CNCF just pub posted, uh, tweeted about the latest stats, I don't know who saw that, latest stats of open source contributions. He showed the ranking and the highest ranking uh, company in open source contribution and ac activity is Google. So they can't be blamed by, for not contributing back to the community. And they're concerned. They're concerned not because they're not contributing back to the community. They're concerned because they provide a SaaS and the level of exposure business-wise for the company by using AGPL and at some point someone would say that some, some peripheral software of a software might be somewhat infected is a business risk uh, that uh, many people find. If they have bad hygiene, it's a problem. If they don't want to give back, it's a problem. If you have good hygiene and you're okay contributing back, then it's not a problem. So uh, he mentioned hygiene and he mentioned contributing back. These are two very important points that I want to address. Uh, one is hygiene. Hygiene came back to, remember if I said that S-BOM, for instance, if you use S-BOM, that's a great tool, not just for security, but also for uh, mapping out your license contamination. So I agree. The fact being that many organizations have such complex dependency tree, look at the S-BOM movement, that it's very, very difficult to uh, uh, understand all the exposure points, and then it comes virally, so it gets uh, inf uh, 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 infectious in this way, it's just something that some people, just, some organizations just prefer to avoid. That's about the, the license uh, hygiene. And about contributing back, that's, that's a tricky point. Each organization and each business needs to decide where it draws the line between the part that is common enough for the organization to contribute back and the part that is a differentiation that they want to keep inside. And they want the, the freedom to choose where to draw the line per the organization's uh, uh, business plan, incentives, and strategy. When you have this uh, uh, infectious element that uh, uh, becomes a risk because it takes some of that decision away from you. So I think that the, uh, the aspect of uh, not contributing back sounds bad and I think as I said Google is a great example of a company that does contribute back but some things that they want to keep their own to be the billable uh, paid service they need to be able to have the, free, the business choice uh, in their hands. Uh, I hope that I answered for you, and we need to uh, wrap up, sorry, but I'm, I'm, I'll be here and I'll be glad to take more questions. Uh, so I'm Dotan Horvitz, 
Thank you very much, and may the open source be with you. Okay, just a quick thing. Uh, thank you once again for Dotan. Sorry to ask you the hard questions. We let this go a little bit long. Uh, just, just check your schedules because there wasn't in a, a talk until 2.50. Uh, this is for you, by the way. Thank you. You still got the chocolate. And uh, <laughs> just to let you know, we have who's been at uh, Config Management Camp before and who has not. So there's a surprise. Uh, Chris and Toshan and all of us have. Yeah. We have actually purchased a whole waffle truck that will make outside here fresh waffles for you. Uh, so, uh, so it's going to be starting in about uh, 20, 30 minutes or so. So there's going to be a huge line for sure, but go grab a fresh waffle. Try and have just one waffle before you have your fourth waffle. Um, and try to go to the talks as well. This isn't WaffleCon. But uh, it's one of my favorite things, and we just squeezed in some budget to have it again. So uh, if you want to sponsor next year so we can have more waffles, please do tell people. And, uh, and what? Oh, we can handle the waffles. Waffles to the people! Yeah. So uh, once more, thank you for Dotan. Everyone, loud applause. They can, but you I think one year I have.
I mean, I, I was told that I would get an announcement, but I can also just start, I guess. <laughs> Yeah, so I'm gonna start now because I was supposed to finish by now. Um, yeah, I'm very happy to see you all here, uh, even though there's a waffle truck outside and nobody jumped ship from you. So yeah, my talk today is gonna be about how to maintain a, a diverse team. And it's a very, very broad subject and I just wanna share my personal perspective and give you some keywords to improve yourselves and maybe your organization a little bit. And yeah, so let's hop in. Who am I? Um, my name is Foy Murek, my pronouns are they, them, and I work as a development advocate for a singer. We come from Germany, we've got a stand over at the main hall if you want to come and visit us. And I'm very passionate about teaching, about accessibility, inclusiveness, and old cars because old cars are cool. Um, yeah, that's my Twitter handle. You'll also find it somewhere in the corner here. Um, so my perspective is very much the one of a privileged white person. Even though I'm queer, I'm from the centre of Europe. So take it with a grain of salt. And I just want to give you some starting points on how to improve yourself. And first we're going to define what diversity means. Because everyone has heard of it, but what is diversity exactly? So I squished down a few different uh, definitions that I found from Wikipedia and from Merriam-Webster. And I think the essence of it is the presence of a wide range of differences amongst people. So where people come together, there are going to be certain differences. And I'm going to categorize it into three different kinds. And the first one is internal diversity. Internal diversity is basically what everyone is born with or a situation they are born into. And that is something you don't choose for yourself and that's not something that you are able to change by yourself. That could be ethnicity, that could be your age or the year that you were born, your national origin, your sexual orientation, your identity, your assigned sex, your mental ability or any kind of neurodiversi neurodiversity you have or disabilities you have. There's external diversity, which is something that you're not necessarily born with, and those can be aspects of a person that can change and often change over time. Could be personal interests, could be the kind of education that you received, your appearance, your citizenship, your location that you're based at, your familial status, all the kind of stuff that does affect you that might change and on top of that, which kind of relates to it, is professional diversity. This is the kind of, um, yeah, the kind of aspects that you have that, re re the, the kind of aspects about yourself that relate to your work. And those can and will change quite frequently for a lot of us. So it could be the kind of education you received in perspective to your job, um, any conferences you visited and knowledge you got from there, your job function, your job title, how much money you make, if you have any people that work for you, if you are a person that works for someone else. And those things all play into the kind of worldview world you have. So the worldview is basically yeah, an amalgamation of the different kinds of diversity, the different kinds of aspects you have within yourselves. And a worldview is basically the kind of core principles that you hold, the views, that you build for yourself through your life. And those will naturally change over time. When you're a child, you have a very different worldview than what you have now. And those different worldviews that make up our teams are very different for every single person. Could be your political beliefs, your moral compass, your outlook in life. So now that we've kind of had a look at what kind of diversity I'm talking about, we want to look at the goals that we want to try to work for if we, want to go, if we are going to work together in a diverse team. And the first one is collaboration. And collaboration is a thing that can be, of course, achieved in a very 
samey, samey team. But it's a lot better if you have different people working together because it makes it a lot more easy to identify or solve challenges if you have different people from different parts of life looking at it. A good example that I found in my personal life or in my work life was toilet signs. So our company moved to a different office, a new office, and there was a team of architects that decided, okay, we're going to have a few different toilets across the office, and we also want gender-neutral toilets. But what are the signs going to be on the door? So, of course, we have a little person with a dress for the women's toilet. We have a little person with pants on for the men's toilet. But what are we going to do for the gender-neutral toilet? A person with half a dress? I mean, I don't look like I have half a dress on. And most other people don't really identify with half-half either. Then there's this thing I found on the internet, which is an absolute abomination. Um, Yes, very inclusive of everything, but I'm also not a mer person, I'm also not an alien. So, my boss approached me and was like, hey, Foy, you're a bit more into this kind of stuff, you know a bit about, you know, gender neutrality. What do you think, what could we use? So I suggested a very simple solution. Toilet. Um, and that's something a team of, well, binary people men and women didn't come up with because it's so far out of their comfort zone. And of course my perspective is the one of gender, which is where I'm most diverse at. But there are many, many other problems that you might never think of a solution that a team member from a different background could and would think of. Inclusiveness is another goal that I think we could all work towards. And inclusiveness in this sense means that everyone comes to work or comes into their group and feels included and loved for who they are. That they can be their true self and don't have to hide anything. Because the place I worked at before, I always had to hide certain aspects of myself, dress a certain way, because there was a dress code for men and women, and I had to wear like a pretty shirt, and I really felt uncomfortable all the way, kept thinking about my appearance, and that really took away from my productivity and my happiness. Employee satisfaction is something that naturally occurs out of inclusivity, but it also strengthens your bond with your company or the thing that, yeah, the organization you work for. And having a positive and inclusive work environment is something that we should all strive for, and that includes all people from all walks of life. And from a more business perspective, it also results in the goal of external representation. So we have a whole lot of different people that look different ways and rep representing a balance of diversity in your organization also means that you get to hire new people that you might not have hired before. A woman, woman might not want to apply to an all cis, white, male, old team. And through hiring those diverse people you also get people that are more open-minded. If Someone who doesn't want to be in a diverse team, they will not apply there, and the people that will might fit in a lot better. The challenges of having a diverse team might not be fully solvable in all ways, but we can try and make steps to minimize the impact they have on our way of working. Communication is a big challenge, and especially when it comes to teams that have people from different languages and backgrounds, where you have a language barrier or a cultural barrier, where you might talk, think you talk about the same thing, but there's something very different in the background. In our marketing team, we have a lot of different people that speak different languages. We get all agreed to speak English in our meetings, but everyone struggles a little bit with it. So um, those kind of conversations are definitely difficult to, to start. Unconscious bias is a challenge that lives in every one of us. And unconscious biases are basically ways of thinking that we have within ourselves that we don't even realize that are unconscious. Things that we've learned or picked up when we grew up. Some blatant racism that we don't even realize is racism because it just lives in the back of our minds and influences the way that we are thinking without us even noticing. Systemic 
discrimination is something that is also very present in a lot of different societies nowadays. I would say all of them. And it makes it difficult for marginalized people because they do not have the same kind of opportunities that others might have. And even though we as a team might be inclusive and make them feel welcomed, there are still a lot of things that might go on in their homes that affects them in different ways that we might not even notice. And change management is also a very difficult point when it comes to a standing team, a long-standing team, and suddenly a new person comes in that is very fundamentally different than the people that are already working there. And you might be met with resistance to those kind of changes. I know that making changes in the language and the way you speak about or to people is something that you've practiced since you were this small, and those kind of changes to make in a more advanced age, let's say it that way, are going to be a lot more difficult than when you were still learning the language. So I've showed you some challenges. I want to show you or give you some hints on what to research to better yourself as an individual. And it's not wrong to ask questions. A lot of people are afraid to ask me questions about the topics that I'm very passionate about because they are afraid of offending me in some way. And I can pretty much sense if someone asks a question with mean intentions or actual curiosity. And it's always okay if you ask questions when they come from a place of general, like genuine curiosity. I will always be happy to answer you. This goes for me, but this doesn't go for everyone. Some people might not want to talk about their background or their marginalization, their disabilities, because for a lot of people, it comes with a lot of trauma they have been going through, through their socialization. So if you ask a question and someone is not comfortable talking about it, please don't try to pressure them into speaking about what is different about them, because that might lead to some serious issues within the person and with their psyche. What's a good way to learn about people or learn about different groups is to actually listen to creators, be it on TikTok, be it on Instagram or any other kind of social media or blogging platform. Because those are the people that are willingly putting in the labor of informing you about their world and their views. So it's probably the easiest if you just go up to a colleague and ask them, but for that colleague, they get asked this same question for the 300th time. And there are so many good resources that you can look up and listen to the people, because I could never tell you anything about how people of color are discriminated against. It's not something that I experience or could tell you about. But there are so, so many good resources to look up. And if you get asked the question, maybe you're from a marginalized group in some way, probably are. Um, it's easiest if you assume the question comes from good intentions. Like even if I get asked a question that is pointed, if people are trying to actively offend me, what I do is I will just answer the question in a way where I assume good intentions. Because in the worst case, I'm a kind person that answers their questions and they are not. From talking about what you can do as an individual, I also want to step into the zone of what can we do as an organization? How can we, because I would assume that all of us work in some sort of team, in some sort of organization, be it in private or in a professional sense. And we can also influence the people that have a say in that and help people learn about the past. Because there has been a lot of historical discrimination against different groups of people. And by historical, I also mean things that happened just five or ten years ago that might not be the case now, but a lot of people were affected by decisions by the state or by certain rules that have been made up by the government. And there is a lot of work for us to do to undo those lingering impacts that still affect people today. What helps for people that might not be as extroverted and just come up to someone and say, hey, 
You just said something that was not okay. People that are not comfortable stepping out of their comfort zone and actually actively calling people out for something they said is having regular check-ins. So if you have a supervisor and you've noticed something happening in your team and you didn't want to start a confrontation, it is good if you have just regular check-ins made on a weekly, a monthly, or a quarter yearly basis to just have an open space to talk about anything that bothers you or anything that you've seen or was on your mind. This makes it possible for people that might not be comfortable sharing it in a group to still share their experiences. A thing that we also do in our company that I find very, very helpful is that there is an open space and a time for us to talk about what interests us. It doesn't have to be work-related necessarily. And we can just tell people about topics we're passionate about. I more or less yearly talk about diversity, talk about how people um, yeah, have reacted to me, have reacted to me coming out, and lay out my personal history. It's not something everyone might want to do, but it's definitely a cool way to share your experience with a broad group of people, avoid getting asked the same question a thousand times, and educate people on things and topics that you're passionate about and might affect you that they never thought of. This also comes into an accessibility um, standpoint, where I did a lot of work to add a theme that helps colorblind or color vision deficiency people deficient people to use our monitoring system, which is green for OK, yellow for warning, and red for critical. If you might have noticed thinking about it, that's rather difficult for someone who is colorblind to use. And that is not something that, I mean, I've seen some surprise nods just now. That's not something that a seeing or normal seeing person thinks of. So give people the time and space to speak about their experience and Maybe also do it in a like, paid sector weekly, where people can just can present whatever um, interests them. Another very important topic in the realm of workplace and also conferences is having clear policies on what is allowed and what isn't. Because looking back at internalized biases and things that we do subconsciously, we might not even think something is racist or discriminatory, well, it might very well be. So having those clear policies laid out, having all people that work together informed on what is OK to say and what is definitely not, um, might help people who didn't even realize something they said was wrong or might be taken in a wrong way, um, Yeah, to figure it out and reflect on it by themselves. And of course, those policies do nothing if you don't enforce them. So it is important to also establish a system, establish consequences that are directly linked to those clear policies that we've made. In a conference that might be, we can kick you out if you do something stupid at a moment's notice from a staff member's perspective. But in a business environment, that could mean something very differently. It could mean additional training in diversity, in those topics that you misstepped in, or it could also be just a meeting that you hold up with people that have been damaged and the people that did the damaging. Um, and there is also the point of generally offering trainings to make people more aware of the differences that we might have and provide education on topics like unconscious bias, on cultural competency, because things that I might think or might take for granted might not have been the same for a person that comes from a different continent, from a different culture than me. And also, when it comes to microaggressions, it's also a topic there are a lot of trainings on and yeah, extensive YouTube videos that might be interesting for a team to view together and maybe have an exchange afterwards. So. Those trainings might help your team to become more aware of what is going on around them. And the last point that you can do as an organization is actually get professional help. There are a lot of different jobs that center around inclusivity and diversity. 
Um, the main one that comes to mind is the diversity coordinator, which is a field that is increasingly growing, where people that might work in an all-white team need someone to actually help them put up the structures that make other people or people of color comfortable applying and joining the team. And to sum it all up, someone very smart <laughs> made a comment. And I think it's a very bold statement that I made, but I think it's very, very true. Because if you think about it, pretty much all conflict can be traced back to a mismatch in expectations you have. Your expectations come from within you, from your upbringing, and from your worldview. And I can't think of a single conflict in the world that didn't come back to, I thought this was true, this was right, and a person thought something differently. So I don't want to hold you back from the waffles for much longer. I would just want to summarize really quickly Listen to other people when they speak, hear what they have to say, ask questions in an interested and curious way, and do your best to become a better person. Thank you very much. So I still don't see anyone from the organizers here, so I'm just going to pretend I'm running a one-man show. Do you have any questions for me? Well, in case you can think of something later, you can find me over at the Isinga booth in the, well, main conference break room thing. Uh, we also have gin and tonic served freshly for you right after my talk, so feel free to grab a waffle and join me there. Thank you very much.
Hey everyone, uh, this is a talk about our journey from configuration management to security of IT systems. So, this is a feedback of what we did at Radar. Uh, Radar is a config management software. And um, we will present how we kind of switched from a pure automation and configuration management software to improving security uh, posture of systems. It will start with a brief history of Rudder, what it was, uh, the different turning points in our history, and the challenge we faced. And we'll conclude with what are the next step for us, the logical evolution after that. This journey does no, does, doesn't contain any monster, except maybe a strong French accent. As you heard, I'm French. And Oh, there should be an introduction slide that I lost. So I'm Nicolas Charles, I'm a co-founder of Rudder. Uh, I'm French, as you heard. I'm a technical guy, and uh, I've been there since the inception of Rudder. So Rudder is an open source configuration software that we've started in 2011, so it's quite old now. And the main focus was make it make configuration management easy. I don't know if you remember the old time of configuration management, uh, 2011, uh, learning a language that was constantly moving or changing, passing the output to see what was, uh, what was happening. Um, it was fairly complex, to be honest. Teams with, with more than one people knowing how to use config management were very uncommon and even team with config management were in common. So our m principal goal was to make it more easy, to have more people uh, having benefits from configuration management. We wanted also to make visible what the agents or what the config management software was doing, to see what was happening and so to have a measure of the difference between the actual state and the desired state of the systems. And with a tight feed feedback loop. So we do a change and we have a quick-ish answer to see what was changed and what happened. And so at this time, we, our motto was configuration management for the masses. Our goal is really, we are really to have most people been using config management in yeah. any different way. You have to uh, speak a little bit more into the mic, I think. Okay, is it better like that? I don't know. Try, try really close to the mic. Is it better mm -hmm. like that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, sorry. Yeah. Okay. Excuse me. So the, our goal was really to make configuration management easy so that everybody in, uh, in, in team, in IT team, could benefit from that. Like people knowing how to manage a service would be able to create the configuration with Rudder, and people not knowing how to manage the service or not knowing how to use config management would still be able to see what's happening, to have feedback, to have a, an overview of everything and even have junior people, uh, interns or, or people uh, very new to IT, be able to extract and get knowledge from the system. We have a full inventory, we, had a f we still have a full inventory of the system. We have a way of grouping them, so people not knowing how to configure would still be able to, um, we're well still and are still able to define how to group together the system to make sense for the infrastructure. So you have people from asset management you, uh, who would benefit from that. People from security as well. You can extract information from the, from the software for security. And so Rudder was, was chosen by the users for, its, for compliance. So having the feedback, knowing what's happening. And it's ease of use. We had people really looking at the software and say, I want that. I don't want to type code. I don't want to have people in my team needing to write code. 
And it was used for, to configure system, obviously. It's configuration management. Some people also used it for the inventory because they didn't have any asset management. They did their own asset management with Rudder to audit the systems, so to make it easy to have uh, their own audit uh, because they, are, they had auditors that were very unhappy with the state of their system for hardening and to make visible what was hidden. Some, some of our users were used to have a configuration management system and they were sure that it was working correctly and that everything was correctly configured, but they were simply not looking correctly at their logs and they discovered afterwards that not, uh, a lot of things were not correctly configured or not compliant to what they wanted. And our user asked for many features. The most asked feature from uh, our community was first the audit mode. So be able to run the, the system without doing any change, no remediation. They wanted built-in hardening, like CIS. So the audit mode, we did it. The built-in hardening, it's a bit harder. OpenSCAP integration, so automatically run OpenSCAP, uh, check the OpenSCAP profile on the system. CVU detection to, de to view the vulnerability and patch management. I'm pretty sure you all see a pattern in that. It's more security than uh, automation. And meanwhile, something happened in the configuration management landscape. As a reminder, Rudder started in 2011 when config management was still not a solved problem and Ansible happened. And by basically every configuration management became Ansible, or it's like the definition of config management and automation. It also meant that we had a difficult market fit for Rudder. We cannot present Rudder as infrastructure as code because it's very uncommon to write code using Rudder. Everything is made through the API or through the web interface. You can write code, but you really need to be willing to do that. But we are not a no-code solution either. It's not plug and play. You have to configure something in it. You have to include your rules. So we are in, in between. Our users didn't really benefit from what uh, Rudder offered most. We offered PDF export of compliance, but really, sysadmin do need PDF export? No, not really. And clicking to configure system, who does that Ex except the Windows user? Not, not much like that, really. So it was a time of difficulty for us. But the context changed. We had a lot of interest in security in the world. Uh, some international norms like CIS, some benchmarks. Uh, in France, we had a lot of pedagogy, pedagogy from secu uh, the ANSI. Uh, I don't really know how to translate that, but that's a national agency for security of inf uh, information system which goes over companies and tells them, you should work like that, you should improve your security. They publish white paper uh, yearly and explain how things should be configured. And um, some companies are forced to follow this standard. And there are the malwares and all the ransomwares and everything. And it's no longer a question of, will we be attacked, but when will we be attacked? So security has become a key point for most companies, uh, most, uh, and not only companies, associations also, or private users. So it was time for a change at Rudder. And we, we were asking ourselves, what's the purpose of Rudder? What, what's the future of that? It's at this time that a new CEO stepped in in Rudder with a cybersecurity mindset. He came from the cybersecurity world. He was doing PRA and stuff like that uh, in security company before. 
and rather as a good fit for security. It shows what's happening. It exposes information. We have an agent that runs every five minutes that checks the status of the systems every five minutes. So it's in continuous. It can, it's not instantaneous, but it's fairly fast. It measures the compliance built-in of system. And so the change for Rudder becomes that our goal is to provide a way for our users to prove their compliance and to improve their security posture. So that's, that's not exactly not our motto, but that's our main goal. So we need to change a product to move from pure config management to something around offering benefits for security. How can we do that? And especially, how can we do that without messing with the existing users, not breaking everything, not breaking the product of what has some value in the product, and not making it uh, look like we were buying something else and wrapping it around rather to, to put a new feature in the software. So what we chose as an approach was to do some small changes in the product. Uh, each version, we in added new features and we made them discoverable. I'm sorry, I'm French. Uh, so we so we use the product led product led growth. So here we here in the menu we introduced patch management and security management, so that user can see discover that we have new features and they don't break the usual user experience. If users don't want to look at them, they can simply skip them and use Rudder as they did before. And so we change also the way we speak of the product. And now what we want of Rudder is that system administrators, cloud users, security teams in charge of hardening will excel at their work using Rudder. Continuous hardening, control, audit of the security posture, application of security standard recommendation, patch management application will be fulfilled with Rudder. A lot of words. And there. There are many ways in which infrastructure automation tooling can be used to support an organization's IT objective. Do anybody here recognize this text? No. Okay. We are not the only one doing this change. It's come from Puppet. And it's really, really similar to the way we present it. We are not the only one doing this change to security. Most tools are including security features and are based on continuous automation, continuous compliance, patch management. That's, that's an expected move now that configuration management exists and is very common. So how did our users react to our change? They were fairly happy, to be, uh, to be honest. They were not ecstatic, but they were really happy that we moved to the security and that we make uh, rather usable by more people in their team. And also, it let them either reduce the number of software in their stack, so they, they can drop some software if they were using, doing basic patch management of some, or vulnerability management, or it allows them to integrate with other tools of the stack more uh, better, to export data in their SOC, for instance. Some new users were confused by this uh, way of presenting stuff, because we are saying we do security, but we are not a pure security software. We are config management and security. So some users tell us, but you're doing patch management. Why can't, I, can't you fetch from the repository of every software in the world that uh, this software is outdated? Because we are doing config management and not really pure patch management. So some expectations were not always met by uh, the new, for the new users. And we, were, we sometimes speak to users for security who don't understand what is config management, which is surprising, but some security teams are very far away from the world of config management, and when we 
tell them you can configure things, they say, oh, no, 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 you won't configure things. So now, what's the next step? Where do we go from there? We plan to make Rudder a single source of compliance for those who would like, and to incorporate compliance from other resources. First, we'll uh, include Ansible as a source of compliance, so run the playbook and get the output to be able to measure the compliance of the system. We plan to integrate with other tools, uh, main, probably SysDick and OpenSCAP, but it could be other tools. And we especially want to increase the value of configuration management by using data. We have a lot of information in Rudder about everything that's managed. We want to put this data in perspective and give meaning to it. So gather data from external sources, aggregate them, and change the configuration first approach we have to have something more global for compliance like be able to, to ask questions and the answer of which nodes are impacted by this specific vulnerability. Which are the nodes in this data center that's not behaving perfectly well? I have compliance issues for this node. What are the other nodes like that we, who have also compliance issues similar? How can we do that? We have the full inventory of nodes. We have a way of grouping nodes, thanks to the groups. We have the list of all the policy applied on systems. We have the compliance of the systems that are managed. And we can gather information from external data, from CMDB, from REST APIs, etc. So we need to aggregate all this information and have a structured API to query in a similar way every aspect of data that are stored in Rudder. So the nodes, nodes are systems that are managed by Rudder, the groups, the parameters applied on the system, the techniques, techniques are a bit like the playbook in the Ansible world, directive rules, the compliance, the available updates, the patch management campaign that has been run to upgrade the systems, all the applicable CVs, external resources, and probably others that we don't know yet. We want it to be pluggable and extensible because there are many things that we don't know yet. And fast enough, so that we don't have to wait two hours to get a result like in some uh, OLAP group, a uh, cube. Easy to maintain for the users to make sense of, uh, out of it. And GraphQL seems to be the proper solution for that. So GraphQL is an open source uh, query language that has been uh, released, uh, open sourced in 2018, that lets you aggregate data from different backend and make graph queries out of that. And so we will include in Rudder a compliance browser that will query every backend available and external backends mm -hmm. to extract information and give sense of the data, uh, to the data. Some side topics. Um, we are moving to security, so we need to secure our software also. So there are two very great talks about how to, uh, to secure our software and the supply chain. Uh, one was one hour ago, securing the software supply chain for infra management tool. And one was yesterday, how do we make Rudder secure? So we need, um, since Rudder has a sig significant impact on the infrastructure, it runs as root, it manages system, it contains all the information on every system managed by it and what you do. It talks on the data, so it exposes information. It's a complex software. We have many, many different languages included. We have Scala, we have F Sharp for Windows, we have Perl, Python, etc., and several levels of abstraction. So we need to have security as a first class citizen in the product roadmap. So we can't leave any uh, CVE or vulnerability in our software or in any of our libraries. So we've been working a lot on the front-end side 
to ensure that no one could inject things within Rudder, either from a corrupted node or from the web interface itself, or from the API. So proper section expiration, XSS hardening, CSRF, etc., etc. We included a package manager for every dependencies in uh, uh, JavaScript and CSS to make sure that they were free of any vulnerabilities. We secured our building pipeline, so with hardening option for co at compilation times, we have a server dedicated to signature for the, so uh, the source code. Uh, we have vulnerability detection in the code and in the libraries, and it's mostly automated. And on the backend side, uh, we have sandboxes policies from for uh, all our services. And we plan to remove uh, the services running as root that listen on the service so that they will run with lower privileged users. Built in two factor authenti authentication, TLS 1.3. We do regular training for the development team on how to ensure we keep the security of our system. And we do systematic security assessment of every change. So every time we add a new feature, every time there is a pull request that change something significant, we do a security assessment of this change. And we have also users or customers, really, doing pen test of Rudder. So they regularly check the security of the software and they share the results from us. So. The evolution from uh, configuration management to security, actually it's quite natural change. It's a logical evolution of Rudder, and it's a logical evolution for every other config management system. Continuous compliance, configuration are building block to add value to the team. Do you have any questions? Yes? Can you say that again? Uh, for your notes, uh, for you and uh, all the tools, do you also uh, support containers? Do I like support? Or like uh, Containers, you said? Yeah. Ah, so the question is, do we support containers for the nodes managed? Um, <coughs> we have a system with an agent running. On the, so every system are managed using an agent. It doesn't make more sense to put an agent in a container. Uh, Uh, so we could put the policies within the container, but it's really not a Docker way to do that. Okay. It's probably better to, to kill the container and restart it with newer version of the configuration. Or did I not understand the question? No, well, if you're talking about security posture of software, then a lot of software that runs in containers is also just as important as... Okay. So, okay, so for the security of software running into containers, it's probably better to use things that will um, look from the outside at the container to check the security or to check at build time uh, the content of the, se of the container so that you know what's inside and uh, detect from what you know from the build time or the creation time of the container what's inside and destroy it when necessary. No, it's not not yet something Rudder will solve. Probably in the future, but not for the moment. Any other questions? Thank you, everyone.
Hello everyone. Hello. Hey. <laughs> so, uh, it's nice to be here. It's been what three years since uh, we were both together in this place, so it's good to be back in this place. So uh, today I want to talk about eBPF in a talk called uh, eBPF Superpowers. And this, this is the agenda for this talk. So eBPF, I'm going to talk about principles. Then I'll talk about uh, different ways to apply eBPF and how it makes it different, innovative, or uh, adds functionalities that don't exist uh, at the core in the Linux kernel in the terms of observability, networking, security. We'll talk about the future, where eBPF is going and where that could take us in terms of the Linux kernel and OS. And I'll talk about, about the practical labs that you can do on different uh, products based on eBPF. So first, let's talk about the Linux kernel. The Linux kernel, well, pretty much all of us here working with the Linux kernel know there's some exceptions of people that try to automate Windows, you know, and use some products to automate Windows, but most of us will agree uh, our job is based essentially on the fact that Linux has become the prominent OS uh, on the web and in many places. So it's now the main OS from cars to uh, servers to fridges, uh, it's the foundation of the GNU Linux operating system, obviously, that we love and use everywhere. Uh, it's the most widely used operating system in the world at the moment. And uh, it actually pow powers the vast majority now of embedded systems, of cloud servers, of uh, supercomputers, so it's pretty much everywhere. But the Linux kernel still keeps evolving. And there's new features that are necessary, and especially when we start talking about like cloud native infrastructure, uh, containers, container automation, Kubernetes, for example, there's features that could get uh, improved, new versions, new uh, technology in terms of SDN, in terms of security, and implementing these new features at the kernel level has a cost. And so a few years ago, some people got together to think, how do we make kernel development more agile? How do we make it so that we can keep adding these features for SDN, for security, and so on, without having a huge, uh, very long and complex life cycle. So before eBPF, as you can tell, the problem is, okay, I want this new feature to observe my app, for example, or to add new uh, networking uh, capabilities to Linux. And well, I can make a patch to the Linux kernel, uh, send it, I haven't done it myself, I'm not a Linux developer, but it takes a very long time to get accepted. And even once it gets accepted, it will take a very long time until it actually ends up in a distribution where you can use it uh, in a stable way, right? So probably three years, five years at best until you can actually find your patch in a Linux distribution. And the world, especially the world of cloud native uh, environments, is not evolving at this pace. It's actually going much faster. So we want these features to get into the kernel much faster than that. So with eBPF, what's possible is actually extending the Linux kernel in a much faster way. You can actually inject features in the Linux kernel without recompiling, without even rebooting your machine. 
you can extend the functionalities of the Linux kernel at runtime. You'll say, well, okay, this is not too far from what I could do with a kernel module, for example. But as you'll see, there's a lot of advantages of using eBPF versus kernel modules in terms of security, in terms of stability. So who has used eBPF before? Oh, a few hands. Well, chances are you've actually probably used it without knowing it, right? <laughs> eBPF is used in a lot of places. Um, for example, Facebook uses it for load balancing. Uh, a lot of other uh, cloud providers actually use it for load balancing using XDP with eBPF. Um, it's used for DDoS protection on a lot of cloud platforms as well. Again, using XDP to uh, remove packets that are not wanted and prevent them from actually getting too deep in the kernel. Um, it's actually used for kernel live patching as well. And if you use Android, you've actually probably used eBPF if you've, if you've looked at how your applications are using the bandwidth because this is the way it's done. It actually uses eBPF in the Linux kernel that's provided in Android to tell you which applications are using your bandwidth. So, a bit of presentation. This is, this is me. Uh, people that uh, have been coming for a few years uh, to config management may have known me for presenting on Puppet and Terraform in the past. I'm not doing this anymore. So now I'm working for Isovalent on Cilium. And today I'm going to be talking about eBPF and telling you about how it works, not in details, uh, and what, uh, what are some uh, usages of eBPF. So first, what is it? What is eBPF? One way to look at it is that eBPF makes the kernel programmable at runtime, and it's similar to what JavaScript is to the browser. If you remember, using a web browser without JavaScript, you had pretty much static pages and nothing could be done with them except changing pages. With the addition of, of JavaScript, we can have applications such as Gmail, Google Maps, and other applications not made by Google, right? Because all my examples are from Google. Um, but essentially, it makes the, uh, uh, JavaScript makes the browser programmable, and you can add new functionalities that were not planned in web pages or generally. So in the same way, you can consider that lin the Linux kernel is essentially an event-driven program. It doesn't do much, if not anything at all, on its own. It just reacts to events from the outside, events from uh, the hardware or events from user space. And it makes the link between user space and hardware, essentially. And so because it's based on events, it makes a lot of sense to have a system that is based on events and will allow you to add callbacks to these events. And this is what eBPF is. So eBPF allows you to add programs to different events in the kernel. This is an example using the execv syscall, where whenever this, the execv syscall is called, so to uh, start a new process, it will be called by eBPF, by the eBPF subsystem, and you can add a program that will be triggered. And this program uh, can do a lot of different things. In this case, it will capture the comment that has been executed with its arguments and store it and a data structure that is called an eBPF map, so that it can be used, for example, for observability. So you get really low level, really low latency observability directly plugged to kernel events. So this is the principle. eBPF was founded about 10 years ago, uh, and the uh, eBPF Foundation manages the technology in the Linux kernel and was co-founded by Facebook, Google, Isovel, and Microsoft, and Netflix. There's more people that have been added since then. These are just the founding members that manage maintaining the technology in the Linux kernel. Technology is still evolving, right? Because there's still uh, additional features that are added to eBPF to make more events available or more helpers, I'll talk about this, available to program eBPF uh, functionalities. So how does it work? Let's see how it works. Let's say I have uh, a process. It could be uh, the Cilium agent, it could be something else. This process will generate an eBPF program in uh, bytecode. So usually, am I using the mic properly? Yep. <laughs> usually, uh, these programs are written in a subset of C and then compiled into eBPF bytecode. And this eBPF bytecode program can then be injected into the Linux kernel using the BPF syscall. The first thing that happens when you do this is that the kernel will actually verify 
the program you've injected. And that's, that's a very important step. We like to verify it for complexity and for security reasons. So you cannot do as much using an eBPF program as you would be able to do using a kernel module, for example. There's a lot of security constraints and a lot of, of complexity constraints as well, so you're very unlikely to crash your system with an eBPF program or to add security problems, security issues. For example, memory management is very, very restricted in eBPF programs. So the kernel will first verify the program you're injecting. Once the program has been verified and approved, and I've heard eBPF developers, I'm not one myself, say that uh, one of the hardest part of their job is actually to convince the kernel that they do not mean to harm it. That tells you how the, 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 um, the verifier is hindering the possibilities of actually harming the system. So once the program has been approved, it can get compiled using a JIT compiler. It can be compiled to uh, native code, to machine code on your system, so it becomes essentially just as performant as the kernel itself. And it becomes part of the kernel, and you can actually call it by attaching it to different events in a kernel. It can be a syscall, it can be events that are linked to networking interfaces, to drivers, to lots of different things. So when these events happen, your program will be triggered, and you can decide what to do with these events. So then, the things happen, right? There's a program, the process in user space that actually starts using the syscalls. Here we've attached our program to the send message and receive message syscalls. So the eBPF program will be called and can react to it. It can be to observe. It can be to actually do something with the kernel. It can be to, in the case of networking, bypass some stacks in the kernel like IP tables. In the case of security, it can be to block processes and so on and so forth. Like I said, a lot of things cannot be done at very low level in eBPF. You cannot do memory management manually. There's a lot of uh, subsystems in the kernel that you cannot call directly from eBPF. So eBPF provides helpers, actually, uh, to secure uh, all this stack, to make it so that you can actually achieve these things, but in a very sandboxed way. So for example, here you have a function called bpf get prandomu32, which returns a random number, a uh, random string, uh, no, it's a U32, so it's a number. Uh, and, uh, and this is a helper function, so you don't need to implement it yourself. It's been implemented already in the kernel, and you can use this functionality directly in your programs. You can attach programs to lots of different uh, hooks. Here are some examples. Here to the left, you could attach it to the syscalls, write and read, for example, in the case of files. Uh, you could attach it to file descriptor, to virtual file system, to the block device. There's been some great work that has been presented at eBPF Summit last year uh, on people working on Im uh, improving database performance by plugging eBPF directly under the driver. Uh, for example, they have this kind of database that keeps uh, doing uh, read um, loops, uh, seeking loops looking for information and going back and looking further for the information in the, uh, on disk. But the logic in which this loop is, is done depends on the data structure that is used to store the data on disk. And so this researcher has been using eBPF to uh, plug under the driver and actually do the seek loops uh, at the driver level so that it, it doesn't cross the kernel stack every time uh, the seek needs to be achieved. This is one example. Uh, in the case of Cilium, we typically use uh, the network stack. So uh, plug in either to send message and receive message, but we can also plug at the socket level, we can plug at the TCP IP level, and so on. You can actually even plug directly at the, net, at the, the network card device. Uh, this is what XDP allows to do, for example, to directly drop traffic using the network interface physically, so it doesn't even reach the kernel or even implementing load balancing using XDP so that it doesn't even use the internal kernel uh, stack for this. I'm a bit too close for this. <laughs> so, um, okay, so I can inject programs in a kernel, that's fine, but I need to retrieve information or to configure these programs from the outside, from user space, because not everything, not the whole logic is in the kernel. So how does this work? It works using structures that we call eBPF maps. And eBPF maps are accessible, they are part of the kernel, and they're accessible from within the eBPF programs and from user space as well. 
So they can be used either to program the way, to configure the way the programs run in the kernel, or they can be used to extradite data from the kernel stack to user space. So for example, in the case of observability, a program, an eBPF program that observes everything that is executed in a kernel will be able to write data to eBPF maps that then can be read by user space programs to turn it into Prometheus metrics, some flows, you know, whatever you want, JSON, uh, and so on. But you can also configure the way the programs work in the kernel by putting data from user space into eBPF maps. This is typically what Cilium does to configure the way network policies are applied, for example. So obviously, I've shown, you know, you can make your C program, compile it to bytecode, uh, attach it in the kernel. Very often, there's SDKs that are used for this, actually. So in development, usually, there will be a program that will be generated. Um, it will be compiled to bytecode. And then you can use an SDK. Typically, in Cilium, we use the Go SDK. Uh, this is the, the logo of the Go <laughs> uh, eBPF SDK. And this SDK will actually take the bytecode program, take the, the maps it's supposed to be attached to, the events it's supposed to be attached to, and do the whole plumbing in the kernel, uh, the whole system with the verifying, the JIT compiling, and so on, and attach it to the events for you. So eBPF is secure, is inherently more secure than writing kernel modules, because there is this uh, step of verification that makes sure that the program won't harm your system and won't crash your system. It's also, wrong button, it's also performance because once the program has been verified, it can be compiled to machine code, which means you get the same type of performance as the kernel itself. It just runs in, uh, in a virtual machine in the kernel. One benefit for us, especially when it comes to cloud native, is that eBPF programs can understand cloud native identities. When you think about networking, for example, the way networking is implemented in Kubernetes traditionally is by using IP tables. You just inject IP table rules, which essentially say, when you're coming from this IP, going from this ISP, this is how you do it. But IP, um, IP addresses are typically a very transient information that changes all the time in Kubernetes clusters. It's not something very reliable, and it's not something very useful when it comes to observability. So what we can do with eBPF is that we can have programs that actually are aware of the metadata we care about, are aware of the labels on Docker containers or Kubernetes pods, and can use these labels for traffic management or for network policy enforcement. They actually understand what's happening in terms of containers and in terms of uh, Kubernetes logic. In terms of observability as well, they can actually understand that a process is linked to a namespace, is linked to some C groups, is linked to a Kubernetes namespace, and so on, and can report this natively directly from the kernel. So you don't need to do that, um, that connection in user space anymore. So there's lots of projects that have started using eBPF, more and more of them. Cilium is one of them. Uh, BPF Trace, KTRAN is a project from Facebook uh, used as a load balancer. Uh, Falco for security, BCC. Uh, most of them depend on existing SDKs and will essentially generate programs, inject them into the kernel. What's really interesting is that, once again, these programs, once they're in the kernel, they're independent, right? So what Cilium does, for example, when it injects programs to manage routing or network policy, is very similar to what another CNI plugin would do when injecting IP tables. Once the rules are injected in the kernel, even if Cilium crashes, it keeps working, just the way that IP tables keeps working, right? It's just kernel code that is being executed. So I'll take a few examples from Cilium's friends, because that's the, the, the tools I know the best, and show you some of the features that, can, that we can benefit from uh, uh, using eBPF. So Cilium, for example, which can be used for performance gains, for example, compared to IP tables, which doesn't scale really well once you have a few hundred nodes in a Kubernetes cluster, uh, or bypassing TCP IP to re-implement it in the case of specific IPv6 functionalities, for example. You can have a simpler architecture. Talk a bit about uh, sidecars in the case of service mesh. Uh, Hubble is the, the tool that we use for uh, observability and gives very fine-grained network observability based on the data that we get from eBPF and the eBPF routing and observability layers. It can also export to various CMs. It can be uh, Grafana, it can be Elasticsearch, Splunk, and so on. I'll show you a few examples of the observability we can get, as well as tracing. 
and Tetragon, which is the runtime security, so node observability and security enforcement uh, based on plugin to kernel events. And it can actually be used to kill processes before they do harm. So let's start with observability. Observability is a very natural, logical place to go when you think of eBPF, right? Because you can plug to any event and observe what happens with this event. So it's logical to think I get very cheap, very low latency uh, uh, observability directly in the kernel. So what you can do is that you can observe directly with a very low overhead. Anything that happens, you just plug to the event you're interested in. For example, you can get network performance, SRTT microbursts in terms of performance. You can observe any network card and actually see the bandwidth. You can see all the packets that are being shared uh, that, are, that, that are going through this network interface. Uh, I'll show you some examples with TLS as well. Uh, you can even actually go all the way to HTTP in some cases, at least HTTP uh, 1, HTTP 2 is another story because it's a bit more complex to, uh, to actually parse. In eBPF, we can't do it at the moment. It might come in the future as eBPF is getting more complex. Um, you can use it to troubleshoot uh, production on the fly, for example, using BPF trace, because you'll be able to see things that happen everywhere in your system and plug to any event you're interested in. So there's lots of software that exists for observability, because again, this is one of the main uh, areas where eBPF developed. BCC is one of them. It's a collection of lots of scripts that uses eBPF and allow you to observe a lot of things in your system. BPF trace adds a little bit more uh, abstraction, so you can write little scripts and you can say whenever there's an exec v that uh, event that happens, I want to get the name of the comment and all the arguments or uh, other parameters. So it's very easy to write, very easy to get information directly from anything that happens in your system. And because it's eBPF, you don't need to relaunch the programs to get observability. It starts right away. As soon as there's uh, an event you're looking into that happens after you started observing, you'll see it. So you don't have the problems of, for example, using um, S-Trace in some cases or LD preload where you'd have to maybe reload a program to get observability in some cases. Um, Pixie is, is uh, an observability uh, pro, uh, program as well based on eBPF that is very advanced, as well as Cilium for the network and Cilium Tetragon. So if we look at, it, at BPF trace, for example, you typically have um, a language that you can use in CLI, and essentially you write a BPF trace program, which will get turned into a BPF program. This BPF program gets injected into the kernel and configured using eBPF maps, and the eBPF maps will be used to extradite information from the kernel whenever an event happens. So you can get that information directly. Um, Hubble is an observability uh, system that comes with, with Cilium, and it allows you to see network traffic. Now, what's really interesting here is the concept of linking the identities, the cloud-native identities, directly in the kernel. So when you extradite this information, you already have these identities. So here, what you have here looks very much like a TCP dump on steroid for cloud-native identities, because what you can see here is uh, an X-Wing Kubernetes pod making a request to Disney.com on port 443. And uh, you can see the identities and you can see all the back and forth information uh, uh, and communication. So the X-Wing is making a request to the DNS server in Kubernetes on port uh, 53. And you can see that it's being forwarded to the DNS proxy. Cilium has a DNS proxy that allows to keep the, to store the DNS answer so that it can later on uh, correlate it for network policies, for example, or observability. Then we see the answer from the DNS um, server to the X-Wing uh, pod. And then we see the actual uh, HTTPS communication. So the pod is calling Disney.com on 443. And we see that it's Disney.com because it was recorded by the DNS proxy. So we know the link between the IP that was returned and uh, Disney.com. And then here you see the whole uh, transaction. So sin, sin, ag, ag, fin, RST, there was some kind of uh, cut in the communication or maybe um, uh, bad routing at some point. Maybe some of this would be missing. You wouldn't get uh, uh, the uh, SYNAC, for example, and then the, the communication would be cut, right? So here you can actually see everything that's happening, the direction, the ports, and so on. You can get some details. This is a 
This is a, a summary view. And here at the bottom, we have an example of a network policy that is being denied. And you have the concepts of identities that uh, requested uh, the request, which identity it was destined to, and uh, the fact that it was dropped. And uh, Hubble, we can actually see why it was dropped, so which policy dropped it. And again, all this is computed at the kernel level in eBPF. There's a UI that's very similar, so you can build a service map based on this uh, with the same information. It just presents it differently with uh, the, the link and the communication between the different identities. Obviously, if you can get observability, you can get lots of metrics directly from the kernel. You can plug it to systems like Grafana, for example. I'll show you a few examples of what we can get from Grafana. You can get network metrics. And again, all these network metrics are uh, gotten directly from eBPF from the communication that happens at the kernel level. So you can get information of which traffic is being exchanged in the kernel, um, um, all the uh, traffic that is allowed versus dropped, the different flows, uh, the drop reasons, and so on. You can even get uh, HTTP information. In some cases, we can uh, parse HTTP traffic and actually use it to understand why traffic was dropped, what was the, the communication problem between two identities, between two pods, uh, or get uh, statistics uh, of um, how many uh, 500 answers you got, 500 replies you got from uh, a pod to another pod, for example. And then we can link it actually to the traces. Some of those traces can come from applications being instrumented using open telemetry, but other traces can also come directly from Hubble, from eBPF, from the kernel, because we're seeing the packets pass, because we can parse the HTTP uh, uh, traffic and extract the trace IDs, which allow us to correlate to the application information and traces. Another possibility is actually recording the, the network policy verdicts, uh, again, using eBPF, uh, because we see the traffic and you know which traffic has been allowed or has been um, uh, blocked. We can actually trace uh, this. Uh, I'll show an example tomorrow. If, if some of you are coming to the, the workshop tomorrow, uh, there is a lab that actually shows how to use this to monitor how your uh, namespace, Kubernetes namespace, is secured and how to set up a zero trust policy using this. An example of um, node security observability, uh, runtime security, um, using Tetragon would be to observe the, the traffic, the TLS traffic, and actually look at the versions of TLS and the options that are being used. So again, at the kernel level, we can see the TLS traffic. We can look at the different versions that are used. And again, this can be done for any uh, process and any network uh, connections that are done from the nodes. It doesn't have to be Kubernetes or pods that, that do it. It can be on the nodes themselves. And we can see all the traffic that comes from the different processes and actually trace them. The nice thing is we can link it to the metadata. So we can say it's actually this pod in this namespace hosted on this node that made this TLS connection using this version of TLS. So if you want to trace it back to, hey, this version of TLS shouldn't be used you can know exactly which process in which context has actually used it. And finally, we can actually bring all this together. So information coming from Tetragon, typically runtime observability, which are the processes being executed on the machine. What metadata are they associated to? Here we can see that this is uh, what is being executed in the crawler 696 and so on uh, pod in the tenant jobs namespace inside the Minikube's uh, um, cluster. And we see that some of these comments as they're being executed made network connections to other services. Some of them we might not like. There is some kind of reverse shell call that may or may not be an attack, right? It looks like one. You could see this. You could see this happening maybe with Hubble. But then getting back to actually which process in which pod in which namespace actually made that call is a little bit more complicated. So by linking information that we get from, um, from Cilium, from Hubble, on one side with information that we get from observing the processes using BPF, observing the, all the processes that are executed on the machine, we can actually link this and link it to the uh, metadata that are associated with the processes being executed. So that's observability. This is 
when it comes to networking, there's a lot of gain as well. So eBPF allows us to bypass native kernel network stacks. You can uh, use XDP, which, it, which stands for Ext Express Data Path, which allows to bypass some parts of the kernel. You can, like, for example, drop packets entirely. Uh, this is used for DDoS protection. Uh, if you see, I have an example here coming, so I'll wait for the example. Um, you can uh, improve TCP uh, before it actually uh, lands in your kernel. Um, you could add functionality such as NAT64, NAT46 for IPv6, um, implement performance load balancing algorithms directly in the kernel without the kernel actually natively supporting it, add support for network policies in the case of Kubernetes, uh, cluster mesh, egress gateway, um, sidecar free service mesh, and so on. I'll just show you a few examples of this. So XDP, Express Data Path, allows to drop or reroute packets before they reach the socket level in the kernel, before they get associated to a socket uh, buffer. So let's take an example of a packet of death. I don't know if some of you remember the packet of death vulnerability from a few years ago. Right? There was this packet, I think it was an ICMP packet, and whenever it reached uh, the, the machine, it would just uh, uh, crash. So we want to avoid this kind, this kind of behavior. We know what it looks like. Using an eBPF program, we can actually detect the packet of death before it gets associated to a socket buffer and actually drop it. So we can say with eBPF, this packet doesn't pass, it doesn't reach the kernel, it will not trigger the vulnerability in the kernel. Uh, another thing that can be done that quite a few cloud providers are doing, Facebook is doing with Ktrend, for example, and there's other possibilities. In Cilium, we have a maglev implementation of load balancing that can be used even outside of Kubernetes, is implementing very efficient load balancer um, implementations. There you go, I'm just with it. <laughs> uh, or, for example, using the socket load balancer, which we have in Cilium. The idea is this. Let's say you have a Kubernetes cluster and you have several pods, several containers, on one node. These containers traditionally will talk to each other using the, the TCP IP stack. They will go through IP tables and it will go back and forth between them as if they were on distant machines. This is not very efficient. Using eBPF, what we can do is that we can actually detect that these are actually two processes on the same kernel talking to each other. It's a bit stupid to go through TCP IP every time. So what we can do is actually bypass the TCP IP stack, bypass IP tables, and just say, let's create a socket and make them talk together uh, through a socket directly on the, on the kernel, because there are two processes on the same kernel. This is one example. It can go further than this. There's actually some, I'll just mention this, there's actually some uh, network cards that can be programmed using eBPF and XDP. Uh, Melanox is one uh, manufacturer, there's others. So there's, we have customers actually that actually use this to build specific load balancers using eBPF and XDP that are uh, extremely efficient and just bypass the kernel for load balancing. So what they get is pretty much the equivalent of an expensive appliance uh, for load balancing, but implemented using a VM plus eBPF, XDP, and a specific uh, programmable network card. A bit like what we do with GPUs in a way for graphics. Let's uh, talk about IP tables versus eBPF. This is a very important point when it comes to Kubernetes clusters and scaling. When you think of the way IP tables is used for services, and this is just one example, services can be used for other things, for network policies and so on, but let's just look at services in Kubernetes. The way uh, IP tables is used is essentially as a linear list or as a sieve. Uh, so if you have one service, in Kubernetes and multiple pods behind that service as backends, then let's say I have three pods, I'll have three rules uh, for the routing and the IP tables rules. All right? And the first rule will say in 33% of, of the cases, route to this pod. The second rule will say in 50% of the cases that are left, route to this one. And the last one will say in 100% of the left cases, go to this last pod. This is not very efficient because you need to go through all the rules to find the one that actually applies to you. And that's not even the main problem. The main problem is that whenever you add a new rule, which happens quite a bit in large Kubernetes clusters, you need to rewrite everything because that's how IP tables work. It's a global system. 
which means that if I have a cluster with a thousand nodes and I have a thousand services and a thousand pods in there, right, just giving examples, that means that every time there's a new pod, you need to rewrite thousands of rules on every node in your cluster. And given the complexity of, of doing this and the complexity of the, the, the IP table system itself, it means that at some point it will start taking a few seconds and a few minutes and a few hours uh, because the complexity is not in O to N, in O of N, it's in O of N to if I'm wrong, right? So this is not, it doesn't scale well, uh, and all the rules have to be replaced as a whole. On the other side, if you use eBPF-based uh, routing, what you can do is actually use a hash table per CPU that links directly the identities, the cloud-native identity based on labels, to the routing information. So whenever a packet comes, you can actually find directly which route it should take from one identity to the next without going through all the rules. So it's much more efficient. It scales linearly, which means that, in theory, you can have an infinity of nodes and it won't be a problem, in theory, right? I think we want to, there's people that tested up to like 5,000, 6,000 nodes and it was still fine. And the benefit is that you get cloud-native routing. So the observability you will get from this as well will take advantage of the metadata that are actually known at the kernel level for the routing. One uh, functionality that was pretty cool that was presented at KubeCon is the uh, integration of BBR. So BBR stands for uh, Bottleneck Bandwidth and Round Trip Propagation Time. And this is a replacement for the Cubic algorithm for TCP, TCP congestion uh, in Linux, the Cubic being the default uh, in Linux systems. And this is the way that uh, TCP connections are managed to uh, reach a proper transmission rate uh, between uh, in a whole network um, stream, right? Um, the, the tests are very interesting. Actually, Google, when they uh, made and communicated on BBR, said that they saw uh, 2,700 times improvement on some of their streams, on some of their throughputs, by implementing this algorithm. The, the example that we had at KubeCon last year actually showed pods that were typically streaming video and how by the time the video was finished streaming, when you use the cubic algorithm, lots of packets were lost, uh, but we're using BBR within a few uh, microseconds, the, the, the proper bandwidth was found and it optimized the, the traffic. So this is, this is very cool. And this is not supported in the Linux kernel, but it can be done at the kernel level using eBPF uh, and Cilium. Another thing that is not supported by the Linux kernel uh, traditionally is NAT4.6, NAT6.4. Uh, so transitions between IPv4 and IPv6 networks. What if I have a Kubernetes cluster that is running on IPv6, but running inside a network on IPv4? How do I do the transition? Well, with Selenium, we've implemented this using eBPF, so the routing still goes natively through the Linux kernel, and the Linux kernel can do the transition there's two options, either in a stateful way or in a stateless way, depending on how you want to manage the correlation of addresses between uh, the IPv4 and the IPv6 world. So again, features that do not exist yet in the Linux kernel um, and that would require appliances otherwise to get this level of performance can actually be implemented in the Linux kernel using eBPF by plugging to events and devices in the, in the kernel. Um, one last one for this, uh, for this part, for this um, kind of low network stack, is big TCP, the possibility of having uh, jumbo, um, jumbo gram extension headers in uh, IPv6 traffic to get bigger packets, which allows for much lower latency and much higher bandwidth. Maybe most of us are not really concerned. We're not having this limit of like 200 gigabytes per second. Uh, on, on our traffic, but uh, we have some customers that want really high throughput um, uh, data using IPv6, and they're limited by what the Linux kernel can do natively, and this removes this limit by actually implementing big TCP, which I think is now standard in the 519 kernel, but otherwise uh, did not exist before that, so we can actually implement this in much older kernels using eBPF. One thing that is more useful for a lot of us is this idea of doing service mesh with that sidecar. 
So traditionally, a lot of the service mesh implementations to this day is done by injecting sidecars, by injecting typically Envoy proxies in every pod uh, on your Kubernetes cluster. Uh, the idea here is that we have one Envoy proxy per node, and we're using eBPF to route through this proxy dynamically and configure the proxy dynamically. What we get from this, again, is a drastic simplification of the network stack because we can directly bypass all the, the TCP IP uh, communication between the, the pods and the proxies, and again, the proxy to the other uh, next proxy into the pod and so on. So if you have a lot of communication between pods and you add proxies to each of them, it can quickly become very complex, and this can be simplified here. Last but not least, security. <laughs> Security is also a very natural place for eBPF to be implemented. Why? Because, well, you get the observability of everything that happens in your OS. I wouldn't say for free, but for very cheap. And there are things that we want to do in terms of security, like blocking processes, that can be done much better using eBPF. So the traditional approach is when you want to observe processes being executed and decide if you want to allow them or not to continue. There's different approaches. One is using uh, LD preload or ap uh, application instrumentation, right? So application instrumentation, you need to actually modify your application code so you know that you're securing this application to be uh, observed and potentially blocked. LD preload is similar, except you will replace the standard library with an implementation that allows you to catch the syscalls. Again, that means you know in advance which processes you want to observe. It's pretty hard to do this on everything. Uh, you've got the P-trace, <coughs> sorry, a P-trace approach, which is great as well. There's a problem with the P-trace approach, which is the talk to, which is that um, when uh, a function is calling from user space, is calling the kernel, is making a syscall, it prepares the parameters to be passed to the kernel. This is what you usually detect that is going to happen. This is what you might want to block. But actually, at the moment when it calls, it can change the parameters at the last moment. And you might not be able to detect this. So this is one, one problem with this approach. Um, there's existing kernel runtime enforcement, essentially based on modules such as LSM, the Linux security module. Uh, and LSM actually got some eBPF uh, improvements in kernel 5.7. This is great but not everyone has a kernel 5.7. So one possibility also is to have your own kernel module, but there's problems in terms of stability and maintenance. Obviously, you need to convince people to use your kernel module, and a kernel module means that you might crash your machine or introduce new security issues in the system. So what we can do instead is we can typically use eBPF to monitor the different, uh, the different syscalls, the different events in the kernel, Again, that can be syscalls, that can be file access, that can be uh, uh, namescape escapes, that can be privilege escalation, links to C groups, for example, as well. It can be data access, it can be networking. And based on this, we can observe everything and we can actually uh, decide to block the processes even. So here, what we can do is with eBPF, we can actually uh, have a callback that will detect um, either an exec VE or a change in namespace or whatever, and then decide to kill the process. And this kill will actually be a real-time kill in that it will not happen after the process has time to do something else uh, because it will be able to kill the process before the, the, the event that has been captured can be scheduled in a kernel. So there's several tools that actually use this, right? Tetragon is just one of them. So this, uh, this was just a, a little bit of a tour of what can be done with eBPF and what, why it's interesting in a lot of different um, cases and areas. So if we look to the future, things that are coming is improved device uh, IO perf, for example, using uh, XRP. That's the, what, what I mentioned, this idea of using eBPF to improve database performance, for example. Uh, support for 100 person of C at the moment. Uh, eBPF is based on a subset of C. Actually, some people use SDKs as well to code in eBPF. There are some abstractions that will generate the, the C code for you and then the bytecode for you. Uh, for people that do advanced stuff with eBPF, usually they code in C, but the whole of C is not supported. 
for security and complexity reasons. So they're aiming to add more and more of it. So with new versions of the kernel, you get new functionalities in BPF, like more support for C, more helpers, more events you can attach to. And for this reason, some programs will say, you know, we use BPF. It doesn't matter which distribution of Linux you use, which libraries you use. What matters is the version of the kernel because we're using this eBPF functionality that exists since kernel 5.9 or something like that. Um, Cross-platform um, architectures, compilers, making it portable. Platforms, yes, platforms. eBPF is fundamentally a Linux technology, but Microsoft has announced in March last year that they were porting it to Windows. They've actually made a demo of it. Uh, they showed that they could start a Cilium agent on Windows, and this is very exciting for us <laughs> to know that actually even people that might want to run Windows Node on Kubernetes, for example, might be able to use eBPF for this. So if Microsoft is willing to bet on the eBPF technology for the Windows kernel, well, that's getting interesting. Not that I want to use it, but <laughs> it means something. Um, and eventually, maybe even going towards a microkernel approach, right? It's always been a problem and um, a, cr a critique, right, of the Linux kernel that it was monolithic from the start. Um, eBPF might actually help us to go towards maybe not tomorrow, maybe not next year, right? But towards a microkernel approach where the kernel would essentially be a scheduling uh, system with drivers and events and most of the functionalities around it could evolve much faster than the current life cycle for Linux because you could inject them using eBPF. So at the moment, all major cloud providers actually have picked an eBPF-based networking and security for the Kubernetes platforms, at least one. <laughs> Uh, it's true AWS, Azure, and Google Cloud are uh, providing Cilium as an option uh, for their routing and security. So where do you learn more about eBPF resources? Uh, we have a podcast every week that is called Echo. You can find all the episodes on YouTube. There's like 70 episodes at this point. And every time, it lasts about an hour, and it goes through uh, all the new things happening in the eBPF uh, um, environment in the eBPF world, and specific features that are coming, and then there's an exploration of a specific feature. Um, there's an Echo News uh, newsletter, bi-weekly newsletter, um, that goes with it pretty much. And there's a, a Slack server for eBPF and uh, Cilium as well. Last but not least, if you're interested, I'm still here tomorrow morning, and I will have a practical lab, a workshop, with uh, labs on Cilium, Hubble, Tetragon, and eBPF. It lasts four hours. I have like 16 labs that I can propose to you. Uh, plus, if you want, I can answer your questions. So if you're interested, you can come tomorrow in room B2015 from 9 to 13. Just bring your laptop. It's web-based uh, labs. So you just need an internet connection and a web browser, and that's pretty much it. And you can get badges, and I'll bring t-shirts. I have lots of t-shirts, so I hope I have enough people to distribute my t-shirts to you. And for now, I only have stickers if you want stickers. So thank you. And yep, if you have questions, I'm open for questions. Yes. How are eBPF programs validated, actually? Um, I don't know the details myself. <laughs> this is a good question to ask on the Slack channel, probably. Um, I know that it actually analyzes the program and looks for all the different possible paths that it will take. Uh, for example, you cannot have an infinite loop in an, in an eBPF program. You can have a loop if you can prove how many times the loop would happen. Uh, so if you know in advance how many times it will loop, then you can do this. There's actually ways to bypass this in some ways because you can actually attach eBPF. You ha can have tail calls, so eBPF programs can actually call other eBPF programs. That's a form of events that is possible. I, I, I'm sorry, I don't know the details of how it's validated. How are eBPF maps uh, secured in the kernel? Is any process now with the Zyman can access all of eBPF maps, or is it? So there's, yeah, how are eBPF maps uh, secured in the kernel and programs as well? Uh, there's, a, there's actually capabilities in the Linux kernel that you can activate uh, in order to allow accessing uh, eBPF subsystems. 
Um, typically what we do in Cilium in order to avoid conflicts is that whenever Cilium is deployed on a node, we deactivate access to uh, BPF for other programs. We can make exceptions. There's people that want Cilium plus a load balancer of their own. But uh, yeah, you, you need a specific capability to access it in the kernel. This has actually been refined, I think, in lit, uh, recent versions of Linux 5. Yes. Would it be desirable to, uh, in the long term, see certain um, functions or implementation that are now solved by essentially injecting code to the UDF in the kernel to have this as part of the kernel in the long term? Or would this stay like uh, a modular way to just uh, look into the kernel? Now that's almost a, a philosophical question, right? Would it be good to actually get things that are implemented in eBPF at the moment and get them merged in the kernel uh, statically? That's your question, right? Um, well, there's, there's some things that are happening. For example, I showed uh, the big TCP support actually landed in Linux 5.19. I think at some point there's some features that make sense to have by default. Uh, the nice thing about eBPF is that you can keep having a fast uh, development cycle uh, to get these features to evolve much faster than they would evolve in uh, Linux versions. So you can, if the, the BPF uh, subsystems are available to implement it, you can actually backport a lot of features to older versions of the kernel uh, in a much easier way. So yeah, and I think it makes sense. Eventually, things like uh, a lot of the service mesh, a lot of like HTTP observability, uh, for example, our vision is that it should end up in the kernel in the same way that, it, that TCP IP ended up in the kernel some uh, decades ago. And before that, you needed to instrument your application manually. Uh, eventually, it should get there, but in the meanwhile, it makes sense to use eBPF for this. How much of it would end up in the kernel? I don't know. <laughs> yeah. And it, it's true that one downside, if I have to give a downside of eBPF at the moment, is that the more applications use eBPF for observability, security, networking, and so on, the more likely we are to actually have conflicts between the different applications. So you might not want to actually deploy three, four, five applications on your node that all use eBPF, because they might be linking to the same callbacks. Yeah, also. <laughs> there's, uh, there's, there's some good talks coming on this to KubeCon, actually, from some of my colleagues from the security side on observing the, the eBPF uh, programs and, uh, and understanding where they come from, what they do, and what privileges they have. Yeah. Any other questions? Nope. Well, thank you, and I have uh, stickers here if you want.
All right, off we go. All right, thanks for hanging in there. Uh, this is the last talk in this room. I know some of you have been sitting and listening to people jabber at you for like four or five days, so I appreciate you hanging around. Um, I'm Mandy Walls. I, if you, I look familiar to you. I used to work at Chef, so I've been here a few times in the past. I now work at PagerDuty, um, which is interesting, because like, if you listen to Adam's talk yesterday, Chef, very sweary company, PagerDuty, similar like age of company, but like founded by Canadians. So totally not sweary. So yeah, right? What the hell? So very different. <laughs> anyway, uh, so I'm a DevOps advocate, which means I'm obligated to like blabber at you for a little bit before I show you gratuitous YAML code. So be patient, we'll get there. If you want to get in touch with me, I'm LNXCHK. Pretty much everywhere, never a battle for that handle. I tweet and I toot and all that stuff, so you can find me wherever. And if you work on anything that happens to integrate with PagerDuty, and you wanna come hang out with me on Twitch, send me an email, I'd love to have you on our channel and talk about whatever it is that you do. So, I'm gonna talk about automation. Who automates? Who likes automation? Yeah, of course you do, right? That's why we're fucking here, is, is automation. And because we work with lots of different companies doing lots of different things for lots of different types of organizations, there's lots of different things that folks want to automate, try to automate, don't really get too far with the automation. And this conference in particular, we're approaching it from infrastructure as code and config management, and that's a kind of automation that we're all super stoked about. It's super helpful, helps us get all of our shit together when we're you know, putting things out on the cloud or wherever they have to live. But there's lots of other kinds of automation. And we've heard some folks talk about you know, trouble you run into. Even if you have good config management, you might have interesting things happening when your QA department wants their own environments and things like that totally happen. So we're gonna talk a little bit about what makes good automation, ignoring Adam's new breaking rules and all that kind of stuff for right now. And uh, a little bit about some platforms that can help you Tackle the 200 or n hundred percent problem where everybody needs to know a million things about a million different programs, right? Because there's, there's so much of that. So we're gonna talk a little bit about the potentials for self-service automation in large environments where you have a lot of different programs, different platforms, different things that people need to know or need to interact with and why that becomes kind of a, a struggle and what you can do about it. So we're gonna start there. Automation, right? We're just gonna ask machines to do the things that are boring, that we don't wanna do anymore, that are maybe a little bit complex, that you know, who has been in a terminal window and typed something into the wrong machine? Who has you know, copied something out of the wiki and it, it ran off into the sunset and you missed the last four arguments, right? Have been there and done that. We wanna avoid all those kinds of programs or problems when we are dealing with our production software. I've totally done all of those things. So we look at the benefits of automation. We know kind of in our minds it just, it feels better, right? But when we're looking to sort of encapsulate what we're getting out of this, right? We are managing all these complex systems and workflows. We hear a lot about, you know, microservices architectures and all that sort of gobbledygook that, that folks love with distributed systems now, but that increases complexity. It means you have to know more about what's going on and who else you're talking to and who manages that other thing that you're dependent upon and like, are they actually doing a good enough job for you to use their thing or not? And like, there's all these other complex problems that come up with it. We also wanna be able to cope with change, not just what we're changing and our applications that are being changed, but also, all the things in our substrate that change, whether it's something crazy bananas like the log4j or it just happens to be regular updates that come in from our vendors. All those things create lots of complexity. Still seeing questions in places like Hangops on how do you patch systems you know, on a regular basis. Like There's still folks out there you know, struggling with those kinds of updates. We also wanna reduce all those mistakes, all the copy pasta that happens, and we want to reduce toil. Toil is just a fancy SRE word for the boring shit we don't want to do anymore, right? It's stuff that 
they, the technical definition they use is it scales linearly as your environment gets larger. But it's the basic stuff, it's hygiene, right? It's like doing your updates and making sure your backups work and doing all those things that you need to do. It's like brushing your teeth. If you don't do it one day, you can kind of get away with that, right? It's okay. You don't do it for months, like people are gonna be worried about you, right? So that's kind of where we're headed with things like toil. If we ignore it too long, it's gonna be a problem. So we want to outsource it to our automation. There's some potential drawbacks to all of this, right? Is it possible to automate too much, right? Some of this stuff does come up, right, in systems engineering uh, research, right? Looking at things like the loss of expertise. There's papers on this. I have some references for you at the end. There's some really good ones there to read about. People have been thinking about this stuff since like the late 1960s, especially in the realms of like nuclear power generation, aerospace, those kinds of places where you want to do the automation to protect yourself, but at the same time, you bring a junior onto your team and they're like, hey man, everything's solved. I don't have to know any of this stuff, right? So somebody has to be trained up to learn to manage the automation, to learn to automate new stuff, to learn to update the automation as things grow and become more complex. You also can encounter brittleness, where automation is sort of linked heavily or too tightly coupled with the objects as they currently exist, and trying to break out of that and build for the next generation is super hard. You get to the point where those switching costs are just too much, and you're ready to abandon everything that you wrote in that particular version of that platform and start somewhere new. It certainly happens. And the last one is detachment from work, which is one of those things that becomes one of those dark management memes, right? And has become part of the conversation around, hey man, Twitter's still running even though he fired all these SREs, so obviously we don't need SREs, right? We don't need folks to manage all these systems because the automation is so good and why do we need all you folks around here anyway? So the pointing here, boss pops up and says, eh, we don't need you because you automated everything. And that doesn't work in the long term. Eventually everything is going to come crashing down. So looking at how we approach automation from a software development perspective, and I don't care if it's your config management platform or if like other crap that you run, like everybody's got their little scripts, like do this.sh and don't do that.bak or whatever it is. And we look for the same things in our automation software that we want out of the application software. We want to know that it's going to do the thing that it says on the tin, right? So hopefully it's a little bit testable, at least. Who's ever used bats? Here's a, 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 a classic. I love bats, right? So bats was at least testing platform for bash, right? Like why, but also yes, please, right? So super cool. You also want things to be flexible. They should move as your architecture moves. They should be able to improve as your architecture improves. The next two, reviewable, put under version control so that I know things are moving forward. I've got folks who can look at this thing and say, am I crazy? Is this actually going to work? Make sure that we're not going off into you know, some kind of side quest here with the automation that's going banana crackers on its own and not focusing on what we need to do. We want to be applicable to related resources and not a one-off. I've definitely been into customer environments where like two teams sitting in the same row of cubicles have two completely different non-compatible versions of Tomcat that they're running. And like, that's a bad idea from the start. You definitely don't want to go down that road with automation. And we also want it to be repeatable and audible. I want to know who ran this thing, right? Something goes wrong. Who ran it? Who touched that? Where'd it come from? That's hard to do if everybody's just logging into a jump box and sudoing and firing something off. So I pulled these from a book called Architecting for Scale by Lee Atchison. There's some really good bits and pieces in this book if you haven't looked at it. Um, there's another one, uh, another part of the chapter, he points out like uh, service ownership, which is also super interesting for, for large organizations. We also then want to think about as we are working in our day-to-day, -day, what we can capture, what we can build automation for, that we save ourselves from ourselves in some ways, right? Coming from pager duty, we kind of talk about this in like an incident response sort of context, but applies if I want to 
build a QA environment. Does QA already have eight environments? Do they really need another one, or is it okay? But there's encapsulated expertise that might be siloed off. It might be partitioned from the rest of the organization. Folks who know all the stuff about the things get requests all the time for knowledge about the things. That's interruptions. It takes them away from their regular jobs. It takes them away from the things that they're doing to improve stuff to be able to say, oh yeah, you know, we just ran the query. You guys have eight environments. You really need to turn one off before you build another one. That's why you got that error, you know? Or if I'm dealing with a, an incident or something on my application, and I need to get information from the architecture somewhere, in the, whether it's Kubernetes or it's running in containers or wherever else it is, or I need to debug the database or some other connection. I'm like querying other people constantly, moving things around, trying to pick up the information that I need. That takes a lot of time. It takes a drag on the, creates a drag on the requester who's like poking around, who knows this thing that I need to know, and it creates a drag on the people who are responding because they were doing something else. They have work to do. And like answering your questions, maybe not the most valuable thing they should be doing. So we talk about what we should automate, where do we come from in the automation? And like for every tech topic, there's an XKCD, right? So of course there's this one, which is really a breakdown of time saved, right? How much time do I save by taking this particular horrible task that I have to do, and it takes me this amount of time, I have to run it this many times during a, a five year period, say, or even a month, right? And if I automate it, how much time do I get back? Right? So when folks are looking for KPIs or ROIs or any other three-letter three letter acronym for getting benefit out of stuff, right, we can break it down. I have this task. It takes this long to run. People ask me to do it 20 times a week. Here's the time I would save by automating it. Right? It happens in all kinds of uh, workflows. And then we think about, well, if, even if I automate it, you are still requesting it from me, but what if I gave it to you? So you ran it yourself, right? So then we have to address what gets in the way of that. We've talked a little bit about this in other talks here this week, like Adam calls this the 200% problem, like an n hundredth percent problem when you think about everything else that's in your environment. Folks don't necessarily know exactly what they need give QA an environment. What does that mean? How many hosts is that? How much network security is it? What does it plug into? What do they need to have access to? All of that stuff. Even if they know that, do they know enough about the platform to be able to make that request themselves using an API, even using the web UI? Maybe not, right? And then the last one, you have this access gap. Whether you're in a regulated environment or not, not everybody has access to all the environments, right? Because they shouldn't. So we want to address all three of those things so we can link up all the knowledge that's sort of suspended and siloed off on the left-hand side and hook it up with all the cool shit we've already written on the right-hand side so that all these folks can make use of everything that everybody knows in a safe way and make it more predictable for everybody who needs the stuff. Because it's not that these folks aren't smart enough to know all the stuff, it's just that there's too much stuff to know for all of these environments. So we think about designing self-service automation, and this is hard, like your ops team, your DevOps team, your platform engineering team probably doesn't have their own product manager, right? You're not answerable to someone who's gonna tell you to remember your personas, right? And think about you know, what folks know and and what, how they're gonna interact with things. So we wanna think about it for ourselves, right? The team that we're gonna share things with, but also the folks that we want to hopefully sort of level up and give them access to things. So thinking about how our users work, provide results to them that make sense. Is it just okay to say okay, or do they want more output than that, right? Do they need something else? We want a consistency of experience. If there's a green button for them to choose on one thing, there should be a green button on all the things. And give them documentation in context. It's just software design, it's just tool design, right? But like if you're used to writing shell scripts or 
go scripts or whatever else, it can be a little bit tough to sit down and think about all that stuff. That's totally fine. But we're going to talk about encapsulating it a little bit better. And some folks are like hostile to this, right? Um, I had a coworker in one of my early jobs who was very proud of being a, an SAFH, a systems administrator from hell, to the point where like that was his login on Kerberos, so we'll date it that far back. And he decided that all of our tools should be written in, I forget if it was TC shell or K shell, but whatever it was, our distro had already dropped it. So the first thing you had to do was install this thing that he was writing all of his tools in because he was the senior. And you're like, man, that's just hostile. Like, what's your problem? Like, we live in Linux now, not SunOS 4 or whatever it was. So get with the bash, right? So thinking about everyone else on our team and everyone else that we want to have use things. We're going to turn expertise into automation. I'm going to encapsulate all this amazing stuff that you already know and give it to folks who need it but don't need to know it, right? You're the mechanic and you help you know, maintain the car. They're going to drive it, right? They're going to drive it safely. They're going to drive it in the road the way they're supposed to, but they're going to drive it, right? So we're going to make the automation safe to give to these other folks because all they know is what they want the outcome to be. They don't need to know all the gory details underneath, right? Not to the point where we're going to you know, change the cloud out underneath them. The earlier talk was pretty awesome in that journey. But um, just get to the point where if I push a button, I can do the thing. So we take a look at like, the kinds of tasks that we can safely give to people. And organizationally, this can be interesting, right? Some folks have sort of the mental picture of automation of like the brooms in Fantasia, right? So Mickey doesn't want to mop the floor and he animates the mop and it goes bananas and there's lots of mops and bad things happen. And we're not headed that direction, hopefully, with our automation. But we can sit down and think about sort of the low-hanging fruit, right? The things in the green part of the circle that don't change anything on the system, but just provide context, right? And so it should have like a low impact. Things like checking the performance of the system or information gathering, maybe fetching some logs depending on where they are. Really easy things that folks will hopefully be comfortable with, but in a completely non-automated environment, someone is like requesting those or asking someone else for them if they don't know where they are. And then we can get more complex, things like restarts, maybe multi-step restarts, other diagnostics that might poke at things in an interesting way where we might need to like copy uh, part of the runtime into like an S3 bucket or other interesting things like that. And maybe eventually get comfortable enough to get, step into that red zone a little bit. Like, can we automate our firewall changes? I've worked places where we've been good enough to do that, right? Maybe we can automate multi-service rolling restarts, right? Hopefully folks can handle some of that right now. Or lots of places are already in an environment where you can add or remove capacity. It's already part of the platform. But if it's not, looking at that. So there's plenty of things to sort of break down for how you approach going into the automation. Are we looking for time savings? We can look at that chart. Are we looking for tasks and specific components there that, that we can do? And we can break them down in both ways. And then we can think about how far they're going to go. The little bit of demo I'm going to show you is uh, kind of buried in the, on the left-hand side of this, but there's plenty of opportunities for other things that move on to, to the right. So automation opportunities, just a fancy way of saying we don't have automation yet, right? We haven't automated any of this stuff that we could, and folks are still like asking us for junk all the time. We look at human-initiated automation, sort of the self-service part of this. Humans run it, and they wait for the output and that's what they're after, it's something specific that the humans want. If we have automation with oversight, humans can watch the automation, maybe it's going on in the background and they can see some telemetry on it. We're looking at sort of automation with fallback, that next step. Humans are just notified if the automation fails. They're like, hey man, we tried restarting this thing and it still didn't work, so we're gonna like alert you and let you know. And the last one is that your automation just turns into metrics. Instead of like Alice and Bob restarting a service 40 times in a week, you get a metric on a chart somewhere that says, hey man, this automation restarted this service 40 times this week. 
Last week it was only 35, so like somebody should look at this, right? And you start to get more information that way out of what's going on and just creates data. Most of the stuff we have kind of never gets to the last part, doesn't really need to. If we have so many things that folks are requesting on an ad hoc basis, that's where we're gonna save ourselves the most time. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about Rundeck open source. Who's heard of Rundeck? I think there was a talk here like six years ago from someone about Rundeck. Um, if you don't know, PagerDuty bought Rundeck a couple of years ago. Um, I'm gonna talk about the open source version of Rundeck. You can download it now if you want to. Um, it is Java-based, self-hosted, so open source, but like open source Java is kind of an interesting whole community that way, but um, it's runbook automation. So it takes all those scripts that you have in your wiki, all those little command lines, things that you're copying and pasting around, and gives you a place to like store them forever so that folks can run them when they want to. It's self-hosted, this version. You can run it on Linux or Windows if that's really your style. The configuration is in YAML, right? So uh, that's super fun. And we're gonna look at actually developing your own plugin, like what's actually required there. And um, there's lots of plugins to be downloaded. And actually one of the most popular plugins for Rundeck is using it as a um, Ansible control server so that you're um, allowing folks to execute Ansible playbooks on an ad hoc basis based on what they're allowed to do in the Rundeck server. So plenty of folks using it for that. So let's see if this will work, right? I've been signed out, so that's exciting. All right, so this is the Rundeck UI. It's organized into projects, so that's the, sort of the top line of where I can start to partition people off into what they're allowed to see and like manage how they're able to engage with the, the components that are in the server, right? So top level project can be development environments or things for the database team or whatever. This is a, an open source tutorial project we have called the Welcome Project. So it has a bunch of like examples and tools and fun stuff in it for folks to experiment with. There's a couple of different ways you can like actually get work done from here. The most basic thing is a command and we can just figure out if there's nodes in here. Maybe not. If there isn't, that's fine. They're not, okay, no worries. Run it on the local. So I have the local server. It knows about itself and I can run things there. The other part that I have here then is jobs. And this is where we really get to the point where I can say, hey man, here's your set of jobs for your team. Go crazy. You know, here's your diagnostics package. Here's your new environments. Here's your setting up things even via Terraform or whatever it is so that each team can manage all of their own stuff and they're not constantly asking you, hey, can you do X, Y, or Z for me? So I have a couple in here that are just basic things. And we click the green button, right? Who loves the green button? It just does the thing. It comes back and says everything was okay, right? So it doesn't matter who I give this to. Green okay, it's green, it's okay. It's all good, right? So folks can understand what, what's going on. And I can drill down into it and get more detail out of what was going on, but if I don't need that, I don't need that. If someone tells me, hey, your instructions are, go to the Rundeck server, run this job, I ran the job, it was green, everything's great. The fun part then is that when I come back into the main part of the project, I have an audit log, right? So I'm not kind of stuck running weird things on a jump host somewhere. I've got a record of who did the thing at what time and what happened. So that if someone comes in and says, hey, who ran the thing? I can say, hey, admin ran the thing, right? And, and we can go from there. So let's see if we can get my plugin to run. It worked earlier, but who knows. So one of the cool things about the whole uh, project is we can add our own jobs super, super easily. So we'll see how this goes. So 
So I have a little plugin that I wrote called Hello Bash, because why wouldn't it? And we're going to find it down here. So this is my plugin. It's pretty simple. It wants some user input. We're going to save that. We're going to check the nodes. We're going to execute it locally, because I don't have any nodes to dispatch to. And then I'm going to create this job. If I run it now, it goes and it runs, right? It took some input from me, went out and ran a command on that host. If I was dispatching it to remote nodes, it would also do that as well. It needs, just needs to know if, if they're Unix or Windows, because it has to be able to log into them. So the usual business there that we're looking at. Now, if I have another team that also wants to use this plugin, but they have different input for it, I just create another job specifically for that team. So we get a new job, we say hello for team two. Come on. I love computers. Hello. Okay. Here we go. All right. Let's see if it took. There we go. So I have the same plugin, the same kind of job. It takes a different set of input, but I can give it to a whole other team. Right? So I can reuse my automation, I can give it to other folks, whoever's requesting these things, they can have their own special versions of these so that we've abstracted all of that work away. And again, back to like the dashboard, I get my executions and everything's great. Now, the interesting part comes in, like, I don't want everybody and their brother to have access to all this stuff. So we can lock things down and there's a bunch of ACLs. They're in YAML, so you're fine. It's not crazy business. And if I have my friend Alice here, she's going to log in, but she doesn't have permissions to a whole lot of stuff. So Alice logs in. She has the welcome project, but she's got like nothing, right? We have totally locked her out of all these tasks so that I can delegate to the people who need to be delegated to very specifically. Specific nodes, specific jobs, specific pieces of the server, all that stuff so that when Alice logs in, she gets her view. When Bob logs in, he gets his view. And they're locked down to the environments that they're allowed to see. Right? So that if they're on two different teams, they obviously have different tasks that they want to be able to do. Even if they're on the same team, maybe they have different responsibilities. And you want to maintain that. So totally possible to lock things down to the point where like, you just don't even know what's there because it's none of your business. Right? It's not your stuff. So super helpful there. The plugins, there's lots of plugins. We're going to look at the installed plugins. Stuff that comes with it, right? The basic things. Open SSH, Ansible stuff. Here's my plugin, right? The one that I wrote. It shows up just like everything else. So if you have a bunch of work that you need to get done internally for your teams, you just add the plugins for the work that you need to get done. You can manage them like everything else. So it's super helpful from that perspective as well, because like, even though there's several hundred plugins across the ecosystem, like, we don't know what you're doing out there. You could be doing anything, right? And there's always new stuff popping up. So if you've already got a, a script, or you've already got a little program, or you've already got an API call that you know is going to do the thing that you want, you just abstract it, encapsulate that expertise, so that when your teams log in, they hit the green button, and the magic happens. So it's all good. So. I'm going to have to log back in for my slides. Even though they're supposed to be available offline, it's fine. It's just, yeah. <sighs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yes, it's me. Are you sure? I guess. Some days, I just don't even know anymore. You know? They, it's good they call that speed bump, because it really just feels like a smack in the head. 
That's my parking lot. I don't need that. Okay. So I'll wrap up here. You were supposed to be available offline. Come on. This is kind of my last slide anyway, so we'll talk through it. This is a configuration for the actual plugin that we put together, right? So this is my Hello Bash plugin. This is one file I've broken up so we can kind of talk through the pieces that are needed, right? All the stuff that's here. The left side, just metadata. Looks super familiar if you've written metadata for anything else, right? Who owns this thing? What's its name? What version is it, right? It's metadata. On the right hand side, we have the work it does and what it needs to do that work, right? So it's a provider there. That whole thing is one sort of workflow component. It has a name and a title. That's what's going to show up in my plugins list. What kind of service it provides. And there's a whole list of these. And this is just remote execute, which is fine. There's a other like workflow and, and other bits and pieces there. It's a script. I tell it what the interpreter is, because I don't care, right? You guys can run whatever you want to, wherever you want to. If you want to run all your stuff in TC shell, you're going to install that everywhere. Like, go crazy, right? This one happens to be in Bash. We just tell it where to find it. It has a script file that travels along in it, in the package. And if there's any arguments, if there's any input that I want to give it, whether it's like the team name or an environment name or a date of expiration of the thing, whatever it is, I can pass those in as arguments there. And then the bottom part is just how the UI gets laid out. So like this is a simple string input showed up on the UI just to give people a place to say, hey, what's this going to be? So super basic from that component, right, just to get started. But like lots of folks we encounter have plenty of bash scripts that are out there that do work for them and you want to be able to give them to somebody else to hit the button and make the magic happen. We would love to have you as part of the Rundeck community. Uh, if you've used Rundeck in the past and you want to take a look at it again, love to hear from you. Um, there's like, we, this was, version is the open source version, so anyone can download it and give it a whirl. It runs and then uh, there's an example program, it's an example project that actually runs in Docker. So if you're using Docker or using Docker on the desktop, um, you can actually just download that whole project, fire the thing up, and get a fully functioning run deck environment so that you can use that to uh, fiddle around with, do your own plugin development right there in that environment, it's fully featured from that perspective. The enterprise version has like some GUIs, but like that hides the YAML, who wants to do that, right? So super fun there. Um, if you engage with PagerDuty at all, you wanna give that a whirl, uh, we're at pagerduty.com. Uh, Rundeck itself lives at rundeck.com. And then I've got a whole bunch of resources for folks who are interested at this link, that's also where the, the uh, QR code goes. There's a tutorial for Rundeck in general. There's a tutorial to build the actual plugins with one of our um, sales engineers who does a, an excellent job of walking through that and what's required. Um, so, like, you zip it into a file and like all these great things. So um, that's also there as a video. And the Rundeck community hangs out on uh, Google Groups and also in the PagerDuty forums, which is just community.pagerduty.com. So we would love to hear from you uh, if anyone is out there running automation stuff and has things that they want to take a look at. We'd also love to hear from you if you are using PagerDuty and want to come hang out with us on our Twitch stream or come on our podcast or write our blog or I work in DevRel. Like, it's all content. Like, give me all your content. I would love to hear from you. So it's all great. Um, so yeah, I can take some questions. We're kind of early enough, so it's the end of the day, right? So thanks for sticking out with us, hanging out. say no.
Hi everyone. We're going to get started. Thank you so much for coming to this talk. It's obviously getting late in the day. We really appreciate you being here. Uh, my name is Colin Humphreys. Uh, I work in a company called Sintasso. And my co speaker is a uh, winner, who's here, who also works at Sintasso. Today we're going to be talking to you about building your platform product on multi cluster Kubernetes. So I'm going to start with a little section about why you would want to build a platform product. And I'm going to hand over to the winner who's going to talk about how you can build a platform product and is brave enough to attempt a demo that is working just beneath 50% of the time at the moment on, on conference Wi-Fi. So we'll see how that goes. And then um, I'm going to come back to me. I'm going to talk a little bit about multi cluster Kubernetes um, and about some of the other kind of uh, challenges uh, around building a platform product. So let's get started. So many, many years ago, when I started in my career in the late 90s, we had dev and ops, very much separate entities. So I started in operations. What used to happen was developers would write code, and they would throw it at me. I would say, this is rubbish, this doesn't work. they say, well, it works fine on my laptop. I'd say, I don't care about your laptop, I care about production. I'd say, what are you doing? I'm going to throw you out the window. They threw me out the window because there was more of them. It was all bad. So I decided I didn't like being thrown out the windows very much. I was fortunate that then, a few years after that, the DevOps movement kind of started. So that's about bringing development and operations together through a better culture, through automation, through measurement, um, and trying to work out how we can do better as an industry. So that had some amazing upsides, particularly culturally. And uh, I was on quite a few teams that were classed themselves as DevOps teams, they classed themselves as full stack teams. So what you often had was one team would be doing everything from plugging uh, CPUs into motherboards so those servers who get racked, doing the network wiring, doing everything, all the way up to writing the CSS, writing the JavaScript, writing the HTML. So we were all suddenly full stack engineers on DevOps teams. And that introduced a really high degree of cognitive load. You have so many things to think about. But a lot of those teams are very successful. So I've worked with organizations that have hundreds of DevOps teams. And a passage you start to observe is that each of those DevOps teams is building their own little platform, their own platform to serve their own workloads. So you end up with hundreds of platforms in large organizations. So you see a small example of that here with team A, B, and C. We see A, B, and C, full stack teams, but there's a high degree of commonality in those components that they use. So this kind of uh, inefficiency of large organizations with DevOps teams has led to the emergence of platforms. So you see, and it's quite fashionable right now, to talk about platform engineering teams, where their, their responsibility and their aim is to try and think about what are the common components and the common responsibilities of the application team and how can they support those application teams? How can they make lives easier for the application teams? And how can they reduce the cognitive load on the application teams? So that's why the platform engineering teams exist. So this isn't a new concept. You're all going to say, yeah, we were talking about platforms 10, 15 years ago. Absolutely right. So if we start thinking about platform engineering and what's happened and our experiences, we started to observe some trends and patterns in the way in which people do platform engineering. So I'd like to talk to you very briefly about four kind of sets of, of patterns that have emerged when people start to build platforms. So the first of those is the ticket pattern, typically using Jira, where we say, we're going to build a platform we're going to use uh, tickets. So if you want something from a platform team, you file a ticket. That has upsides because if you file a ticket and you say, uh, I want a database server, I want this much storage, I want this much RAM, I want this kind of logging, I want all of these things, I can then go and build exactly the database server you've asked for. The problems are that it takes time because you file a ticket and I might come back to you weeks, months later, it's quite common. Also, I might come back to you with something that's not quite what you asked for. So it's quite prone to error when I go and do this manual toil on the basis of a ticket. The 
So as a response to many ticket-based platforms, a lot of organizations just started handing out cloud accounts to the big public clouds. Now this was great because all of a sudden things were fast. You had self-service. If you go, you're going to fire up some of these instances, and then take some of these services, and then do all these things. It's going to be absolutely awesome. Quite often with these projects that I worked on where this happened, people someone would go and put their credit card into public cloud, you go and build everything super fast, and at the last second somebody from security or compliance or governance would show up and say, everybody stop. You're not allowed to do this. We don't know where the user data is. We've got all these um, PCI DSS, we've got SOC2, we've got all of these things we need to abide by. You haven't done any of them. Everybody stop. Everything's going to have to be completely re-architected. So a lot of challenges around doing that. So effectively, the things that you get from a public cloud are great because they're on demand and self-service. What they are not is customized to your organization. They're not bespoke. They aren't exactly the things that your organization needs. So they lack that element from the ticket system when you got back something that was right for your organization from your platform team. Next model, we call this the raw Kates model, in which your platform team says, okay, we're just going to give you Kates. Kates is enough. We're going to give you probably some GitOps around Kates, so you put documents in the Git, and then they will be applied. But we as a platform, we stop at Kates. That's good. Kates is fantastic. As we know, it has a clean and consistent ABI in Kubernetes. So, really, really powerful ABI server. The problem is, if you just hand out Kubernetes in its raw form, it's not a platform. It's really infrastructure concerns. So you're leaving the burden of building that platform still on the application teams. You're not really making their lives much easier if things you hand out is just raw case. So again, that's a big challenge because you aren't focusing on delivering the platform for the application teams. You're really just saying, go and do it yourselves. And then lastly, <clears throat> the pattern where we see uh, platform teams effectively writing a lot of Terraform or a lot of Helm charts or other code and then saying, take what you'd like to from this huge bunch of libraries and then deploy what you like. So this is again a problem in that it's ambiguous as to who is going to actually look after that code when it's running. And a platform team looking after it when the application team take those things and run them? Uh, who, who's doing what around that ownership? You've got this inverse now of what used to happen with the devs, the application teams would write the code and throw it over the operations. Now operations people are writing a bunch of Terraform, writing a bunch of Helm charts, and then saying, application teams, take what you want, and then you look after it on top of Kubernetes. So a whole ton of challenges there. What's nice about that setup, we've seen, is that often those Helm charts and that Terraform setup is customized for the organization. But the problem that it's got is it's not being delivered as a service. It's being delivered as code with ambiguous ownership, people forking it, people changing it, people having to run it themselves. So as we've seen here with these four, there are pros and cons to all of them. And what we thought about in Sintasso, what would it look like if we tried to help people realise the benefits from all of the pros and do what we could to alleviate and remove the cons So what we were trying to create was a system that would enable platform teams to deliver something that looked like this, where you as a platform team member are able to create a customized, bespoke for your organization, on-demand platform API. So the application teams in your organization can come to your platform and get hold of the right resources that are relevant to your organization, that are compliant, that are governed, but they're available on-demand instantly when they need them. So that was the dream. And I'm going to hand over to my colleague Winner, who's going to show you how you can make that happen. Yeah. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Um, so as Colin said, we think of the uh, on-demand customized API as really the ability to bring together all of those advantages that we saw across the other four scenarios. And we built Cradix as a framework to help platform engineers and platform teams get that API off the ground faster. 
So I'm going to walk through an example organization that has an application team and a platform organization and talk about how you would build up uh, your um, options for your API and then we're going to try a demo. Um, so in this organization we have an application team and that application team has an application that needs um, serving, it needs data, and it needs cache. Uh, specifically, they said, really, we're looking to deploy via Knative. Uh, we want Postgres for our database, and we really want um, Redis to manage our cache, which is great. The platform team then takes in those uh, concerns, those requirements, requests, and using Craddix to build the platform, they encapsulate those services in what we call promises. So Craddix helps you build a platform that promises services to your application team. So in this scenario, you have an, uh, you have an API now that with single requests, an application team can say, please can you give me a Knative? Please can you give me a Postgres? Please can you give me a Redis? And they get back all of those instances, and then it's just up to them to wire it together, and off they go. Which is great, but there is a step forward that you can go. Those lower level promises can be composed into a higher level compound promise, something like an environment promise, where rather than that application team saying, give me each of those individual things and I'll figure out how they wire together, instead, actually give me the whole lot, uh, let me just tell you what my application, team, my application is, and let me run with it, which is great, um, but we know that most modern application teams aren't going to have a single environment. So what they could do with a platform like this is make multiple requests to that API to say, I would like a dev environment, I would like a prod environment. And then they're, they're then saying, okay, well now I have these two environments up and running quickly, now I'm just going to figure out how I want to um, deploy continuously and observe. Or your platform can cater to that as well. So you can build out, again, a compound promise where you're um, promising observability through Grafana and Prometheus. You have CI, CD, maybe it's Argo, maybe it's something else. And now all your application team needs to do is make a request for each of these things, pull it together, and then they are ready to go. But of course you can go one step further and actually pull all those together as one higher level promise. So you've already written those lower level pieces and you can quickly pull each of those into a higher level promise. You may have heard, um, I've heard over the last day or so, talks about golden path, paved path. This is an example of where a platform team would be working with an application team to say, what is that golden path for the type of application you're deploying? Well, here you go, single request, you'll get back all of the stuff that you need to get you off the ground and to keep you going as you continue to build features and build out that product. But as a platform team, most of the time, a little bit more than application teams, you have concerns outside of just those application teams. You have other parts of the business that have um, very real concerns that, as Colin said, can stop you in your tracks. Things like security, compliance, and governance. Those things are, are hard to inject into a platform, um, and we've seen that struggle a lot. And what Craddix does as a way to help with that is allow sort of bespoke business rules to be built into that promise through what we call pipelines. So as you can see here, you've got security, compliance, and governance. Um, where, as an organization, they've taken the decision that um, credentials are going to be stored in Vault and that deployments are going to be broadcast in the organization via Slack. So all at once, you've got some of the sort of bespoke needs that you have at uh, the organization level, the bespoke needs that your application teams might have, um, and then everything they, they need to get up and running, off and going. So we are now going to try to actually show you part of this. We don't, um, we're going to, start from zero with a, a platform. So we're only going to actually install a promise that's a subset of that. We're going to have a promise that alerts via Slack when 
uh, deployments requested and starts, and then we're going to also create instances of Knative, Postgres, and Redis. Try, Let's see how we're for it. So we're gonna do the demo. I'm gonna exit out of full screen mode. I'm gonna go into the terminal. I'm gonna run a couple things. And uh, what we've already done is for the demo, we're using Kind to set up some local Kubernetes clusters. Out of the box, uh, Cradix works with multi-cluster, which we'll talk more about in a few minutes. Um, so you'll see here that we have two clusters. We have the platform cluster and the worker cluster. Um, we've also already installed Cradix on the platform cluster, um, which we can verify by asking for promises. Uh, if you remember from the slide, I'll just slide back on um, app as a service promise. So this is a, a Cradix concept that through installing Cradix on the platform, we've taught Kubernetes. There are no promises because we haven't installed any yet, um, but at least we know that Kubernetes knows what they are. So the promise is, the promise definition is really just a valid Kubernetes document. It's YAML, um, what we all know and love. Um, and the, the way that you put the promise on to your platform is a sim simply just by applying or creating it. So we're gonna um, add it to our platform with one command and we can see if that's registered by again requesting promises and seeing that now we have app as a service, which if you recall, is the name of the promise um, that we authored. Uh, the other thing that got installed as part of the promise, so the promise encapsulates a couple things, but at a really high level, talking about that on-demand customized API, one of the things you decide as a promise author is what do you want the API to be? How do you want your application team to request this promise? Uh, so in this case, when we installed the promise, we also got a CRD. That CRD is the app CRD, uh, which is the way that our application teams will be able to request an instance of that promise. So now we're gonna switch hats uh, and as an application team, we're going to make a request to actually get the services. The request, as you can see, is very small, and that's by design. It can be as big or as uh, small as you want, but in this case, we want to keep the cognitive load very small for application teams. We want them to tell us only what we need to know and let them let us configure and deal with the rest. So in this case, we do need to know what is the application name that you, you want to deploy. Um, we are going to take care of it for them um, in the promise we define. So where is it? So we can, we can run it. And then uh, sort of a lower level concern that we did expose is, well, what kind of database do you want? Because there is a reality where we may say, are, would you prefer MySQL? Would you prefer Postgres? Something else. So in this case, this is all that the application team needs to define. Um, and then, again, it's just a single, um, a single request to the platform to ask for <coughs> those resources. So if we um, take a look at the uh, apps that are now live, you can see that that resource request came in. So the application team successfully submitted the uh, resource request and um, it's there on the system. And now we, I'm gonna go to a slide and just show you a little bit about what happens at a really high level um, on the platform. So again, this is what we've deployed. We've deployed uh, something that notifies via Slack and something that um, will create instances of each of the services that our application team needs. That single request came into the platform and then it hit the app's CRD that we installed when we installed the promise. And then internally, it created requests for each of those lower level concerns. So it generated a valid document for Knative, Postgres, and Redis. It also did something for Slack. 
Um, but it output those documents into a GitOps repository, where then we have our, our second cluster, our worker cluster, uh, pulling that repository, watching for changes, picking things up so that it can create the workloads where that application team can then go and access it. So if we go back to our demo, we can see what we have. So we already verified on the line above that we have the app as a service demo. Let's see if we got that lower level Knative. We do. So if you remember up here, our, um, our request said, the thing I need, I want it called Config Management Camp. And when we ask the platform, well, what is the Knative called? It's called Config, config Management Camp. Um, we can do the same and see what's there for Redis and for Postgres. So we have all of the requests on the platform for those services that the application team needs. And finally, uh, strangely enough, we also have a request for a Slack. Um, what that probably means, hopefully, is that if we switch over to Slack, we'll see that at 1752, we had an automated alert in our demo channel saying that the environment uh, requested come in and that we were working on deploying it. Hold tight, it'll be there soon. So, for now, ah, so, perfect. Um, so actually, I was gonna show the pods on the, um, on the worker, uh, just to show you, if I maximize this. Um, one moment, please. Um, you can see a whole bunch of stuff here. Most of it you don't have to worry about. You can see that um, you'll see operators, webhooks. These things were all installed, actually, when the promise got installed. Don't need to worry too much about it. Um, but you automatically got a Postgres. You got uh, Knative elements installed as well. You have Redis. So all the elements are there, successfully deployed via Knative. And this is our application. So uh, this is our um, very fancy application that our team is delivering lots of business value with. It works. Uh, I'll do a hard refresh to show the persistence. Postgres is all wired up, and that application team, in one fell swoop, has that application up and running for it. So that's all we have in this demo, but I'm going to turn it back over to Colin to talk through some more elements uh, about products that we think are very valuable. So I'm going to go back in the slideshow. Here you go. Awesome. Thank you so much. So you just had a brief demo of kind of what graduates can do. <clears throat> so we created a part of this. This was just running on this laptop. So we did have a two cluster set up running, uh, as we demonstrated. We did the one dev environment, and we did some notifications around Slack. Now, if you're actually running this in something like production, as you know, you wouldn't be running this typically all on one cluster or two clusters like we were just there, you'd want to separate this out across clusters because you have uh, security requirements about what has to go where, you would have, um, you would have blast radius limits in terms of multi clusters so if one cluster goes down, you might be upgrading one cluster, except for all of these kind of reasons why we tend to go multi cluster. I haven't spoken to anyone for a number of years that's trying to run one big Kubernetes cluster. I spoke to somebody last week who was running over 100 clusters. The week before, I spoke to somebody uh, from a very large bank who's running thousands of clusters. So multi-cluster is real in terms of you know, production Kubernetes deployments. So if we look at this topology, just for this very simple app-as-a-service setup that we just demonstrated, it would typically look more like this, where you would have the observability, the CI-CD, the uh, security, compliance pipelines, all that kind of stuff running on a platform cluster. And then you'd have the dev environment running on one of the dev clusters, of which there will be many. And then that prod environment maybe needs to go to a secure PCI cluster 
that's set up in a certain way, so it can lead to that kind of security and that compliance. So the way that we enable this multi-cluster experience in Kratix is that you would label these clusters in Kubernetes that are represented as a Kratix object. You label each cluster saying, this cluster is a PCI cluster, this cluster is a platform cluster. And then in your promises, when resources are created, you set cluster selectors on those resources. And then we just schedule the right workloads to go to the right cluster. As when I mentioned, there's a GitOps topology powering all of this. So when we push out those documents, they go to um, uh, uh, repositories that are either you know, speak something like Git, as in GitHub or Git or something like that, or uh, something that's S3 like. So here we're powering the demo using something called Minio. So that's uh, uh, resembling Amazon S3. So you set up your clusters, you label your clusters, and we push the right workloads to the right places based upon cluster selectors. And then you can easily power and automate a multi-cluster environment. So the demo we just done, you know, has some complexity to it. Multi-cluster, we had pipelines running with Slack notifications, we created Knative, Postgres, and Redis on the fly, and then we pushed out an application to them and wired it all up. So there's a lot going on there. You may be thinking, to create something with this degree of um, uh, complexity and something that's composed in this way would be difficult for your organisation. Because a lot of what's going on here is we're, we're trying to raise the abstraction level in the platform to get a high level API for the application teams. But that means life is now more difficult for the platform team. So uh, in Sintasa we thought, you know, that's our reason for existing. How do we make life better for the people on platform teams? So everything you see here in the setup, all of these technologies that we've just spoken about, so we've got like Knative there, Prometheus, Grafana, um, Argo CD, Vault, etc. They are all available in the Kratix marketplace. Go to kratix.io forward slash marketplace. There's about 20 promises there. Um, everything we're talking about here, by the way, just to be crystal clear, is uh, Apache 2 licensed, open source. So please do contribute, please do have a look at it. You can use it how you would like to. So all of these promises are available. Please do contribute more promises as you write them. Very simple pull request email for additional promises. Now, I know this is the YAML conference, and we're all about YAML, but and obviously we just did a demo there, and we created the uh, app as a service instance from the promise. We created that resource via the YAML document that Winner showed, and it's a super simple YAML API. But this is going to come as a surprise to some of you, and it was a huge surprise to me. Not everyone wants to write YAML all day. There are people out there that don't. So when you add a promise to Kratix, it can automatically populate Backstage, which is a CNCF project originally created by Spotify, to automatically give you uh, people users that want to use a graphical user interface uh, something that they can you know, identify with and they can use, rather than having to write YAML all day. So you can still have that uh, Kubernetes API where your kubectl are applying YAML, you can power the entire thing from GitOps, so you can have people pull requesting into a repo and have that applying YAML to Kratix, but then you can also create promises that are uh, automatically applied, so as you're adding and fleshing out your API in Kratix, you're also fleshing out your uh, GUI on the backstage. And lastly, I did want to mention this, if you've gone to all that work to create an amazing app as a service promise, and it's fantastic, and then someone comes along and says, do you know what, actually, I don't actually want to use those, quite those components, I want to use a slightly different set of components. Because you've composed it from lower level promises, you've taken promises from Knative Serving, Postgres, Redis, together, and you've built together that higher level promise, you can then create a different developer experience easily by recomposing it and adding a few more promises. So you may want to do build packs for your containers, Kafka for queuing, MySQL for your data. It's very easy to take everything you've built so far, recompose it, create another higher level promise, and then you can offer a range of developer experiences from your platform. One of the things we've learned from experiences around things like Heroku is that there is no one actual developer experience that works for everyone. You as a platform team member have to craft the right range of developer experiences 
in your organisation. And we built practice to try and make that as easy and as simple as possible. So if you'd like to learn, like to learn more about Kratics, docs, guides, available on kratics.io. Um, the code, github.com slash the slash Kratics. Please do add issues. Please do pull requests and changes. Um, any contributions are more than welcome. Please do just clone it and use it. That would be great. And that's it for our talk. The QR code there takes you to a page where you can see a bunch of things around booking some time with us. We'd love to talk to you about practice and how we can make it effective in your organisation. Just have a chat about it, give us some feedback. Um, there's links to the docs, there's guides, there's a whole ton of stuff that's there. That's it for our talk. Thank you all very much for uh, waiting a bit later and uh, hanging around and having some time with us. Thank you. Are there any questions? One back there. Uh, thanks for the great presentation. And the demo uh, reminds me that some project called uh, Kubernetes Service Catalog. And as we know, it didn't end up really well. And do you think it's uh, Catex can, can be like some alternative or like is, is it uh, like fundamental difference that will make the Catex successful even though the, the service catalog is not successful product? Thank you. If I try and repeat your question if I can. Uh, Catex reminded you of the Kubernetes service catalog? Yes. I'm not quite sure about the Kubernetes uh, it's, service. It's, it's definitely duplicated right now. Uh, and I wonder why. There's a lot of tools similar to, to such, uh, to this approach, to create some CRDs, to create resources on Kubernetes. Uh, and what is the fundamental difference with your product than others? Thank you. So the question, if I can again try and reflect it, play it back, was uh, what's the fundamental difference between this product and other things that are out there? So we have obviously have had a good look around the industry. So uh, at various different things. I haven't seen Kubernetes service catalog. I think I know what we're talking about, and you're right, that one's been um, deprecated. There are various others that are out there. What we haven't seen is anything that enables you in a multi-cluster topology to orchestrate workloads across many, many clusters and provide a very high level API with this ability to add, add things like promises. So there are a few things out there in this kind of space, but we've yet to see anything that has this, this full view of helping you build that high level platform API across a multi cluster Kubernetes topology. And I think that's the real boundaries that you're working within an industry. You know, Kubernetes is just ubiquitous, we have to face that. It's available from all the big public clouds, it's on-prem. Kubernetes is just everywhere, edge, etc. So that's like the foundation that we work on as an industry. And then at, at the top level, we're looking at you know, how do we make application teams as productive as possible based upon multiple Kubernetes clusters. And there's nothing that I can see out there that enables you to orchestrate many Kubernetes clusters whilst powering that very high level API and enabling that degree of customization so you can really make something that's bespoke to your organization. If you think this can be done better using alternative tools, I'd love to talk to you. So that QR code has a link to book some time. Please do book a meeting with us, we'd love to talk to you if you think you can do this a better way because we're always about adapting, listening and about learning. But based upon our research, we couldn't see a way of doing this easily and that is why we brought Kratics. Any more questions? Cool. Thank you all so much for your time.